And I'd always known, even over the couple of years, that in the end, I'd have to go out old style. Cut bars, go to wall, get over wall. Uh, well, I still would have done it. I had to do it. It was two weeks away from death sentence, and they said they were looking for a likely Westerner to make an example of. It doesn't look like a guy that would be up for a death sentence. No, definitely it? not. It's too slow. They take forever to get around to it. The big Viking was going to be carrying the other end. We had the helmets, the UN uniform. Yeah, you know, open the doors, emergency. And because we're all foreign, and you'd only have to say the word United Nations, there'd be a you know, visible Mexican wave throughout the staff there. There's seven walls you know within of sub-prisons to scale. They don't trust the foreigners, so you're three floors out. Mm. Uh, below you is some crumbling masonry that if you even touch it, it'll shatter down. He couldn't even say the words. He'd be like a baby backing up when it wants to cry and just the outrage is so strong at not getting his Ruskin pharynx that he hasn't got the breath for it. When I was at my most suicidal, which was after arrest, and you can't kill yourself easily in there. No, I mean, you need some privacy for suicide, you know. You can hardly say to somebody, oh, don't come in, I'm killing myself, I'll be done in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> sort of stretching recliner with the trusty on each leg, massaging away. But the look on the trusty's face, that was a killer. Really? It was like rapture, religious. Ah, <laughs> oh, my master lets me massage his leg. What bliss, what more heaven. <laughs> 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 I learned years later that it wasn't a light rain, it was the spittle of the god's laughter. <laughs> As they were planning worse things for me in years to come. Oh. <laughs> Here we go again. Hello. Our most reoccurring guest. Can't get rid of me. <laughs> like a pestilence and a plague. Oh. Episode number 12. And the reason we have him back over and over again is because we love him so much. And his, I'm cheap. In, <laughs> especially his intellectual banter blows away anything you could watch on comedy, on TV, or YouTube. It is so much yeah, fun. Yeah, don't make it difficult for me. Right? <laughs> it's so much fun. <laughs> To sit with David, even on the drive from the train station, mm. the, the choice of conversation. Oh, we're lucky to survive that, actually, because uh, <laughs> Sean had an issue with reflexes. <laughs> um, oh. A rather lightweight bottle of uh, spring water fell on his knee and we almost died. Um, it's good to have reflexes. I remember <laughs> back in my 40s I had some. <laughs> Um, but I think uh, we have to be careful there. But we made it in, despite the petrol shortage. There was a bottle of water near the gearbox that it was in the thing, but it wasn't. Quite yeah, I just told the story, really. <laughs> <laughs> They're wondering what, I, what the logistics were. Oh, yeah. And it collapsed onto my knee and triggered a reflex action. <laughs> it woke us up. Well, that's got, it's got good... Well, the thing it is... came back into control I, I, quite good. That was at the station uh, <laughs> here in uh, southwest Shropshire. Um, but uh, I tried to get here, you know, Sean. I, I tried to siphon petrol, the dregs from <laughs> one before, old Ford before, Fiesta. Before you start, let me finish the introduction. Yeah. David has been on... 12 times, including today. He's the author of two books. Unforgiving Destiny and another one. And, and another one. <laughs> and his breathtaking escape story from Thai prison death row, first Westerner ever to do so, stars were fully lined. If you go back over the 12 episodes, I think that was episode... Uh, three, three or four or something. The like link that. is in the description box for all of the David McMillan episodes. You could have an absolute blockbuster weekend just watching all 12, way better than anything you'd get on Netflix, but particularly episode three, The Escape. Mm. 
my heart was going like crazy. I was wondering up. whether it was going to get out, and I was just watching it. <laughs> <That's> it. <laughs> you know, I did something for that. Uh, yeah, please subscribe to, to David's channel. The link for his channel is also in the description box, and he's recently been on Dakar Haggy's channel. So please support Dakar as well. Yes, he, he needs all the help he can get, and <laughs> don't worry about that scowl. That's him being friendly. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I was quite happy that it was on Skype, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, he is a good guy. I'm oh, sorry, I interrupted your story Thank about you. siphoning your neighbor's oh, petrol. Oh, I was just going to say, for those who don't know it, I was a smuggler for 40 years and uh, retired for quite some now, So because the Berlin Wall came down and there's no money in it. So I'm reformed. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> yeah? Co-host introduction, oh. Jen. Is back with us. Jen runs Hello, Jen. Boomer Hello. and Jen Organic <laughs> Cotton Clothing Company. Link also is in the description box. If you want to follow her on Instagram, that's down there. And at the end of this video, stay tuned. There will be a trailer showing Jen's clothing. And we've also got a little gift for David at the end as well. I can't wait for that. And I like <laughs> my cotton organic. You know, that <laughs> synthetic cotton. Oh, rash. I felt like I had an epi rash there, little. <laughs> <laughs> but we can't know. I um, actually was kind of revisiting uh, Klong Prem in a way. Um, I did an interview that you'll never see uh, for Lad Bible, but um, they, they were really you know, interested in, in taking it in and, and didn't say a word, even though it was meant to be an interview. And then sort of hinted that, well, we can't use any of that. You just don't link, seem like somebody who'd be climbing over walls and, and running around smuggling A-class drugs all over the world. That's the entertainment business. It's rough. But one thing that did strike me, I saw a photograph of the prison in Bangkok. And I think, and this was, I don't need, there was no Google Earth back then. So this was 1996. And I'd asked my friends to kind of take a walk around to let me know how big it was or where things were. And that was hopeless. It was just huge. And I can see why. Um, this shot was taken from an aeroplane at an oblique angle, and you could see, no wonder that it can be seen from space. There are 10 sub-prisons within it, um, and the total population was not 8,500 or something that I knew of, but when you take into the other prisons within it, it's 22,000 people. Okay. That includes the women's prison, uh, Bangkok Special Roman Prison, and all of that. And I think, uh, well, I still would have done it. I had to do it. It was two weeks away from death sentence and... They said they were looking for a likely Westerner to make an example of. It doesn't look like a guy that would be up for a death sentence. No, it? definitely not. It's too slow. They take forever to get around to it. It's like you know being courted by an extremely nervous paramour or something. Ne you'd never get to the crunch of it. It would be five or six years on death row. Mm. And my uh, Alex, the Italian mafia friend who was there, uh, he was chained to the wall at night. Uh, had to pay um, about uh, $25 just to take a shower, which is not really a shower. It's standing there with a bucket of water, a bird bath, they used to call it. <laughs> <laughs> um, chained to the max, those welded on chains I told you about, you know, the ones that uh, they put a little bit of cloth or something around your leg and then weld them on. I naively said to somebody once, well, how do they get those off? Uh, you're on death row, huh? And there's a, in the execution chamber, there's a machete hanging on the wall. That's how they come off. <clears throat> yeah, apparently, they're, they're quite valuable, the, the metal in that. So the ankles just get, you know, the experts can do it in one. You said you were two weeks away from a death sentence. Mm. How does that affect the brain? Focus is the mind, as somebody once said. Um, there I'd had... Um, 22 different escape plans. Oh. Um, they all involved other people. And that was why they were, were never going to happen. <clears throat> if um, the locals had been involved, the story would have got out. For, absolutely for sure. Even amongst the Westerners, um, we we're always talking about escapes. That's what people do in prison. I'm sure probably, Sean, in Arizona, people Did were talking. Did you come up with a plan? 
you fantasize about it. When I was facing 200 years, I fantasized about it. In Max Security as well, they did dig a hole in the wall, but then drugs got passed through it and it got busted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there you are. A hole in the prison wall has got so many uh, useful things. <laughs> By the way, that uh, uh, riot in Guayaquil, the one that Peter Tritton was talking about, that was the first riot. There's been another one uh, over the last few days. And that a hole in the wall was dug by one set of uh, <coughs> Ecuadorian gangsters, <coughs> not to escape, but to get to the other guys. I mean, it's all internal politics there. And yeah. so they got through, grenades were used. I mean, that's quite inventive, isn't it? I mean, ordering pineapples on the canteen, wow. <laughs> David is referring to Posh Pete, who went viral, I think it was on Vice. Mm. or Lad Bible or one of them and we've done three episodes with Posh Pete now I'll put them in the link be below the description box and in the third episode Posh Pete he hates that name by the way extradited does he, does he? <laughs> Pete is extradited back to the UK Wandsworth where David Macmillan comes into the story and if you've not seen part three with Pete David is present and they talk about how they met in Wandsworth but that podcast did actually start out with Pete showing us some footage we could not show on YouTube because it is so graphic and he's explaining what's happened and during this riot people's body parts are getting cut out and put on display. So I've got it in the background of a couple of mine in a sneaky <laughs> way. The guy's got his <laughs> thing beating in his hand etc uh, freshly just removed and it, these are people that it's Pete was actually in. Still after a few minutes. Away. Really? Pete was actually in prison with some of these people who had just been massacred. Mm. He lost uh, quite a few friends there, and as 116 have died in this latest one, uh, with multiple oh. decapitations. I think cutting the head off is a kind of a traditional symbolic thing. And we, uh, Peter and I were kind of thinking, okay, this is Ecuador. There's kind of Aztec sort of background going on there. And they had ritual sacrifices, didn't they, to the gods back yes. in the day? And that involved building a tower so the blood could fall down and you know, rejuvenate the crops in the land. <laughs> Controlling the weather was tough in those days. You know? <laughs> no rain dancing for these people. <laughs> that might have been okay with the soft <laughs> people up north. Um, so uh, you can kind of see this ritual slaughter thing having a lot of... Um, organs involved with it i don't know people have always in, historically have been fascinated with them haven't they? they used to read the uh, the entrails of a liver to um, ordain the future um don't think you'd, you'd look at my past with my liver i think but uh, not much about the future it all looks grim <laughs> help uh yeah so anyway back to bangkok yeah um, you're, so you were two weeks away from being executed in bangkok Death mm. You said it gave you focus on escape plans. It did. All the ones that involve kind of silly things like um, we were going to sneak out dressed as um, United Nations medical evacuee people. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, no, it, it sounds utterly insane. You know, one of us would be on a stretcher. That was uh, Swiss Theo. He was going to be on a stretcher. And... Uh, yeah, he was stronger than I. He could have taken the end of the street. Anyway, um, the big Viking was going to be carrying the other end. We had the helmets, the UN uniform. Yeah, open the doors, emergency. And because we're all foreign, and you'd only have to say the word United Nations, there'd be a you know, visible Mexican wave throughout the staff there. What? When? Here? Now? <laughs> they see everything? Because they used to take elaborate precautions when... You know, visitors came from outside. They'd issue uniforms, you know, or, or the you know, instead of the rags they were wearing, or the beggars would be taken off the streets. You know, the <laughs> people betting on um, the worm extraction process for those with elephantiasis. Have you ever seen that? No. A swollen leg, riddled with worms. The only thing. Uh, to entertain the poor slobbers, got it, is to try and get these worms out from inside. So the trick is to get a pencil, and when one kind of looks around, <laughs> lure it out on the promise of something interesting. Uh, yeah. Flip a magazine in front of it. <laughs> Not town and country, no. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and then roll the worm around. What they bet on is how much worm would it get out before it snapped. And I must admit, I threw down a few baht on that one myself. This, my worm just snapped at three inches. It oh, Christ. Mm. Did you have to get so much <laughs> out to prevent the... The remaining section. Yeah, well, you know what worms back. are like. They um, just split, don't they? Yeah, stay oh, alive. Yeah. Back <laughs> 20. Oh, don't worry about that. We'll regrow. You know? oh. um, so they'd sweep all of that off, and then the visitors would come, and they'd put on some lavish food and all that. And How does that condition come about in the first place? What? Elephantiasis? Yes. It's a, um, um, an infection, um, often from just drinking water full of worms. The food. Oh, drinking the worms yeah, in the water. Yeah. Um, and it uncooked pork. Have you ever tried that with a piece of uh, pork steak? Not that I'd eat one. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Get a raw one and, and put it on a pan and slowly heat it up. You see all the worms get out. Uh -huh. uh, From the local butchers? Yeah, just any that we eat. But we, that's why they say, <laughs> please cook a lot. <laughs> Charity beyond I'm recognition. Never have a pork again. Mm. Oh. There's YouTube videos out there for the sick minded who want to watch that. <laughs> anyway, um, focused indeed. So all the crappy plans that were just fantasies were put aside. And I knew that, um, and I'd always known, even over the couple of years, that in the end, I'd have to go out old style. Cut bars, go to wall, get over wall. <clears throat> Sounds good, but <clears throat> when you've got um, a fairly unknown distance to the wall, uh, there's seven walls you know within of sub prisons to scale. They don't trust the foreigners, so you're three floors up. Mm. Uh, below you is some crumbling masonry that if you even touch it, It'll shatter down onto passing a cell full of these prison trustees who have their own uniform and batten and sell the drugs one day, arrest people for it the next, conduct the punishments. You know, when, uh, when somebody's being beaten there and they expose their vertebrae and the guard drops his heavy truncheon between, uh, well, uh, as he rises in agony, he's supposed to say between the prisoner, between each blow, look up and say, thank you, sir, for correcting me. I'd find it hard to deliver that line with all sincerity, I must say. Mm. So, um, and, and it hadn't gone well for the very few who tried. Uh, some from a dormitory had, they'd been caught, they all lied to each other, that's the thing. One said he had a cell phone, another said he had family waiting outside, and another one had hidden a rope somewhere. That's a good one. <laughs> 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 I like that. Somewhere <laughs> hidden, yeah. Uh, all fabrications uh, actually managed to get out through the pup tents inside the dormitories for uh, private liaisons between the boys, very sexually flexible, these kids. Uh, a towel would be tied to the um, railing of the dormitory uh, mesh and then uh, pinned to the wood so it would form a little tent. So nobody, you know, it was polite not to inquire too much what was going on in there, even though the lights were on 24-7. So they got out that way, all came to nothing, didn't know where they were, uh, circled back, woke up the sleeping guard, and now these guards... We could do a whole program on bribery, the subtleties of it, why it's not really bribery, why they're feeling they're getting rewarded for helping you, for being nice, that you're lucky, he wants to be lucky. It's a whole show. Now, as much as they might take money for doing things, to escape, to lose them in their job, to insult, like, you want to leave here? You want to break the system? This is, this is what we are. This is our city. This is Klong Prem. You, you, you know, pooing in your own house and getting me in trouble. I, it was outraged. Yeah. So they were all thrown in the, the soy, which is the punishment area, which is a coat locker, and not a full one, not for a long coat, for a half jacket, I think, a uh, letterbox slit to see out of, not that you could see very much, mm. um, a bottle of water every day and a paint tin, which was your bathroom. But you weren't worried about the bowl of rice that you couldn't eat because you'd have no teeth because every day they'd be taking you out and whacking you with clubs. 
and you would hear the levels of pain mm. escalating to a wild, high-pitched squeal, animal in nature. But worse than that, when there was just silence and consciousness, but still the sound of wood hitting flesh, mm. like a baseball bat on a carcass in a slaughter yard. So to be caught doing that uh, was not good. And even my last friend backed out at the end. So um, looking at this picture that had been taken, if I'd, um, if there had been Google Earth, maybe that wouldn't have put me off, but um, <laughs> just navigating the place. Um, as you say, look at what episode three uh, of uh, those interviews, you, you'll get the story. But in the end, or oh, I had my two bamboo ladders joined together, I would go to one wall, look over it, and try and get some idea of what looked promising. But because the outer wall had uh, was three times as high, uh, even though there's a huge ladder in the end, um, and it had electricity running across the top, an inside moat called Mars Bar Creek because it was a sewer, and an outside one really wide. It's... Um, I don't know, 35, 40 feet across, and goes straight into offices' housing. So th that would have been uh, very off-putting, would really. it? What tools or anything, items, did you have on you to... Well, as I say, because underneath I knew it was always going to come to this, I'd been like a magpie collecting anything that looked useful, and every single thing was... Um, except for the things that looked like they might be, like a pair of pincer pliers. Original plan was to start um, the inner inside walls, the internal ones had barbed wire, but they were held by little U-bolts over the top. I thought I could get to the top of that, take the U-bolts out. No, no, no. At night, everything's different. All your timing's useless. I might have walked the jail from end to end, uh, the parts that I could walk. There's no routine. And timed it out. But... It's the sound. When During the day, everything's noisy, covering your tracks. At night, you know, you've got sleeping guard there. You've got tower here. You've got somebody, you can hear a gate opening and closing, uh, shutting, so you've got to stop for that. Wait, check it out. No, it, it took forever. I didn't even really get through the bars. It got one and a half cut, and the Viking had to hold one up uh, while I squeezed through it. And then I went out on my bookshelf and then dropped down to the ground on a piece of rope from the army boot factory. It was a webbing they used. <laughs> right. You've got organic webbing in your... <laughs> no, I don't know. No. Unfortunately, not, no. not yet. <laughs> it probably would have been a better choice because yes. I got severely burnt from my hands. It took off layers of skin with that nylon. Synthetic, see? If it had been organic... No I issue at all. Fine. No. <laughs> no, no stigmata <laughs> at all, I would have. Uh, um, and uh, only now, having seen that picture, know where I had been... Um, and looking at the route I took, it was forwards and backwards, and, and that's why it was dawn by the time I, I got there. Mm -hmm. Only passing the AIDS block gave me um, a section, a uh, sense of where I was, because I knew that one from uh, the church meeting, so-called church meetings every Sunday. When they I'll never forget that moment you said you looked at, that some of the AIDS uh, patients saw you, uh, and you knew that they were so weak, they were about to die, they couldn't tell anyone. No, if it'd been, no? if I if I'd passed any ties, yeah. they they have a whistle. Every cell has a chief scumbag, <laughs> and one of his duties is to um, blow his little heartfelt lungs out if he sees anybody up to no good, and to see a foreigner, a Farang, mm. outside, he couldn't even say the words. He'd be like a baby backing up when it wants to cry, and just the outrage is so strong at not getting his Ruskin pharynx that he hasn't got the breath for it. But nonetheless, he would find the strength to blow his whistle. And But these, at the AIDS ward, I smelt at first. The odor of necrotic, rotting flesh was unique there because it's got a kind of sickly sweetness to it. Um, and I even looked in. I thought it was empty. It was so dark. But they, they had the courtesy to turn off the lights for them. <laughs> That's true. They didn't want to see the, the rows and rows of dying. 
and these grey, waxy faces with matching eyes, just staring at the moonlight without the strength to cry out, looked at me like maybe they thought I was a ghost. Maybe they thought they died and that was probably sadly enough. <laughs> <laughs> what you, the gatekeeper of hell was yeah. before them. I might have looked that way because I climbed up a, under a couple of, um, ran into some mesh and had to go under a kind of muddy thing that was too, I just didn't have time to climb things anymore, Sean. I just had to whack this damn long ladder on stuff. Hadn't you gone through some sewage as well? Um, yeah. The, well, Mars Bar Creek I managed to keep out of, not <laughs> straight into it. But um, Mars Bar Creek. Well, because it had little floating turds in it, um, and <laughs> Sorry. around the entire prison. So I mean, everything has a local um, geographical name to it. So, oh wow! Um, isn't there some system now in the world where three words identify exactly where you are? Is there? Yeah, it's called, you can look it up. Just three words, it will give within a square meter every place on earth. So instead of oh, your, your last bit of battery on the phone, yeah, instead of calling out, well, I'm on a place that looks like, you know, uh, what was that? What would you say about here right now? Well, we'd have to look it up. Okay. Oh, no, the words aren't. That'd be, that'd be nice. <laughs> if they were kind of poetically matched, yeah. like suffocation, anxiety, <laughs> and claustrophobia. Well, I'd agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, they're silly words like uh, water, brains, fish, or something like that. And that will identify my place. Um, not just my place, that'll be my living room or the, you know, the loo or something. <laughs> Must look that one up. <laughs> Put it on the wall. Um, so you dodged Mars Bar Creek. Yeah. Uh, and with difficulty um, got the ladder of it. I think I even offered a prize for anybody who could figure out if you've got Mars Bar Creek, you can't go across it because it's got tall barbed wire. It's full of things. Well, never mind, you'd swim through anything if you had to. Mm. But it will catch my ladder. It's too long. It's too heavy. It weighs more than I do this ladder. Uh, how do you get it across? You can get a bit of it across, you can get yourself across, but you can't lift the thing to carry it over. What was that old thing, that mathematical thing that you've got a, a, a duck that's going to eat the corn and, uh, and some other thing, you, you've got to get them across the river, but a boat will only take two people, so you have to do it in trips. It's an old Simpsons thing. There were, used to be mathematicians writing that show, you know. They anyway, predict the world, don't they? Distracting here. Did you know <laughs> yeah. when when you got through that the Viking held a bar back and you got through yeah. that hole, did you know everything you were gonna be confronted with until you had your ultimate freedom? Did you know the lay of the land in advance? So you could adjust mentally, or was it a case of I'm just gonna take these tools and I'm just gonna get through whatever I come across? I'd walked around uh, the place and I had um everything I thought not that I would need, but everything that could be with the limits of its usefulness. A lot of rope is a good thing to have. Uh, you're taking notes, those who ever fear they might be confined by some mad granny and have to get <laughs> out of there before she amputates her legs. Um, I didn't want to say jail. Could it might not be. Other situations come up. Um, and one of them was even an S hook I'd found around, the kind of thing you put a ladle on a yeah. kitchen rack. And that was essential. I had to tie that with, I had gaffer tape, uh, cable ties, and they came in a big care pa package along with the hacksaws that cut the bars. Um, and, and that was a whole operation getting that. Uh, I had to send, say to my friend Michael, he went to Fortnum and Mason, he got a huge amount of distracting um, confectionery, um, lax tongues and aspic, you know, those sort of rare things in a tin they sell there. But also a couple of cartons of cigarettes to hand around to the guards checking it. But what would you put? Ah, you're new to the show. You're not as yes. sick and twisted as uh, <laughs> and here, Sean. You've got a parcel. Right. You're, it's going to go through an inspection. Inside is a religious scroll, the dowel rods of which are a bit heavier than they should be because they've got hacksaw blades right. concealed within. So you're allowed clothing, you're allowed food, pretty much uh, reading material, stationery. What would you put in there to distract the guard? Well, you mentioned bribing with cigarettes. 
Yeah, uh, all right, I'll give you a couple of clues here. Conservative mm. country, um, the you know, the things you were allowed to read. You know, Porno. Like, right. And what kind? <laughs> mm. Rizal. Playboy. <laughs> okay, no, I, I went further with Michael. I said, go forth and find most rank, over the top, but glossy and expensive pornography you can lay your hands on. So the guard, I mean, they, they used to confiscate um, titty magazines. So yeah. when this, like, number 72 <laughs> is coming through. And time stamp, and time stamp. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, no, it's just a name. And, uh, <laughs> doesn't mean anything. Um, it was just too much for um, the guard. He was, uh, my name was Daniel in there. He, <laughs> I mean, he, was, he had the cigarette. No, Daniel, no, Daniel, but very carefully putting them under his chair and dusting them off, making sure they had to be inspected later for years. So I can't mention the magazine about who. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, time stamp. Time stamp. <laughs> this is not a joke. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so uh, that was just to get those things. And, and another tool was... Um, um, a laser pen I nicked from a, a visiting um, American diplomat, or well, a diplomat, a charge d'affaires at one of the embassies. A uh, little laser pointer, red. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Because there was, and I, I, I won't labor on this because it's old news, but this is the kind of thing you have to think ahead of. Okay, you're out there running around. Listening to Sean's gurgling stuff. Think of banana, don't I? You don't have any, do we? With me. Um, you know that most of the guards are asleep, but you huh. can see one at a distance because you'll hear the gate, so you just stand back from that one. Or you can round a blind corner and run into one, smack, you know, within feet. And that's not so, that's not the end of the world because you can grab him then. Take his feet out from under him, and that's what the gaffer tape and cable ties were for. Yep. Truss him up like a Christmas turkey. <laughs> Say, you can breathe okay? Good. Come morning, you'll feel better for this. Uh, and then go on to do what you have to do. <laughs> Nobody will notice. They, they all play cards down the front. They're all drunk as skunks. So, you know, <laughs> you know. What happened to Pornvid? Oh, he's losing, wasn't he? <laughs> um, <laughs> the... Uh, a friend of mine used to translate for me before I knew enough Thai. And so when, when, when the trustees are telling you first night reception, and there'll be no ping in my cell, you know, and as for number twos, don't even think about it. Um, he'd do it as sort of um, a bit of a South Yorkshire accent. So I, I, I can't help but now think of these Thai trustees with these South Yorkshire accents. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, but what do you do, Jen, if... Right. Um, you come around a corner and there's one 15, 20 feet. You see him, he sees you. He's got a radio. You'd have to attack. You couldn't, you couldn't run. Uh, attack, he's got a gun. Run. He, <laughs> he might have a gun. He might not. I mean, often it's not, they wouldn't. But, you know, you know the, some of them were nutters. They used to be gun freaks. They, 15 feet, he sees you, you see him in the dark. Or 25 so feet. This is his range. Stay quiet and still, couldn't you? Uh, Disappear into like, talk the shadows. Your way out of it? Yes. No, you need a device. A laser pattern, obviously. Uh, but what I'd done with it was um, I'd taken a... Um, organic shampoo bottle. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> but it had a rounded top and um, got some balsa wood in and made a phony gun. <laughs> right. And the shampoo bottle was the silencer on it, and the laser pointer was the laser scope on it. <laughs> and here's the thing. If it's in the middle of the night, you've never seen a prisoner out at night. You know, when I first got out through the bars, I looked up at the stars, and I hadn't seen them for two years. I hadn't seen the night sky. It was kind of... Really distracting. Um, and I looked back at my cellmates and it was like I never knew them. That was all the past. I was a creature of the night glued to the side of a wall. So if you're a guard and this thing that shouldn't be there is suddenly in front of you, plus he's a farang, white trash might do anything to you, 
and you've got a laser light pointed at your chest, and what's clearly got a silence on it, everybody knows what they look like, you heard a click, you know, it was a paper clip, but it wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> and you understand clearly, get on your knees. Um, whatever you might have, I think with that laser pin on your chest, you're not going to do anything. No. So I can close the 15 feet, truss him up like a turkey, or let's say a duck this time, <laughs> and repeat ourselves. Um, and that was it. So that kind of thinking was involved, you know, what if this happens. Did that happen? No. There was one stirred. He got up, scratched his, he scratched his belly, went for a pee, splashed water on himself, but went back. I made sure the uh, uh, bottles of Klong, the whiskey, uh, normally given out on a Friday night, uh, went out on this Tuesday night. <laughs> so that was the end of that lot. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly, I think. There was there was only one I was concerned about, and he wasn't on, and that meant going. So um, those were really the only tools and the ability to get over all these walls without having to go over the gates. My, Michael, my old business partner and friend for many years from Australia, who was a Commonwealth pole vaulting champion, told me how to carry very long things because those long poles they used to carry um, – they were aluminium, and then when they became fiberglass, they used to wobble a bit. And he said, if you're carrying something that's flopping about, that's quite heavy, carry the, the center point and lope, don't run. So I was loping across the fields with this thing bouncing and, and getting into the, the rhythm, like the wobbly bridge over <laughs> London. <you know? laughs> yeah. Um, and... Um, as I say, it was only it was virtually dawn by the time I propped that up on the the final outer wall, and instead of swimming, the the big um, moat, the long one, the idea was to put my clothes in a plastic bag, tie it up, swim over, dry myself off, change. But I thought there's no time for this. I, it's starting to be that time. You know, there's this kind of silence before dawn where you can start to see things. And splashing of water would be, it was so obviously going to be just the wrong thing to do. Um, and I only had one last resort backup implement that, uh, that I grabbed just because there was one in this kind of war game scenario that you run through every possibility. Um, there's only one thing left, and that was what if they're looking at you from the towers? Um, and that was where, what was, it was from a factory that was nominally my actual place of employment. I think I paid somebody to work there. I never met him personally. I believe he was a very good worker. <laughs> never got beaten. They used to beat the laziest <laughs> worker of the day at the end of the shift. <laughs> I mean, there's always going to be somebody, isn't it? Yeah, poor bastards. Um, it was a pop up umbrella. And, I put that, I'd use the last of my water, not to drink, but to clean the mud off myself, put on my long khaki pants, which matched the guards' ones, and prisoners were not allowed long pants. Um, and some, they usually wore flip-flops, so um, shoes. Put the umbrella down, and the gods must have been favoring me that evening, Sean, as I've told you, a little light rain came over. I learned years later, that it wasn't a light rain, it was the spittle of the gods' laughter <laughs> as they were planning worse things for me in years to come. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just looked oh. up from that umbrella and couldn't, you know, you can't help yourself. I just had a little look in the guard tower and there was one kind of half frowning, but, you know, what, what's somebody walking in down the side that way for? But it's so unthinkable that there would be a prisoner wandering around out there. And the guards used to sneak in when they were late, sometimes come through. This moat had, I think, two narrow crossings, one right at the back and, and the front one, of course. Um, and I've always figured, too, this, the key thing to that was I've never heard of an escape where the prisoners took the trouble to think of rain wear in case there should be light... Uh, Frank, there's light showers today of our escape. Uh, have you got your Burberry? <laughs> um, that's not sort of prisoner talk in the average jail. So 
um, I think whatever it was, it was harmless, an umbrella. And even my own personal guard, the one that had my ATM cards, if you needed cash, they'd go to the bank for you for an honest 10%. Mm. He started talking 15 in the beginning, but you know where that's leading. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, um, internal racketeers used to charge 25. And he, I think, recognized me, not recognized me, but saw something familiar in the way I was walking. We, we don't think about it, but we all watch each other's body language and movements. And that gets programmed in a bit. I think you could look out your window and see a cloaked figure walking in the night and the walk might give it away. Oh, I don't mean if it was Igor out of Frankenstein loping along, scraping a leg, but, but even you know, the, the manner of it. And because I was a source of money to him, I suppose that was programmed in too. Uh, he was arriving in his new car. And... Um, he he was smarter than your average idiot there, and I think he knew something. But I um, <clears throat> got out of the front, went up onto the footbridge that covers the six-lane highway to the airport and looked back. Never looked back, they say, turned into <laughs> a pillar of salt. But, uh, you know, all I could think was there's thousands of you in there. Why are you staying? Mm. And, and people had said, you know, that this is not going to work. Even my supporters had said, you know, we'll come and see you, uh, you know, it's going to be a long time, but, you know, you'll live okay. <clears throat> Unfortunately, one of the supporters who was making other arrangements for a long stay was also the guy that had uh, <clears throat> arranged my passport uh, because I knew I had to get out within hours. Uh, and that's not really encouraging. I mean, think of... Jen, think of your friends, and you've asked them, okay, one of the friends has to be mixed up with the Chinese triads, but we'll work that in somehow. <laughs> they have agreed to get you, um, take your old driving license or whatever is handy, and take the photo from it, yeah. re-photograph it, put it in a passport, uh, and the passport has to have several things in going for it. Freshly stolen or lost within the last few weeks, so that... Um, it's not got a, um, a reissue that's caught up with the, the world's immigration computers. Um, that, that photo's got to be put in there, resealed in there. Oh, and they have to go to the airport and make sure that somebody on the take with immigration programs it in as a visiting tourist. The visa stamp has to go in there, the little slip of paper filled out with the visa. All of that. All of that's got to be done by a person who doesn't think you've got any chance of being there and then left behind the mirror of a toilet of an apartment that you've never been to, but you have the key to. Mm. Uh, how much confidence have you got <laughs> that that will be there behind the mirror in the apartment that you don't know? Yeah, not a lot. <laughs> no, <laughs> nobody springs to my... Oh, Mary, she'll do that for me. Yeah. <laughs> she likes Chinese food. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's the way I felt. Um, but when I, I, I felt behind that mirror and struck something. It was like gold. Yeah, it could have been an old sticker on the back. Of the <laughs> room, losing raffle ticket or something. You know? um, and then pretty quickly opened the envelope. And there I saw my crumbling face. Um, <clears throat> mostly due to the fact this thing had been re-photographed a couple of times to get it to size. It was a little bit grainy for a passport photo. And when I did get on the plane, I had an hour to dislike that passport more and more. <laughs> you know, stitching was wrong. Uh, you know, old hands could see that the plastic had been changed. I didn't like it. You know, the only person who disliked that passport more than I uh, was um, the immigration officer at Singapore when I landed, a country that would have sent me back in a, in a, in a flash. So um, he uh, looked at me, looked at it. Now, they don't like to make trouble. It's like Dubai. They might have hang them quick, hang them fast laws, but they won't go out of their way to arrest a Westerner unless they've got an you know, overwhelming reason to it. So I saw him pass it towards the ultraviolet scanner. 
and that has to show um, the green um, background light and pattern of the British passports, and also um, three little pink crowns over the edge of the photograph. I just did a little show on uh, my channel about the new British passport. I should have brought it. We could chat about it. <laughs> anyway, it's very fancy. He slid that towards it, and he and I were both rewarded by three pink crowns <laughs> becoming visible. And I yeah. staggered out of uh, Singapore into the steamy tropical afternoon. Drew breath, took two taxis to drop the men I think, and found a three-star hotel, best choice. Go to a one-star, everybody's trying to rob you. Five-star, full of security from big knobs. Don't want that either. No. Three-star, boring, near-suicidal commercial <laughs> travelers. Uh, of course. You know. <laughs> 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 went to, <laughs> went to uh, at the gift shop, bought some uh, swimming shorts, straight up to the top floor and dived in the pool. So it wasn't a moat, Sean, that I swam. It was the length of a swimming pool in Singapore after 18 hours on the trot. Uh, and it was refreshing. And, and underwater all that way, lifted myself up, stood against the railing, looked over the Changi Hills and felt the fresh air of freedom blowing over me and turned around and then what? Sean knows. I dived right back in, <laughs> and not the swimming pool we're talking about. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, yeah, that picture did remind I was very lucky on the night that um, it was such a, a – in fact, I had kind of um, – for a generation that bothers to look up old newspaper clippings because it was 96. What was your and, first night's sleep like? Uh, Poor, bad. Really? Uh, if you do something, you'll find where um, any mistake will cost you your life. Worse than your life. Not much life, nothing. You're dead. But um, years of suffering, that's a little more rattling. Mm. Um, then you pump so much adrenaline into your system that you can't just... Switch off. Got a valve yeah. somewhere, you know, like a... <laughs> adrenaline version of a colostomy bag you just <laughs> take it off and squeeze it out you know <laughs> strange picture <laughs> um do you sleep now, okay now no with a little help from my friends but yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah one or another. um i always get the dreams though of um I, i'm in a prison of some kind it just will not leave me alone and no wonder i'm tired during the day because all the production money is spent on the design of the prisons. Every night something different. Sometimes the glass city, sometimes uh, Ali Baba's cave, uh, sometimes people. I mean, last night's was all done in silks and um, the, the boss of this prison was on a kind of, um, what was the Star Wars character, the big fat guy, Jedi the Hutt, Attila the Hutt, something the Hutt. Um, anyway, Jabba. 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 Yes. Yeah. That sort of size, but actually human, uh, sitting on all these cushions saying, well, we have a place for you in here. And I'm thinking, yeah, not, not once I can get out of here. So I exhaust myself all night in the dreams, plotting escapes, um, including those ones, Twilight Zone ones, where you end up, I get out, um, go someplace and think the city seems strange. Now I'll get used to it, adapt. And then somebody will come up to me, don't you know the whole city is a jail now? Oh. Did you ever feel safe uh, when you were escaping? No. Uh, Was there ever a moment? Well, after you... escape. Yeah. I don't think um, you kind of get into a. Um, I met somebody years ago whose uh, family was getting murdered a lot. <laughs> we just, oh. just had to take a quick break there. I'd just mm. like to remind you guys. That David's audio book, narrated by himself. You all say you would just love to listen to him narrate the telephone book. He's got such a voice. That audio book is now available on Amazon worldwide. Yeah, you can listen to his voice for hours and hours and hours of content. Exactly, about What's 14 and a half hours, Sean. <laughs> and it is. by the time you get this, you will have seen him on Lad Bible. 
Because it's, it's, it's going out. It's gone mm. out. It's out. And uh, by Christmas, you'll have Escape. It's been rewritten, especially to, yeah, lead you to a place you want to go. Are both your audio books out on both your books? No, um, I'm just recording Escape at the moment. In fact, I was thinking... The second one. Uh, it's actually the first book. Yeah. But it was written in such a weird way. You know, when you write the first book, yeah, it's all kind of... Well, I should make this, you know, in Nabokov or Marcel Proust or yeah. the Russians. Had all those faces. And uh, any decent editor will say, what the hell? <laughs> Is Look, shit? Just spit the story out in like your you're voice. reporting for <laughs> a, a local newspaper. Yes. Don't forget names. We love names. <laughs> <laughs> I had to put an index in uh, one of them because it um, had so many names in it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, and, and the rewritten escape is um, a little more um, continuous. I in the beginning, you know, that that escape thing was so weird in a way. I didn't know how to approach it. So I, I picked up the first kind of true crime books that I've ever seen, and I hated all of them. Right. People had found God. They were terribly sorry. I was sorry, all right. I was sorry I had to go through all of this. <laughs> <laughs> sorry I got chased yeah. for you know, 10 years by Australian police. Many regrets. Um, or they, um, oh, they're victims. Mm. Now, Sandra Gregory, you remember her? So Sandra, Sandra Gregory, a uh, fellow arrest. public speaker, yeah. Mm. Okay, well, I went up abroad. Great story. Great story. Uh, it's, it's a, that that's one. why you know, they say, turds, <laughs> Sean you know, gets a bit of slagging for getting tangled up in the business, which I did recommend again. Timestamp. <laughs> <laughs> Three timestamps now. Oh, Sorry about that. Uh, Sean got a bit of flack for being tangled up in things that people somehow took offense to. and But, but I've always said, you know, a true friend, always want to help people, saying nice things about Sandra Gregory. I wouldn't say otherwise. Well, <laughs> Sandra Except Gregory, I don't know if she still works for the same public speaking agency as me, but she did. So we all had dinner together. And um, I've been to her talks at the school. She's had a remarkable impact on the students. She's a very uh, quirky, bubbly person. And she says it how it is. And she's very fascinating to watch her speak. I th Look, I thought she was quite good on Banged Up. Um, what was her story? Well, she was Rough with... God. She got. She was out you there. Want the truth or her yeah. story? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say her story. All right. She was out there and on the taxi, water taxi. Ben it's Bangkok. Some of that yes. water got in her mouth. It wasn't worms. I think it was feces. So she gets this illness. Right. She hasn't got the flight money to get home. <laughs> so <clears throat> couldn't work. You know. <laughs> decides to smuggle a little something, something. Uh, Work okay. for Bob Locke, Robert Locke. <laughs> yeah, and she was so honest that when she got stopped at the airport, she did. They were following this Robert Locke character. Yeah, and they turned to her, and she was so honest. They said to her, Are "You with him?" And she said, "Yes." It just went yeah. Oh, not only that. What? That's how she got arrested. The police were like arresting him and taking him away, and she, they turned to her and they said, "Are you with him?" And she said, "Yes." <laughs> so, so, so the kid at the back of the schoolroom was. So then she gets up for the death uh, Bob oh, was actually God. on the aircraft at the time. Uh, are you with him? Extended the long reach of her pointing finger around two exit terminals down the finger into his very seat. He was dragged off the plane, actually. Mm. Um, but uh, yes, uh, she she was so honest. She felt that no party would be complete without Bob. <laughs> so, But he was acquitted, I should say. And that yeah. was one of the very few acquittals I've ever seen in Thailand. 99% conviction rate, which is similar to Japan. They won't go to court without a confession. So you can imagine they're very persuasive with the air conditioning to ensure that they get uh, a confession. You know, cold cell is a tough thing. It's annoying. It's really irritating. And then you want to kill. Um, and the other guy that was in prison out there was Billy Moore, wasn't it, out of Liverpool? It was, but I, I, I missed him. Oh, by the way, I got in touch with uh, a guy called Justin Jackson. He's got a little um, Facebook clong prim memories of the 90s, you know. Now, it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, and he's got some memories. And he was there after I got out. Um, and 
You folks will know what nobody else does at the moment because I only heard it from him. After I left, now I was down at the airport waiting, you know, scrabbling to get onto this plane. I thought it would have been like the Chiang Mai escape where these Israelis had gone. Uh, they got them and smashed them to pieces, of course. But um, uh, I needn't have worried because they were still looking for me, the guards within the prison. And as much as they all got collectively punished for my having left, they had their shower curtains taken away. Sounds trivial, but when your whole shower is yeah. a shower curtain, it's not. <laughs> um, and some people were split up, and the others in my cell room moved to different places. But Justin was there to see what was the comforting sight of 10 of the guards that I'd paid off by one means or another, roaming around uh, building number six and elsewhere, you know, looking at the cut bars and thinking, well, he clearly got out, but he couldn't have left us. He, he's got an office full of food. <laughs> he's got this, he's got... And, they, and Justin said, they were going around saying, Daniel, Daniel, <laughs> like looking for a lost puppy, um, thinking that... <laughs> magnitude of my betrayal was not quite apparent at that stage. <laughs> um, and so really, though there was quite a bit of flack afterwards, um, it, they, everybody said from there uh, it was worth putting up with because at least somebody had got out of the place. And I think most prisoners would be like that, wouldn't they? Yeah. yeah even if, you know, they get locked down and, you know, half rations or it might be going too far, but get punished in some way. Um, knowing one of their one from their side is free because nobody thought that that would happen, <laughs> and I was one of the ones and didn't think it would happen. And but I was reasonably confident that once I got my hands on my second passport, uh, that that I'd be okay. You know. Um, so many what, over the two years, every con artist and bit of Western driftwood that yeah. came into the prison had they were on some shitty little sentence, short term thing, you know, a couple of grams or whatever. Uh, but the ones who could actually speak um, would get me in some way. I mean, the prime was Dean Reed, who, when I was at my most suicidal which was after arrest, and you can't kill yourself easily in there. No, I mean, you need some privacy for suicide. You, know? you can hardly say to somebody, oh, don't come in, I'm killing myself, I'll be done in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, need a hand? No, it's all right. <laughs> what methods did you contemplate? Um, well, there, there wasn't simply anything. Um, bleeding to death takes forever, um, and half the time you just go to a sort of comatose shock. Um, on on another occasion, when I was facing torture, I was trying to get the blade out of my pencil sharpener, but the little bugger wouldn't come out. Uh, and I sort of came good the next day over that one. But there was this con man who saved me from this feeling of wanting to escape, yet only to go to a tall hotel, the Dusitani I'd chosen, to go onto the rooftop and sling myself off it. Uh, I'd been fighting... I don't know, what was it, 20 years? Constant battle with the authorities. And I'd taken so many precautions uh, with this trip to Thailand. Um, the police were following me, and when they um, logged the movements of my telephone, they saw it was still in Melbourne, Australia. They tapped it, and they heard me call somebody in Melbourne, have a conversation with the guy, and then hang up. So when the Americans said, no, he's here, He's staying at the Oriental. They didn't believe it. They said, no, we've got him down more. We can't see him, but we've got the phone, you know. He doesn't know all of that. Um, um, how would you do that, by the way? How would you make that particular trick? I got him baffled. Um, you give your cell phone to a friend. Yes. Yeah. You record in the studio, just like here, or over the phone, the whole conversation. He or she tapes it. Yeah. While you're away, it goes to a pay phone, rings your phone, answers your phone, plays the tape okay. conversation between you two uh, yeah i'll be over later especially throw in something like that you know. 
usual place. That'll set them busy. <laughs> Cost them money. That's my policy. You know, mm. bankrupt them. <laughs> I used to leave um, uh, addresses from uh, Las Vegas lying around uh, and stuff like that. So, um, no, they uh, uh, they weren't at the airport then. But as I was saying, there were there were so many um, con men like this Bostonian and that unique Boston accent. Um, He'd even got to my friends um, and asked them for fifty thousand dollars to do something or other, um, and got it. Um, but you know, I, I I'm really very forgiving of of, of con artists because you get entertainment. That's number one. <laughs> number two, you wouldn't hang around because you know perfectly well what they're up to, <laughs> unless you you know were enjoyed the flattery because there'll always be some of that were interested in the lure um but they've got a fault and sean will tell you this they can't even if they like you even if the bit of a deal can pay off for everybody and you think well he's got no rational reason to do it they can't help themselves can they with narcissists the bastard just can't help <laughs> stooging you and sitting back somewhere in the brief moments when they're successful, until they blow it all again and go back scamming away. Um, so in a sense, I knew it, but it gave me hope from this despair of nothing will ever work and I, no matter how elaborate the scheme is, no matter how much trouble. I mean, some of these passports were golden mm. that I was on, untouchable. Um, I'd... I'd Take a special trains. Uh, I, I canvassed a whole street, a whole city street. There was not a soul in that street. I didn't know their business. I followed everybody wherever they walked. I followed some guy. I thought he was suspicious. He kept going to building after building, officer. He was just an old retired gent fantasizing about the days when he had offices and people that he cared about and worked. It's quite touching, actually, if you look into the minds of people as they travel about their business. A lot of sad and lonely people. I later found him at a government office collecting benefits. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I felt like going up and giving him some money or something like that. Get me full for a minute, you old joke. <laughs> 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 um, so my friends didn't think anything unusual had happened so, because the thing was I had to notify them and the, the th it was to be done by this. I would send, um, in a golden era of faxes, uh, a fax um, with my temporary location to, not to them, of course, <laughs> don't do this, uh, but to the print shop down the road that takes faxes for people in the area who don't have a machine. I think now if you had to send such a thing, and you sometimes do, there are still things around that require them, oddly enough. Usually people who don't want to pay your money back, that's where it is. <laughs> if you ever find that somebody says, oh, you need to fax this because we're, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you'll never get your dough, forget it. <laughs> no. um, they got the fax from the print shop, but didn't believe it. I thought somehow somebody's got into the way I do things or found out or looked over my shoulder or not. They didn't react until they read it in the newspaper the next day from the Straits Times in Singapore. Gulp, because I was still there. Uh, that Daniel Westlake had uh, made it over the wall. And, uh, of course, then they kicked into gear, and within 24 hours I had a, a new British passport under the name of Northridge. Uh, I try and keep... <clears throat> Compass points. I've kind of run out, right. but you know, I've never heard of anybody called Nor Nor West. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Eastman was another one, and then went to the only place where I could get safety, which was in Baluchistan. But in a funny, I, when I was talking to Justin um, about the Bangkok days. I said, look, you must have transferred. He did six years there for some ecstasy. He was doing the parties. He said to me back then, look, it's, uh, they're all the sons and daughters of rich people in Bangkok. They're local people. You know, I, I'm safe. You know, fathers are generals and top police and all of that. 
Yeah, that sounds terribly safe to me. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't ask for more. <laughs> so we were having this conversation, sitting around as he's visiting my jailhouse offices. Uh, he, um, he he looks back on it and things that I didn't even realize were going on. He said, oh, I couldn't see David straight away. His people had to have a walk and talk for a couple of weeks before I was let into the uh, his area. I suppose it was a bit like that, but it wasn't. It was just being antisocial as I am today. You know, <laughs> who? Meet people? Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> Met all the people I want to meet. <laughs> um, and um, so he... As I say, it was six years before he transferred back, and he found the time, he's from Scotland, uh, he went straight up there, but he found the time in, it was only six months or so, in a British prison, a Western prison, much harder than really? it was in Bangkok. Because we had this um, prisoner of war mentality. Now, Sean, you were in Arizona, so you're an outsider in a double way or triple way. I can think of three levels. You're an outsider there. Yeah. <laughs> Probably a fourth if I dared go down that path, no? <laughs> <laughs> Um And, you know, so you're, you're, um, you're in a professional class, but that served you well because you could you know, read their court documents for you. Got my education. Got a charge. Yeah, yeah. I'll, we'll have a robust defense of that. You know, they like hope, don't they, people? Um, and um, so Justin was saying that when we were in, in, the, in the prison, we had to arrange our own food. We had to keep on the go all the time. Um, remember Empire of the Sun? I don't know. It's a book by J.G. Ballard, but it made into a good movie by Spielberg in which a very young... It's not Star Wars, is it? No. Oh, who played <laughs> that? <laughs> oh, uh, his name's got a C in it. Uh, he played Batman at one stage. Uh, Bale. Christian, Christian Bale. Bale. Yeah. yeah. When he was a kid, he played this boy who'd been um, thrown in a Japanese uh, civilian internment camp. Right. In Hong Kong, yeah. During the war, and based on a true story, because the Ballard was at that age, but the kid grows up there from what I think eleven to fourteen or fifteen, and you can see his life you know, bouncing off in the morning. He's running to scan the tomatoes that are growing in the patch. He's trading those for some polish shoes, a job that he's doing for the doctor. He's doing this. Yeah. Every moment is taken, and the reward is visceral and immediate as food. Um, that is all they live for. And that's the way a lot of people felt when going back to Western prisons. Being spoon-fed, as Justin said, uh, everything given to you. Um, you've got no, con you, you, there's no demands that you do anything to cater for your life. That's why in the Scandinavian prisons, they try to replicate some sort of real world within their prisons. They have shops in there. They give you enough What's money. That lovely prison? To... Greenland. Greenland or Norway? Seen that? Well, both of them are quite, quite nice. Okay. You I recommend it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> no, I'll tell you what I didn't know. We just met. The story about um, <laughs> this guy, right? He's going to, he's been arrested crossing a border he shouldn't cross. He's from uh, R Romanian Bulgaria, a real hillbilly. So he doesn't know anything about what it's like but he does know what it's like in jail in in romania this is you know he said to me david in there you go in room six six no talking you want poo you want shit big tin here that is it food black bread soup good day sunday soup yeah all of that so he gets <laughs> busted for uh you know patently bogus documents i don't know a tram ticket or something trying to cross the border he ends up in a swiss prison Mm. Carpeting, everything, luxury, shower, kettle, TV. <laughs> Breakfast slip has to fill in the card. <laughs> He's doing this, all happy. Then his hands st starts to shake. <laughs> no, it couldn't be. I only crossed the border. <laughs> Breakfast comes. A woman comes. You got any friends, family, visitors? No. You don't want to bring anybody else into it. You know, they're on mm. automatic. Oh, oh. She produces a folder. There's pictures of women in it. This girl can come and see you. That girl can come and see you. For what? You know, to be close to somebody from outside if you have no family. 
We have a special room here. He's what? banging on the door. Yeah, he's banging on the door, pleading with the prison director or governor or whatever it is. Don't kill me! Don't kill me! I only cross border. I go home. <laughs> he thought he the only trap. time that <laughs> you get good treatment in a Romanian prison is the day before your execution. <laughs> he was so good in this Swiss prison. He was convinced they were just going to shoot him at dawn. Yeah. And uh, you know, actually, gonna, some girl's going to give me a kiss goodbye. <laughs> you know, it's, it's definitely in it. Yeah, oh. yeah you got to love a hillbilly, haven't you? Mm. <laughs> yeah, it was different. So this adapting back from uh, from Thailand um, was tough from all of them. I mean, it wasn't for me because I was adapted back you know, within within seconds. Um, but um, no, I think the the the, the Thai thing was. The, the more I look back on it, uh, um, I was kind of lucky and it was very uh, unique to the times. Would it work today? Mm, depends. I, I, I think everything is, um, you know, everything's possible, isn't it? Well, don't you think technology would have got more advanced? Well, look at, uh, what's your favourite escape? I mean, would you give it to Shorty Guzman? Puppy on. <laughs> He made it up, though. but um, yeah, I like jumping onto floating coconuts in the <laughs> middle of the uh, windswept tropics of Devil's Island. Yeah, that's, El Chapo's uh, pulled quite a few off. I mean, that one going through the body. Did you see it? Uh, um, he was in the cell, uh, the toilet floor, and the, the shower. Right, has been substituted for. I mean, there's a lot of talk that this thing involved a big payoff. Why do people think that big payoff? It was all uh, faked. He never went out that way. He went out, you know, dressed up like a man through the front gate and all that stuff. Yeah, they might have dug a bit of tunnel, but this was just to convince the authorities. People, now listen up. <clears throat> you can't get that level of bribery and cooperation from people. Bribery is a subtle, delicate thing. Don't think you can just go to some shit all around the world and throw your money like some arrogant western scumbag you know trying to exploit these people no you've got to be family and the money is not a bribe is it it's yeah, i want to help and it's mm. never for them if i had to get visas extended or phony documents stamped in say pakistan i go to the office where it is done and see somebody and shoo away as many people as possible and uh, you want a cup of tea, they say. Your business is done. The reason is because the tea will come and then you can say, have you got a, a tea trolley fund here or something like that? A little money in there. Now this thing I need. <laughs> oh, it can't be done. It can't be done. Oh, I know. Why's that? <laughs> because the, the rule. No, I know, but why is it here today? Why can't it be done? Oh, my boss. Ah, your boss. I know your boss is a bit of a hard man. He's, I believe he likes money. Oh, he's a greedy pig, is he? <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I know you're an honest family man. Let's take this and give it to the damn boss, huh? You take a day off. You go see the boss. And uh, I'll get out of here because I need to get you get that done. Yeah, all right. That'll be, you can't embarrass them. You're dealing with people who, um, I mean, Look at the, who are the people who are going to kill you? Those who embarrass easily. Um, the Taliban uh, embarrass easily. That's why they're running around with a gun instead of having girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they didn't like the uh, Soviet days back there. You know, I, uh, I know three generations of people who would, you'd call Taliban, and yet, as I've tried to explain to people, there isn't any Taliban except in the media division of a bunch of Doha negotiators who said, <laughs> what? Oh, you remember those guys? You've got to explain yeah. why we're laughing, because <laughs> it's your stomach. <laughs> yeah, I oh, know, I like the I used to bring of... bananas and peanut butter to address this. Mm. Mm. Yeah, bananas are good. <laughs> slow digesting, they say. Yeah. Well, not slow enough, I guess. No, you didn't have a proper breakfast. I had cheese on toast before I come out. Mm. I had a banana. You know, Bangkok used to serve a very good donut I do in the know. morning. <laughs> yeah, right. When every, <laughs> everything was a cottage industry, there'd be um, if you didn't have a job, 
And my Chinese connection took me on a tour once. He said, that guy, these two, they roll cigarettes. They had a little piece of leather or something they could roll cigarettes. And there was a blind, oh, the beggars. There was a blind beggar in rags. He used to very carefully take his rags off after mm. work, make sure they were suitably horrible looking. <laughs> uh, and he he had a kind of glazed eye, which he used to make a lot of. And he sold what, um, he repaired lighters or something. Pretty good for a blind man, eh? Um, <laughs> and... Uh, I used to kind of smile at him to try and get him to smile back, you know, so he must have seen me. But he had, um, <laughs> he, people kept their distance because he had a terribly great hacking cough, probably a nappy rash as well. <laughs> but um, this used to come out and make spitting, so he didn't want to be too near him. And he got me back though, Sean. I used to take my morning run because I had to be reasonably healthy for all this gymnastics out of the um, out of the window. Um, <laughs> I, I, I run around past the sort of cage where he, he, he did his business. He couldn't be with the other sellers on their blankets and, and towels. Uh, and I could see him sort of standing up and, and getting re ready for a spit. So I didn't think anything of it because I'm motoring past and I've got a, the editor on. Who are you promoting? <laughs> Nike? No. Uh, <laughs> and I rounded the thing and too late I saw his parched rubbery lips poking through the chicken wire fence and this hawking. You know, the sound travels at a different distance than, than light. Yeah. <laughs> so I was a little bit behind it. <laughs> and this great green amoeba thing was tumbling through the air before I knew it. I swear it had eyes, this thing. <laughs> and it clung on to me like some alien creature in a science fiction oh. world. <laughs> and I could feel the warmth. That, uh, I had to tear my Lacoste sweatshirt off and <laughs> threw it in a rubbish bin. But you can never throw anything out in that country. Mm. And about 10 people fighting over it two minutes later, despite <laughs> it was walking around by itself due to this great <laughs> gorby that this had. And he was smiling at the old bastard too. <laughs> you know? he, he, he knew that that was it. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, Taliban, that's where we were. Now, they are not a cohesive group at all. They are local gangsters, village gangsters. Th hundreds of them. I, I, I've lost track at about estimating 800 because we're talking 25 different dialects, different languages, different zones. People are the Pashto and the Dari speakers who are like Persian. Um, uh, now, I went there in 79 uh, and with Sayed, he was living in Bangkok, and we went over to organize some hash. Went to a village, took my old Thai contact there, Lee. Um, met somebody who was, uh, you know, he'd never been there uh, to this village. Part of the family went one way uh, to Bangladesh, another somewhere else. Um, and he ended up sort of in the middle in Thailand. Uh, spoke about six languages, like a, an English, like a taxi driver from everywhere. But, uh, and, and when the old man saw Lee, you know, he, he burst into tears because he just didn't think that whole section of the family were uh, alive anymore. Um, so, you know, I made arrangements there and did the usual thing to had the, the well dug another couple of hundred meters down with a new pump. My brother used to say, oh, well, that's your conscience at work. You're, you're, you're exploiting these people. I said, well, you're exploiting these people. They were exploiting me, and happily so. Um, I never did get my hash in there. Oh, no, no. Distracted I was by something more <laughs> lucrative. Um, and now, uh, Sayed was uh, a young guy then. He just had uh, no, he wasn't even married. He'd just been married. He was running around in that area, and I saw him again. Um, and you know the story. When I was back in Afghanistan, trying to find the nephew of um, my protector there, uh, Lord Mir John Magsi of the Magsi clan in Baluchistan. His cousin had gone missing. Uh, no, nephew. Um, 
across the border in Afghanistan. And I met Syed because he was still a scallywag, right. the old one, and that was in Jalalabad. And he and his friend were all wearing this black stuff. And I didn't really pay much attention to the news, but I knew the Taliban. I'd only been there before when the Russians were being chased out by people we tooled up, the Mujahideen, and they would kind of split into various groups. Um, I'm trying to think of the guy's name, uh, Masood, the old uh, Mujahideen leader, Panshir Valley man, uh, salt of the earth, bit of a lunatic if you're on the wrong side of him, but <laughs> stylish, you know, he had that kind of natural style of a Gaddafi, if I can put it that way. <laughs> he had Italians Gaddafi, didn't he, doing all his design stuff. That's some organic clothing for you. There you go. <laughs> Bourbon natural. <laughs> um, and I went and saw Sayed in Jalalabad, and I was making all the usual feeble jokes, you know. I said, remember that time we went to that village and, you know, the, there was the girl wearing the full, you know, Ninja Turtle outfit. <laughs> and uh, I, I said to the old man uh, who knew a bit of English, I said, well, at least you could marry off the ugly ones, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it was like an oil painting. Nobody laughed. It was uh, <laughs> absolute still silence. Tubbleweed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, the, uh, uh, we went off ahead and there was tightening of <laughs> gun stocks and grips with my guys and everything like that. And we sort of backed out of there. <laughs> I said, how'd it go back in the village? <laughs> oh, well, they smashed the cup you drank out of. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Burnt the chair you sat in. <laughs> what? But it was nice, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but nonetheless, and uh, when I left, an old woman was wiping away your footprints <laughs> with an old stick. <laughs> <laughs> so Brilliant. we're going to do business somewhere else now. Are we? Yeah. 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 Now he was. When I met him again, um, we went in for some really horrible soup someplace. You know, when the oil's floating across it. Now nice. you're supposed to dip the egg in it. Well, which is the egg? It all looks like egg. Mm. <laughs> um, he said, David, no, we, we can't make jokes like the old days. I said, but you're still you. Yeah, but, uh, and who's that one? Oh, he's from a gang down in, uh, um, um, where is it, Kandahar. And those boys have got this. It was like listening to a mobster's parade. I lost track of, you know, a few hundred of these different groups. So, what, well, where's the Taliban? <laughs> oh, no, 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 you, you, you Westerners call it that. No, no, we're just a bunch of people, and we're all crooks. And what well, about this cutting hands off? Oh, he just likes to do that. He's always been, he grew up as a kid doing that. <laughs> okay. uh, you know, the, the idea that there's a cohesive knit to it. Well, um, sadly, through a bit of a misunderstanding, and I was out of the room at the time, so he ended up getting himself killed. But his son, um, I spoke to, not so long ago, when when they when they're coming in, he says that um, they they didn't um, the Afghani army didn't melt away. For a start, they they knew they didn't have any reserves of uh, ammunition. Um, secondly, uh, most of them were a third of that army couldn't read or write. They were all from villages somewhere else. They weren't going to fight with somebody, and they knew these guys as the local big boys on the block, and they still right. had this psychological intimidation from their village life. Oh, him, you don't want to mess with him. And so they made a deal, the Taliban, uh, we'll call them Tally Butt, because there's always a butt with these people. Uh, they kind of made arrangements with them all. It's like, look, you, you want to fight for a bit of nothing or what? No, no, not me. All right, well, we'll pay you for... Uh, if you show us where the you know, how to fix the tank or the thing or get treads for the off track and all that half track. Um, so it, it was by consent. <clears throat> no, the the reason that the, the it's going to be a mess is because the media division uh, are clashing with uh, the ones who are actually on the ground and. On the ground, there's many, 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 many. You know the ones who were running around in uh, dodgem cars? I don't know yeah. if you saw that video. Uh, Toyotas, wasn't it? <laughs> Taliban <laughs> loves Toyotas. Oh, and they're it? all in like new Toyota trucks and stuff. Mm. You've seen that on YouTube. 
No, I haven't seen it's that like one. convoys of them in brand new Toyotas. Um, I've seen them parading the uh, abandoned vehicles and all of that. But oddly enough, one clip worth seeing. Not ISIS. It's ISIS loves Toyotas. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, Someone I got it wrong. Toyota. That's it. It's on YouTube, yeah. So Taliban and Toyota people. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the view on the ground, a lot of promises were made to a lot of the people, and they're getting a bit grumbly because um, the section that deals with, or I think they deal uh, with the Westerners, um, are trying to um, shake out the, the bankers amongst them. You know how stupid they are? One of them, <laughs> uh, the, my friend tells me, went into the uh, um, Afghan Central Bank and uh, started walking around the place saying, where the money at? You know, like, uh, no, I can't draw that comparison. But <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Somebody gleefully arriving in a place of ill repute saying where the money uh, But there was no money there, of course, because... Um, that's not the way it worked. The Americans used to fly dollars in. They didn't, they used Afghanis, but they were very dependent on having these dollars there to um, back them up. And they were printed somewhere else, of course, by Delarue, I think. They uh, they need the contract now. They lost the passport once it fails. <clears throat> that's another show about them. <coughs> um, so where's it all heading? I asked him... Um, uh, he said, oh, well, I don't think those promises are going to come to anything. We'll just um, uh, tax everybody. You know? um, now, the previous government was terribly corrupt, too. You couldn't... Uh, if you want to um, get a taste for it, we'll take a road trip along the main highway from Kabul to Kandahar. It's supposed to be you know, monumentally and ceremoniously opened uh, by all the... Western agencies and forces that were in play there about 10 years ago. <laughs> Hugely expensive. Um, bit of highway. Oh, it's about three millimeters thick. <laughs> <laughs> it can be brushed away like <laughs> morning frost on the uh, windscreen <laughs> of a Jeep. Um, just it'll be gone with the wind soon. So everything that wasn't nailed down gets resold. And, you, you know, the army was mostly ghosts anyway, and uh, that they'd uh, written in all these people that didn't exist just to mm. collect their wages for them. Wow. So what, what was it you were going to say about <coughs> bribery in... Oh, Was bribery. it in the Thai prison? Okay, uh, yeah, bribery really depends on your location, and you need to absorb the local culture to... Um, get an understanding of where you're going for that. It is... We, in, in our world, can be very frank with each other with um, paying for something. You know, I'll take that watch in the shop and I'll give you this money for it. Um, but imagine you're in a land where you know it's a watch shop, but you can't see any watches. <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, and you walk in there and ask for a watch and they say, no, we don't know anything about watches. Nervous, oh no. But I really need to get one. Well, I might know somebody. Uh, now the reason I kind of was uh, with the, with the ties, it was they're very impressed by luck. Um, <clears throat> we are all rich in the West, not because we've worked at it or sit around devoting time to it, because we're lucky. Thailand's the center of the universe, the way I suppose Tokyo is the center of that universe, and uh, maybe. Uh, I wouldn't say Beijing, but I think there's some place even older within China that must be this. Every, so any misfortune that happens in Thailand, is, we've just been unlucky. Now, all the prisoners in the jail, they're unlucky or they wouldn't be here. It's nothing to do what they did or didn't do. It's just whether they're lucky or not. <clears throat> Amongst the white trash, that is the, the Western prisoners, um, there are some that are not, and they must be lucky. And often we see them actually go from here or stay here and, and live quite well, unless they turn into white trash. So <laughs> <clears throat> if you're going to do something to help them, they, they want something from outside or um, want to take over a room, I had to rent uh, a room of my own, then um, they don't see it that they're getting money for it. 
that, yeah, they used to live in like, yeah, that can be done. But uh, uh, it doesn't look any good. Well, it'll, they'll have to fix it all up. And uh, my boss, everything I do here. But when they get, when the guards get a job there, they get allocated a section and they have to extract a certain amount of income out of that, that section, no matter what. And the poorer producing factories, um, there are some contracts for things they do in there and make that go to official prison staff, but there's an awful lot that's not official. So um, I, I went into the art factory because the, the value of the goods was quite high, but it was all done privately. So I wouldn't have a stress boss. It's hard to tell he was blind drunk most of the time, so mm. not entirely stressed anyway. But um, And we had a perfectly good working relationship for all that time, despite never exchanging any real words, just a few smiles. And my head butler would go and do any real talking that had to be done. <clears throat> um, not that I didn't know a few words in Thai, but the point is, head butler was the only one that was willing to shake him awake. Um, a little jet was only about four foot six or something like that. But he was a tyrant as a head butler. He, you know, the, the cooks and the sweepers and the people who fetched the ice in the morning and the water bearers, all this ever-increasing family I didn't know was springing up around me. Uh, even, uh, I said, who the hell is that kid? He's coming here every day. He doesn't seem to do anything. <laughs> oh, he, um, he said, uh, what's that word? He said, he's a chimney sweep. There's no chimneys in here. <laughs> yeah, but we're ready if there ever is any. We've got our man. <laughs> he really sold him, but he felt sorry for him because he didn't know who he was, this kid. Um, he really didn't. He'd been in there five years. Nobody knew what language um, was his first. He looked Iranian. Mm. At a guess, we thought, hairy enough for one, pale enough for one. <laughs> His uncle had taken him somewhere to uh, the Gulf states when he was very little, and he'd ended up in Thailand. And he remembers he spoke to the um, nursemaids and then the cleaners as he got older and ended up on the streets. And the Thai police had arrested him. Don't know for what, don't know for why. Nobody found out. He didn't, he, to make an inquiry in that kind of place, you've got to have at least a little money in your hand, don't you? Mm. What am I here for? Who are you asking? You're asking the front layer of protection, the trustee who's the barrier between you and being annoyed by people. Um, so you have to give him something to talk to the guy who will actually find out what your name is. Uh, you couldn't walk out the front because um, the name written on there was um, like something that meant Persian hairy man. It wasn't even his real name. Um, a lot of them were in there just for uh, from the sweep up from the streets, pretty much. Not as bad as Pakistan, but <laughs> that's, that's on another level. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so the if uh, when I I found it would be quite good <clears throat> to be regular and give a little more. If something was ten percent, my own personal guard. Was, 15%, uh, I'd go to his head butler. <laughs> uh, some of those trustees were nauseating too. Imagine. You could see, you could even, even somebody who knew nothing about anything could walk in there and see where not to be. There, there were some people that, who guards were lying out on a sort of stretching recliner with a trustee on each leg massaging away. <laughs> but the look on the trustee's face, that was a killer. Really? It was like rapture, religious. Ah, <laughs> oh, my master lets me massage his leg. <laughs> what bliss, what more heaven. <laughs> You know, I, I, I said, I, I said, this was pretty, let's kill him. Let's kill him. <laughs> I'm stuck that for the trailer, James. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so it really annoys me when I get um, commenters on uh, my own channel or somewhere else, some other place, saying, oh, I bet you just, you, you didn't do all that. You just bought your way out. What? By my way, through eight tiers, eight levels of guards who are somehow Possibly. supposed to trust each other and then find a fall guy, because that's what Justin was telling me, that 
um, he stepped in a bit to protect my people who had been cast aside and um, worked out with the building chief who to blame. So <clears throat> it was a, you know, quite a story, apparently. A whole lot of prisoners that had been released were part of it and mostly uh, foreigners. Oh, old English Nick, if you got arrested again shortly after that, uh, it's all my fault. <laughs> but then again, you did take two credit cards from me, and I've never heard anything about those, <laughs> except on the monthly bills. I <laughs> Nick. He sold a bit of weed down that way in Patia and uh, had a Thai wife who helped him get out. You know, I bet she uh, helped him get in. <laughs> Milk the husband. It happened to be so <laughs> Not very generous with the allowance. <laughs> Get him nicked. <laughs> oh, my husband, I can get you out. I might have to sleep with that person. <laughs> yeah, sleep, sleep. <laughs> oh, but... I'll sleep with the fucking policeman. Get me out of here. <laughs> I always thought that was a ridiculous thing about um, Indecent Proposal. Remember that movie? Yeah. Where the young couple are in Vegas. And, you know, um, he's losing. I don't know why they're, they're trying to get money for something. It was a bit of a spin on Casablanca, the, the premise. Mm. And uh, he's all knotted up because she's asking the question, he's going to pay me for a million dollars for one night. And he, Richard Gere, wasn't it? No, it was no? Woody Harrelson in the version. Oh, was it? Okay. I saw. I thought, I thought to myself, if I was the husband, I'd be saying, well, sweetheart, if he doesn't want you... He can fuck me for one night for a million dollars. <laughs> yeah. two, million for a, two million for a threesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was really uh, uh, ridiculously took. You know. yeah. He can have it for a week for a million and a half. That was on Did Nick. she go through it in the end? What happened? What was that? that movie? Oh, in the movie. Oh, um, um, no, it makes you think. Of course, that it happened. That She's way. gearing yeah. up for it, but, but something she happened. doesn't. Or something. She doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and he lets her off the hook. Do they walk away with the money? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to think I sat through an hour and a half of. Please let us know everybody. in the comments what happened <laughs> in indecent proposal. Please correct us. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, that's true. So, um, but if you go to other places in the world, bribery is a different thing altogether. Right. Like in Wandsworth, there was a. Um, a night duty officer, and they're a separate bunch, by the way. They're not, you know, decent, <laughs> dishonest officers. They're decent night officers who haven't got any response. He will deliver an envelope under your door, whatever you can pack in. It's like the post office, maximum thickness, five millimeters. So squash it down. Um, limited because of that. Uh, to, um, but the dealers all used him because they got the spice in. And you know they got the spice in because it doesn't test up properly because the chemicals either react with everything or don't react with anything. Um, I just interviewed Lee Davies, four-hour interview on the True Crime podcast. Mm. He was getting paid. He was a guard. He was getting paid £500 per package he brought in. Oh, I it's saw that. It was a good interview. And we've got part two coming yeah. up. Look yeah. out for that on coming up soon, yeah. I suppose he said that the usual package contained tiny little uh, mobile phones, those thumb ones, yeah. you know, butt-sized. <laughs> <laughs> butt-sized. <laughs> uh, they've got very tiny buttons on them. Oh, they? I thought you said butt-size. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Oh, right, you did. But yeah, yeah. incidentally, they also have very tiny hard little... to see buttons to press the number out. Oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, they make them just for that. They're not made because they're novelty phones that are small. They are designed torpedoes. To go up the um, in the, the sandbox there, string, <laughs> uh, mm. uh, and there'd, there'd be some. Uh, there'd be light and dark in there, but not much light. The cocaine would is not a big thing. It just it wouldn't. <laughs> it doesn't really make prison, does it? It doesn't. Never makes prison. It's mm. like um, I don't know, throwing a, a potted plant out of a, a multi-story building. And wondering what actually hits the ground yeah. after it bounces off the wall 17 times. <laughs> Nothing but a bit of dust. <laughs> um, it would have been, whoever got it in would have taxed it. And then I saw somebody very enthusiastically taking an old, um, um, with the inhalers that asthmatics have, and manufacturing a quick crack pipe out of it. Uh, 
And I said, uh, well, call him Warren. Warren, you, you don't seriously think you're going to get anything out of this? Well, uh, I, and really, you know, bubbling over with enthusiasm before utter, utter disappointment took followed. So there's not a lot of that in it, but there's um, uh, always a bit of heroin in there, usually pretty low quality. Well, it certainly ends up that way. Um, but if, what, he got 500 per parcel? He said he, his starting salary was £18,000. Mm. And then they had, came at him with a sob story about his uh, prisoner's Dad, I think, was in hospital, and I, can't, I need a phone to speak to him. 500 quid if you bring it in for me. All oh, right. And that was the cover story, and then that's how it began. Oh, he did it for altruistic purposes. Of course. Mm. It's always for somebody's yeah. help. Like and then they earlier. headed over him, no doubt, <laughs> did they? <laughs> they what? They headed over him after that. Oh, well, once it started, there was no stopping it. And then the oh, rival right. gang found out later on. Oh, oh right. So then he's bringing gang, it in right. for Liverpool, bringing it in for Manchester, and on and on it goes. How did he get uh, busted? The prisoners started to treat him differently, and the staff started to notice. Yeah. Oh, they're all courteous nice, nice. and pelly. Because yeah. it's us versus them usually, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's their guy. So the staff started to yeah, notice. You know the best person to get to in a prison is? The one you can really trust to keep his mouth shut uh, and do a quite dirty job, not, not, I don't mean just bring some bit of weed in or something, but something more... You know, I want the fucking keys to the kingdom here. Um, will be the hard ass in the place. The the long term guy. I remember twice it's happened to me. The most um, notorious rat prison uh, prison officer in the place who would trash your place, confiscate you for anything, nick you for you know, uh, I don't know, three extra sheets of paper you might have or whatever. <laughs> um, and yet. Um, nine times out of ten, there's some, okay, some of them just plain assholes and that's it. But mm. uh, a lot of them actually, it's a smoke screen. It's kind of, I'm experienced enough and wise enough with prisoners to know that 99% of you are scum and I'm not putting my life and career on the line for just some rat. But once you, if you, if you're cultivating them in a way, um, you, by various means, um, show them the story that you can really keep a secret. I, I was at one once where, uh, uh, I don't know what would you call my official role, <laughs> thief in chief. <laughs> <laughs> I was in charge of the ordering the supplies for the outside cafe, and uh, and when I got the job, the governor threw me the keys to the place. They said, don't let any of those bastards at the cash till. Uh, well, I don't think prisoners come here to eat anyway, do they? <laughs> no. uh, he said, I don't mean them. I mean the people, the other officers. Don't believe anything they said and don't give them credit. So, you know, they got along well. I was allowed to run around at night and I was robbing the kitchen stores from the main supply store a place by the head chef in the kitchen. We had a long list of stuff I could get in town, you know, like black olives, calamata he liked, and some other things. Um, and the water wasn't working in, in my suite. Have I ever shown you the picture of that cell? <laughs> it had an ensuite bathroom in it and uh, drapes and water. Could you email us that picture to put on uh, the screen? Mm, I will. I will. It's, it, it, I did it as a kind of panorama, too. <laughs> um, uh, so I... Anything worth taking, uh, I used to get the head um, cook to say that they were short so it would be ordered in. So none of the food for my cafe actually came out of the cash that went in the till. It all came from the, the prison store. So I had a key made of that. Um, and I'd taken, so I kind of knew what the things looked like. I was taking a shower, and as is my custom, I take them in the dark, especially in prisons. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I saw, I'd finished off and was drying, and I saw a, a hand push a big load of supplies in under the, the bench where the towels used to hang. Oh, hello. I know those A10 tins. <laughs> Peas by the look of it. Um uh, and um, so I put on my dressing gown and, and trotted over there. 
And there was a second big bag coming in, and it was a uniformed arm pushing them under there. Uh, hello, Mr. Smith. Surprised to see you out this late. Oh, scared the life out of me. <laughs> I thought it was one of those bastards. <laughs> who do you mean? My other officers. Who do you think? I said, oh, you've been a bit of late night shopping, some bargains <laughs> to be had. Do you need a hand with that or you'll be right carrying it? Well, we were friends after that. You know, mm. I mean, we were pretty friendly anyway. But he you know, had a family to uh, feed. But it can make for some uncomfortable things. I used to get day leave from this prison. So when I'd come back on Sunday nights, if he was on duty, and he was a senior level up, um, he thought I knew he was on. I didn't, I didn't care whether he was on or not. I mean, everything I used to bury in the garden anyway. That uh, oh, It's uh, so many ways to get things in in that place. People used to leave that open prison at night, go and do robberies of late night betting shops and come back in. <laughs> they had an alibi inside at least. <laughs> so, um, oh, Mr. Smith used to break a leg getting out of his desk to get over to check my bag. Like, Maybe you could have told me you're coming back. I'm not even looking. There's nothing in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Of course there's not. <laughs> so um, there was no bribery necessary in that. But where, um, if you're after something where you re you really can't reach a hurdle, where you need some something left open or for to get away, you won't be able to trust anybody except the bastard. Mm -hmm. And he's the one you ask because if he says no. It's always possible. Uh, he won't rat you out mm. because nobody will believe that a prisoner came to him and asked him <laughs> to do something. That's one. So he'll just keep an eye on you. But I'll bet you in six months he'll be back and say, and uh, what was I supposed to get if I did all of that? <laughs> That's where you play the music and the credits and the curtains <laughs> close because you're out of there. <laughs> um, and it, it it varies place to place. Uh, Pakistan's the most subtle bit of card playing I've ever had because all across the Indian subcontinent, you um, are you are the golden goose. You are the one who provides the money. If it's something to do with your freedom, why would you let the golden goose go? You don't do that. You hand him to somebody else who can have another turn with the golden goose and you sell the golden goose to somebody. It is so difficult to arrange uh, everything. You have to, so many times, Sean, uh, people would come in, Europeans, and I'd say, look, pull up a seat. I can order from the Hyatt if you want. You can have the Marriott if you don't like their pastries. <laughs> Just relax. You're not going anywhere. Everybody gets bail after two years. That's the law. No case ever finishes. You'll see lawyers, <laughs> judges, everybody in here. And why do they have ABC class officially? Because they've got to live somewhere mm -hmm. and they've got to pay their fees. So relax and just watch for a while. And, and you do. And it was the, um, really a struggle. I found it. I mean, and this was a few years after Bangkok. Bangkok was very systemized. It cost this for that, and this for that. There, it was. Imagine going to a um, rug salesman's convention in Tehran or something like that. Who, who, who could you trust, uh, even to ask the question? Um, what were those old diamond dealers used to throw a handkerchief over their hat? Um, they were the uh, Hasidic Jews in New York. Mm. They'd meet um, when they're trading in diamonds, and they'd be shaking hands, but the handshake would be a very long one because uh, a white handkerchief would go over the top. And as they're talking, what, so you're asking uh, 35 for those, tap, tap, tap. And that would mean that's, that's not 35, that's 30. Oh, yeah, no, it couldn't be any more, tap, tap, 20. So an entire conversation would go on the surface, and coded hand signals would take Unclean, place yeah. under the handkerchief Clever. as to watch what the actual deal was. So the competition, their brother, their mother, anybody who was around would think one thing. It's quite hard to do that. You've got to train yourself to let the talking part tell a lot of cobblers and the body part make movements for something else. Though I don't know why I say that because we do it <laughs> in every day of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So, 
Oh, where are we going with this? We're on corruption and uh, bribery. Um, yeah. We've uh, got about 15 minutes left. Um, I'll tell you what I did want to bring up because it's... I know that we record one day and 12 years pass and then... Uh, um, the bribery story is is really like a class, so we can return to that from time to time. Yeah, we've only got 15 minutes That's left. That's true. Yeah. But um, poor uh, Sarah Everard was... Uh, the, her killer will be sentenced today or tomorrow. Mm. But it's tomorrow, Friday, isn't it? Friday, yeah. Big sentences on a Friday. You can do two things in a court on Friday, go home or do the lot. Mm. <laughs> And as they used to Australia, a hamburger with a lot, that's a life sentence. What do you think <laughs> is going to happen to Wayne? What's, uh, what, do you want to tell the viewers what yeah, this case okay. is? Who the, who? Um, Sarah Everhard, um, a young marketing executive, was walking along a street in Clapham, I think it was, um, to see her friend. Uh, she was stopped by a plainclothes police officer who showed a warrant card and then arrested her for... Um, breaking curfew, not curfew, um, the lockdown quarantine rules, ah, and slapped the old bracelets on yet, put handcuffs on her. People passing by didn't think it was that, of course. They thought it was some undercover operation. But because he'd shown the warrant card and talked the talk, was he really a policeman? He was indeed a policeman. He was, he'd clocked off from working at the American embassy earlier in the afternoon where he's on... Uh, what do they call it? Uh, consular protection staff or something like that. Oh, I've seen them. We, pro we, pro we protested outside of that, yeah, once. Did you? Yeah, with Sorry. Miriam Margulies. Oh, what did she get banged up for? <laughs> <laughs> she was banged up, actually. She oh, said well, the strip to... search was like Christmas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Always with a line, I'm sure. She would yeah. be great. We were yeah. actually protesting for um, the Making a Murder guys, mm. Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey that day. Oh, right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, complex case. Mm. Well, anyway, uh, Sarah was um, taken to a, a rental car, driven some distance, um, then put into his personal car. And remember, he's a policeman, so he's kind of aware of what could be picked up and not. I presume the rented car was to some not easily traceable uh, mm. rentee. <clears throat> Um, drove her to um, some bit of property that uh, he owned out down in Kent, uh, raped her, strangled her, and burnt her body in an old refrigerator. Various things uh, made the police turn up there within a week or so just to ask him. I don't know. Um, you'd have to look up the case to know what, tip them in the first place. I think it was something about the CCTV, but I believe it was the rental car that um, was the main thing. He said no, don't know anything about her. Then he told a bunch of lies about being, he was, had his life threatened by some criminal gang and uh, if he didn't come, we'd kidnap some girl off the street. Uh, the old white slavery story. I mean, mm. I heard it once and heard it a million times. <laughs> Actually, it was quite novel in a way. Um, but uh, I think I blame that down to Taken and Taken too. Those mm, movies, great films. Uh, white slavery. You can't, you can't even get regular slavery. Never mind. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you must tell you about Ted Eastwood once. He kidnapped a busload of children, and he got caught because he was down at McDonald's ordering uh, uh, like uh, two, uh, 20 kiddies meals, and he had to come back because he got the wrong flavoured milkshake. Oh, really? I mean, these kids <laughs> had him bust around. The school teacher kicked the door up. Anyway, so, um, so Sarah's dead. Now, this psycho is, is a policeman um, who was, um, was allowed to carry firearms, and here is the, the real issue. These CCTV images have been piece together in the sequence of her going out, her in a shop buying a bottle of wine, him driving past in his car, taken from very slight images sometimes, a passing bus or a, um, a shop, okay, you expect that, a shop security camera. But um, I saw in an interview last night that the interviewer asked a quite pertinent question to um, nobody actually from the police directly were willing to stand up on this one, but he was an old detective who'd been part of the police association. So what is a, 
a woman out alone who gets stopped by a police officer in plain clothes at night who shows a card, a warrant card, which is his ID, um, should she cooperate and go with him, allow herself to be handcuffed? Which would be pretty unusual for a lockdown bridge, wouldn't it? Um, and he was stuck there. The policeman said, oh, no, yes, he... I would advise people to cooperate. But she did, and she's dead. Yes, but hey, that's a very rare event. But it happened. Mm. Okay, but he was a psycho. We missed the warning signs. He somehow slipped through the net. What net? I mean, they're so desperate for people to work. You'd have to be... Look, people join the police force for a steady job, sure. But it's also a job which you could get, you know, spat at, annoyed, betrayed by your superiors. Well, that couldn't be anywhere. Um, <laughs> lots of unpleasant things about it. Mostly the boredom, I would think, of sitting around a lot. Um, so it's going to attract um, uniform freaks, you know, people who like to be play out their fantasy of what police life is like and be able to do it, or, or loners who somehow can't make friends with anybody join an organization like the army or that, and sadly still find they can't make any friends. Um, how would they be detected? But really, um, don't you think that questioner was right? Yeah. How mm -hmm. is uh, uh, particularly a woman? I think in her mind. It's funny, I would have done exactly the same. Well, you, you yeah. would have gone along with it. 100%. Yeah. Really? If I'd seen it, Probably would have I would have stuck my what, nose. I would have risked a nicking rather than let, see that go on. Mm. If he said, you know, bugger off, this is a drug case, I thought, well, yeah, you do what you like in those. <laughs> but if he said he was trying to, you know, put the manacles on her over a lockdown bridge, and they all nick me too because I'm out. Uh, you're, but you're that's where your experience comes into play, isn't station it? Station sergeant will have a good <laughs> laugh over this one when we get in there. I can't wait. The beating up of Nick and Granny's in Australia. Uh, as a hobby or? <laughs> For lockdown breaches. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah the, and this is two women enjoying a coffee who got arrested. Yeah. That is true. Yeah, mm. they did. But that's usually in the countryside, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All of the, I mean, you don't get London police getting tangled up and stuff in a hurry. So what's going to happen to this psycho cop? Well, no, um, viewers will have already known. The argument in court today is mostly um, his lawyers trying to get him uh, a life sentence. He accepts that, but he doesn't want, he doesn't think he should be given an all of life sentence. There is such a thing where um, a person gets sentenced to <clears throat> all his or her life. But really, um, I must say, I've never seen it actually happen where somebody dies in the prison. It does, but not often. Dennis Nielsen, he was an ex-cop. Mm. How long did he get? All life, but he yeah. had lots of bodies. Mm. Oh, right. Into the floorboards. Yeah. 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 I mean, in a way, it's true. Anybody can be a, a lunatic like that. And he did... Uh, uh, do you think he looks like a lunatic? Dennis Nielsen. No, oh, Wayne Cousins. Wayne's. I've not seen oh. what he looks like. Yes, psychopath. Uh, yeah. Um, if I hadn't switched my phone off, I could show you. I... I I've kind of listed a whole lot of psychos. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with me. Uh, psychos in there to try and you know Jay, do a story. If you on go it. in my bag, the, there's a paper. Because the media was shocked when Dennis yeah, Nielsen got arrested. Yeah. Because when they actually saw him for the first time and he showed his face, mm. he just looked like someone you'd pass on the street and not think anything about, like a librarian. He was working at the job centre after the police, actually. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, is that him? Mm hmm Okay, what's your pronouncement Ooh. there? What's... Your, your pronouncement. Would you say... Uh, Let's have a look at him Peyton more. Psychopath? Mm. Or, well, I know what he looks like. Well, I think... It, um, are you able to put... I know you don't want to there, but... Just that uh, smile. Are you able to put a <laughs> little image mm. at the back there? It's, it's the eyes. Back, so we know it's the eyes. And this about. is her, is it? Yes. That is so sad. It is. Oh, yeah, oh, it's more than sad. And uh, her hell. family have said, and I'd go along with that, uh, naturally enough, that their torment is knowing that her last hours were horrible, mm. terrifying, and spent in the company of this complete scumbag. Um, 
he's bashed his head against the wall a couple of times while in custody, but not hard enough. Mm. Must keep, must do better. <laughs> he, uh, <clears throat> he'll end up going to, I'd say, uh, Monster Mansion. He? Little Hay. Little uh, Hay. I think that's... Wakefield is Monster Mansion. Um, You've been told off for calling it that. Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> thing is. Sarah Jane. <laughs> Well, what do you want, really? <laughs> um, you think you're better than them? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> but there are no standards. <laughs> really, uh, There's no standards. <laughs> I, uh, even amongst the, the murderers, there are... Uh, oh, incidentally, I should say that your murderer is a very good... Um, I wouldn't say cellmate, because they always have their own. But... Um, person to spend time with in jail very easy to live with a murderer yeah I yeah a lot six of, them. of them around there's a, there's, a, there's a spectrum of murders but oh yeah some of them are very well behaved crime and passion ones i, I found were the most well behaved the nicest yeah, yeah. They, they have, uh, <laughs> why because you think they have some guilt that's residual they had a whole normal life before they weren't criminals they had a family they had a business come home wife's in bed with the mexican pool cleaner <laughs> and get, grabs yeah. his gun shoots both of them dead Mm. Did actually hear stories it's like that? It's defensible in France. Is what you used to is do. it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it certainly. So, who's your down. favorite serial killer? Am oh, I? favorite serial killer. I I don't know. <laughs> 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 no, I don't think I'm, I'm got a long. We're going to have to wrap it up here, David, because yeah. we've run out of time. Mm. But you know, we, we've okay. we've sent a lot of people over to Lad Bible. Um, what was the experience like with Lad Bible then? And if you've not seen David's Lad Bible yet, we urge you to Google it and find it on YouTube. His Lad Bible. Two, well, there's two parts there is. Having been perhaps slightly hastily critical of them earlier in the show. Well, we'll delete um, that. <laughs> and, okay. that. And that. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's all right. You can leave the second part. Don't get curious. Um, it was actually, it was genuinely good. And I say that with this genuine look on my face. But, but um, it's like a little cozy, very young team in there at uh, what is it, a relay house or someplace you can't get to in a cross town. Um, food's bad though. <laughs> there isn't any. I think it was really do during the middle of some period of time when nappy rash was everywhere. We couldn't get food in. Um, <laughs> they, um, they had a couple of th th very glassy buildings. So every time a, um, a siren went past, and there seemed to be a lot of them at this period of which I'm talking, um, they just stopped recording and then going on. But, um, Liked everybody, uh, they were young, but I, I must admit, I was at fault for you know, when you I think it's always best to have in an audience, um, maybe a bunch of kids or something that uh, you have to kind of explain things, or, or a bunch of Einstein said, if you can't explain some concept to your grandmother, you don't understand it properly. But he was talking about science, but maybe I felt like I was at some dinner party where I could talk really just myself to people I already knew for a long time. So um, it was, uh, rather than an interview, it was just me rabbiting on, which I do David, here, I know. rabbiting on? <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, it was kind of good. I think they're a bit selective, though, I can say now. Oh, yes. I'm back in we the only game. send them the best. <laughs> Twelve no, they, they times were... he's been on the podcast. Yeah, <laughs> I think, um, I hope that this one makes up for number 11, which was... Uh, I, uh, wasn't He's a perfectionist too? No, I, I didn't have my <laughs> breakfast entirely <laughs> that day in the snack on the, on the motorway. So we urge you to watch that. Well, I'll put it in the description box, the Lad Bible, uh, part one. I urge you to check out David's other stuff on his channel and subscribe to his channel. Help him grow. If you want to watch episodes one to 11, link will be down there for the slew of them in the description box. As will a link for the organic cotton escape ladders. Really? Handy if you are in <laughs> Thai prison. Lightweight, oh. won't rip the skin off your fingers as you slide down. Is that thing you brought in earlier? Was so, that something uh, yes, organically made? Ooh, uh, look at these. I think I'm so doing something of a gift. Priced. I'm easily oh bought. Premium organic wow. hoodie for you. Let me check Premium the organic hoodies. I love that colour. Put them on a model. We should put these on, shouldn't uh, we? I, I guess so. Yeah. The colour is um, faded denim. Yeah, the Yiddish so, comes out. And I feel the fabric. Huh? Oh, it's so soft, isn't it? It is. In fact, Go on, I, get I must on. say, 
I just want to rub this against my right. hands. <laughs> I like this kind of thing. Oh, brilliant. Um, yeah. Now I'm going to wear it over this uh, sailor's woolen jumper in case the Titanic goes down. <laughs> but, um, aha. Do you need a hand? No. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Getting out of it. <laughs> oh, hang on. Where's the head? Oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> Look at that. Mm. Smart. Isn't that? Um, you get up to all kinds wearing yeah. this. Well, I, I think um, <laughs> as, a, as a pair. Just one of those scooters? Well, wasn't there some tel- kid show on television where the, they had a couple of turnips made up? To the, <laughs> uh, but not necessarily in they blue. They go. That'll keep you warm this winter. Wow, that will. <laughs> and I can do all my shopping in this back pouch here. <laughs> And where, and where can people obtain these, Jen? I, they can obtain them on the website, Which? organiccottonclothing.co.uk. No, link in the like description that, box right? oh, for this yours. video. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll treasure it. No, really, I was a bit dismissive when you said hoodie, but this is <gasps> I noticed you were wearing one in your last one. You had a hoodie Oh, on. I had a gap one on. But yeah, I was we don't want to advertise them. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, please let us know in the comments yeah, what you thought about this video. Cool. Huge thank you to John James coming out, filming mm-hmm. and sound engineering today. Huge thank you to Jen. Please support her company. Links are down there and the trailer's coming up shortly. And most of all, huge thank you to David for coming Down no out. need to thank me, Sean. I, <laughs> it's a warm place out of the wind. And uh, if you're bored enough, you can watch my channel. But you have to be pretty desperate, I'll say that. <laughs> Stay tuned for Jen's trailer. Thanks for watching. Toodaloo. Bye, everyone. <laughs>
uh, twice they've been in touch with me. And we've gone through the procedure. They run out the story. But at the final hurdle, it gets dropped. Um, that is because, of course, um, I went straight into the deep end into heroin when I was young, uh, smuggling there. So um, in the end, that's owned by National Geographic, and that's a family channel. They might have pretensions about being, we give you the hard news and all of that, but they're not. <clears throat> If you want the hard stuff, you come here to Sean's channel. <laughs> now, that's where the reality is. So at the end of podcast <clears throat> five, before we pick up, I do remember where we, we left off, but we also had questions come in. And thank you for everybody out there who has sent questions, who has clicked over to David's channel and subscribed. <clears throat> Again, link in description box. Thank you to everybody who has bought David's books. And David is working on making an audio book. Links to all his books are below this video. Now, the hottest subject on YouTube right now is Epstein. And we had a chat on part five. In the days preceding Epstein's death, he hadn't been suicided quite yet. On the way into the studio today, David and I were having a chat, and David mentioned about the multiple ways that people <coughs> can be suicided in prison. Well, um, people have been imagining... Um, uh, everything, you know, dark spooks walking in at night and uh, tangling him up because it was quite a strong injury, wasn't it? This was Hyoid a, fracture of the... Yes, the yeah. hyoid bone. H-shaped, isn't it? Mm. Well, <clears throat> of course, no doubt that could be done if you uh, were willing to tell a lot of people. But, of course, uh, if you're trying to bring somebody's death, you don't want to. And what has occurred to me, and, and this came to me because I looked at that photograph, the mug shot. Now, uh, Epstein's pictures from his past show a slightly seedy, you know, a guy you wouldn't entirely trust in any way. But nonetheless, he was uh, bright and cheerful. After all, he was a billionaire, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> However, that mug shot really tells the story. If you look at it closely, you can see not just the wear and the lines on his face, but the eyes are dead, really. He was, he realized he was down and out. The, the cozy deals he could fix up to get out of trouble, they just all evaporated, which all came about, I guess, starting with the Me Too movement and that um, bringing up um, old sexual things and making the most of them, you know. With a lot of civil suits. But anyway, <clears throat> the suicide. If I couldn't get to somebody and their death would be not a bad thing, I would wonder whether the Hannibal Lecter technique might work. And that is, for those who ever saw the film, there was somebody in another cell that uh, had offended him in some way. Was it multiple mix of from jizz on oh, Clarice's yes. face? Exactly. Yes, yes. Uh, she got uh, a bit of a skin treatment there that uh, she wasn't expecting. But um, so uh, Hannibal just spoke to him, and by morning he'd killed himself. Now, you ask, could that be done? Well, by chance, uh, uh, in the school I was at, um, there was a kind of idiotic schoolboy bet, I think it was, that we could talk this uh, absolute loser into uh, killing himself. The idea was that he'd throw himself from the school assembly hall, wrapped in the school flag, and um, bounce several times off the pavement. So um, I guess we would have stopped before he, he went right over the edge. Uh, we had business cards printed with his name on it and loser as occupation uh, and gave them out. But then uh, I later thought uh, with the Epstein thing, could circumstances be arranged where um, he would actually take that jump? Now, for those who've just tuned in um, during a, a smuggling career that had really probably not more than four or five major arrests, but of course, there's a lot of jail time in that. And I did pay attention to the jail suicides because I'd thought of that, uh, well, twice anyway, seriously myself. And how determined those people are. 
uh, and how difficult to pick beforehand. Yet with Epstein, he did seem like everything had burnt uh, around him. There was nowhere to go. Um, he Could you uh, arrange that, though? Well, here's, a, here's another source to back up this idea. <clears throat> Here, of course, the man famous for making people do things they don't know they're going to do is Darren Brown. And you might recall one of his programs where he made somebody rob a security van. And he did that by putting the idea, not just putting the idea in his head, but arranging the sets and the things that the guy was looking at to all coincide. Music played in the background that uh, built up his adrenaline. Uh, lots of positive signs uh, came about. The movements of people, lots of very subtle things, and and they extraordinarily work. Um, he does. He, he gets people to um, uh, write down a gift they're going to buy somebody. Uh, he replicated one of the Kennedy brother assassinations, didn't he? And the guy was going to assassinate that famous comedian in this country that's got all those Twitter followers. Then he went off Twitter. What was his name? Stephen Fry. Oh, really? Stephen Fry. Okay. So the guy went to a Stephen Fry concert mm. event and they did the signals. Like, I think there was like a word or some kind of music and there was a girl in the in red in a polka dot dress right. or an umbrella, whatever mm. it was. And the guy jumped up, but he didn't know he had blanks, and he assassinated Stephen Fry. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So he could have been up on a murder charge, and his defense would have been unique, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I they was won't let Sar they won't let Saran, Saran Saran out because he yeah. has no recollection of doing it. So he can't be he, repentant. He's, he's no remorse. No remorse. Uh, no, that's true. But for um, uh, for the Epstein uh, death. It could, if they brought somebody in who was an expert in the field, they could arrange that uh, he would receive letters. The magazines that uh, he'd be reading um, gave the hints. Lots of, uh, if there is enough background feed to it, it could push him in to do it. And also, they'd need to introduce ways that he could do it. The cell, we've all seen the pictures, it's fairly spartan, there's not much in it. But it was uh, a metal bed, wasn't there? Or bunk bed even, I think it was, though he was by himself. Um, to get into that position, um, once when I was thinking of uh, suicides, um, I thought if you did get your head into that position, you could flip yourself backwards. But I'm not very lucky, Sean. I'd end up just, you know, Stephen Hawking. You know. Hello, I've got an American voice. <laughs> um, you know, it just wouldn't work for me, I don't think. The but, one prison guard we interviewed, he found a corpse that had been hung in a leaning forward position. Yeah. And the person had just leant into it and choked to death. And the corpse was still in that position when they found it. Uh, there was a suicide in the supermax I was in where the guy had uh, managed to get uh, enough grip with um, a bed sheet uh, on a window frame. and But he nonetheless took the trouble to um, have something around his waist which would secure his feet from getting down. So, I mean, that's determination to do it. We had and another guy on here who said that people committing suicide just by rolling off the bunk. And then, and then what? And just falling. Well, from three feet or something. Can you guys remember what you said specifically? Well, hmm, there goes the twelve foot rule, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, which is what uh, um, who was that famous uh, executioner in the UK? He 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 used to snap the neck every oh, time. Oh yeah, he was quite efficient. And uh, it, it, I think it is about twelve foot, which is coincidentally what a parachute jump is. Right. So don't get tangled in your shoot, <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Um, now, if Epstein had been, um, um, by covert means, given that information about how to do it, that would have been in mind. Because I found that with um, jail suicides, uh, it's the means that are the hurdle. If prisons had a little 
button there that you could press and you no longer have ever have existed. Well, a lot of people would have pressed it. Um, and uh, also for people who have just come in on the show, um, the reason I'm talking about jail suicides is simply the places I've been in uh, Supermax in Australia, um, a couple of very awful prisons in Thailand, and uh, where we'll be going soon into uh, Pakistani jails. Just a, just a, a little question about what you <clears throat> said on Epstein first then, because <clears throat> that is a unique perspective from your own experience and knowledge. And I haven't heard anyone discuss that scenario, and it's made something click in my brain then. Yeah. So you're saying... Epstein was killed possibly by the Hannibal Lecter technique, which is a transmission of words from one person to the other. That's right. We've got there is certainly, even though I'm not in favor of conspiracy theories, he certainly possessed information which would embarrass a lot of people. So there, there's motive there. Well, what if those words were, mm. "We'll kill your brother," "We'll kill your outstanding family members," "We'll kill Ghislaine Maxwell, your right hand woman," unless you. Take your own I life. don't think that would necessarily work. People are fundamentally very selfish. And Even when it comes to siblings and family members. Well, as, as, think uh, those in your own family for whom you would die willingly. Uh, they may well be. I mean, <laughs> there are in mine. Not that they're so great. I'm just, you know, I don't care much. Um, but um that 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 would be an additional um aspect of it i think i think that could be more fuel to the the fire of building this psychological pressure or what if he was just so fearful of the entity that he was exposing that he knew he just had to do that the, the word came down from them to do it or else for example with escobar mm. people knew they couldn't escape his clutches and they knew he was going to capture them some of those people got so scared they just killed themselves that, that's true and and famously in the godfather too uh one of the captains um cuts his wrists in a bath because even though he's under uh secure witness protection by the fbi uh don hagan the lawyer comes in and says uh um look uh, we'll give you the option that they gave the uh, high-ranking uh roman ancient roman elite of killing yourself so um, that message was quite clear. I think there are circumstances which, uh, yes, family threat, uh, which could have been, but I think what would have finished him off psychologically was this void of shame and emptiness that, because he, after all, was rather addicted to his lifestyle, wasn't he? Um, sure, he liked young girls, but there was... That was just part of his control and overarching wealth, kingly, you could say. Now, to have all that swept away, let's imagine a king who's lost his kingdom and he has nothing and he has pretty much years in a dungeon and he was not young. Um, let's just say he would have spent, I don't know, eight to ten years in prison. He would have come out an old man, no doubt ruined by all the civil suits with nothing, and shabbily walking around the streets, uh, ostracized by the people who would no longer want to know him. Because even after his first case, which was 10 years before this case, and he was convicted of stuff, and everybody knew, a lot of people knew what he'd done. Bill Gates, Prince Andrew, all these famous scientists, MIT, all these people still hanging out with him and taking his money, some of them. Oh, that's true, but the way that case was resolved with the fix, the prostitution charge, uh, it was, it gave them the confidence. This is a man who can control what happens around him. And these, uh, um, it's a curious times we live in. That these sex cases are, um, you know, twisting into a, a variety of social memes and 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 swings of the tide of course there's always the mercenary one where people and lawyers encourage litigation and there will be big settlements out but that's been there forever but what we have now uh, I, I've met a lot of uh, 
people, friends now, girls that are uh, you know, middle-aged women who suddenly started uh, highlighting crises from their, their youth, uh, sexual encounters that they now say they never got over. And is this really the case? They seem to deal with it before. But like anybody, you can focus on an event and all of your uh, troubles come to that. Um, we always look for a cause, don't we? And, um, and I, I suppose in, and that's why somebody is rich and famous who dies by an accident, there has to be something to it. Um, those kind of people don't die by accident, there's always a hand. But I think in this case, um, with Epstein, the hand was a subtle one. And it, I would imagine, uh, with the right, uh, almost trivial things, down to images, sounds, uh, um, indirect messages, he would have felt that, and I can speak from my own experience, that utter emptiness where you don't want to see tomorrow. Um, the uh, absolute pointlessness of, of going on and and a kind of a, a fear of that emptiness that pushes you over, which happened to me in Thailand um, when I was there. Um, and I saw the old man who threw himself under a um, sand truck and had his head popped open. That wasn't, you know, and I congratulated him at the time. If you want that story, I think that's in um, podcast two or three, part two or three with David, link below the, the video. Yeah, so and, uh, just to finish off with uh, Epstein, I don't think there'd be any way of proving this because these, these, the, there will never be a, um, a smoking gun found on this one. Um, people will have their theories, but the ones I've heard of are all kind of archaic. 60s conspiracy ideas uh, where um, black hats have snuck in and done something. The, the, the world doesn't take that. Look, we get controlled enough by our phones, by Google, by uh, Facebook. They make our hands move and do things. <laughs> and I'd, I'd like to say, I do have, uh, we're trying to get all different angles on not just the Epstein case, but child sex trafficking and elite pedophile rings. So I have got two more ex-police lined up to interview on that subject. One's gonna be about grooming gangs and the other one is gonna be about how police cover up these elite pedophile investigations. But what we've not had and what I would love to have on the podcast is to get a victim of child sex trafficking or a victim of an elite pedophile ring to come on if that person is brave enough to give give their side of the story and give us uh, you know a, 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 the victim's perspective so we can we can understand you know the tragedy um and and the, and the bravery of the person speaking out behind it as well so going i did uh, by the way i it, that reminded me um there were on sex cases there was a quite well it was a young man a rapist serial rapist that i spoke to and uh, you know, people are always saying, oh, well, you know, they live under a shadow, those people. But I'm curious uh, <laughs> about people, and I really wanted to know why it was uh, that he was doing what he was doing. And uh, he had some ridiculous defense or other. Uh, but after encouraging him to open up, he did tell me that he actually... Uh, quite calmly uh, was turned on by the fear in the girls and that he targeted particular kinds. And um, oddly enough, uh, ever since he described that kind to me, I, I, when, when I pass a, a woman in the street that looks a little bit like the um, uh, generally taller, uh, wears pale clothes, lacy things, um, looks somewhat confused and a little bit fearful. This caught the eye of this young guy. And he, um, there was no real passion. He was 
methodical and cold about how he arranged things uh, so that he could um, generate that fear in them. Uh, and he, <laughs> in his own sick little way, he said, uh, no, Dave, uh, I'll have to stop this now. Um, they're on to me. You know, that's all. It wasn't, um, I've done anything wrong. It was a bit like, no, I'll have to give up stamp collecting because, uh, well, everything's just like printed from the post office now. <laughs> it was kind of dismissive. Uh, and yet, um, he was, it, it's often very hard to get that out of those sort of people. Well, I've watched Louis Thoreau. I think he interviewed pedophiles in Florida or somewhere like that. Did any of them ever open up? And there was there was like some supermax kind of prison they had him in as well. I think he did some there. Um, yeah, I think there was a, like a guy running a home for pedophiles who couldn't find anywhere to live, basically because they. Oh, yeah. So they, he was like helping them, like kind of like get 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 home and get back into society. But then I think Louis, if it was the right one, if it was Louis was the host, they found out that the guy running the home had a history as well of, course. of this. Mm. And yeah, they were they were opening up a bit. Um, the one where they were in the prison, these were like the ones that just they didn't believe they could ever be reformed, and they were talking yeah. about like chemically castrating them and all this kind mm. of stuff. So I've been asked; it's come in over the years. A few people have said, "Would you have a paedophile on the podcast?" And I've always said no. But if Louis Thoreau has done it, and everyone loves Louis Thoreau, um, my my. If my dilemma got somebody is somebody who uh, is willing to actually be uh, a little honest. Then... My dilemma is I'd want to kill the person. <laughs> yes, but there's so many to kill, and we have such little time. <laughs> uh, where do you start? If the person was sat right there, yeah, I know, I know. I mean, would that, they get that, out of the studio alive? That's the question. Uh, um, kitty fiddlers that were in Thailand that uh, I came across. You know, I thought, well, this would be really easy to arrange, you know, some accident. <laughs> uh, it, people were very accident prone in there. There's an epidemic uh, of them out there, isn't there? Uh, in Thailand. Oh, yes. That's yeah. uh, it's that in the Philippines. That's a stronghold but, for them. Uh, Gary was, Glitter. <laughs> yes. I was reminded in the supermax, we were sitting around in one of those concrete and glass day rooms staring at the television, six of us. And there was various kind of nutcases there. And I forget the guy's name he was from the former Yugoslavia we ended up watching a bit of some Saturday evening kiddie talent show yeah. and um, there were kids in there ranging from I don't know what five to 16 or something like that and uh, one of the guys said of the 16 year old oh you know she'll grow up all right that one <laughs> translated as she's perfectly fine as she is. Um, and this old guy said, uh, uh, yeah, I'd fuck all of them. <laughs> now, uh, oh. he, um, I saw then that, oh. you know, this whole world of bestiality that is just waiting for the opportunity. Oh, incidentally, that guy had walked into his bank manager's office and said he wanted a loan to I'll go to Rome. Oh, yes, that's nice, uh, said the manager. Um, and what holiday is it? No, I'm going to see the Pope. Really? That can't be easy. No, but when I see him, I kill him. So the loan application had several stumbling blocks <laughs> um, uh, over which uh, the applicant uh, really didn't help himself by stabbing the manager and that's how he came to be in the supermax but nonetheless you had you had something that uh, was coming to mind somewhere well else. yeah i mean people have asked would i interview a pedophile louis thoreau's interviewed pedophiles i have found it fascinating but if a person starts to describe the acts you get that visceral reaction where you just want to strangle them i imagine if wild man was in here the person would definitely get killed so it's something i'm gonna i'm gonna actually put this out as a separate clip on youtube Mm. to hear what the YouTube subscribers want. Because everything that's happened on this channel has been thanks to you subscribers sending in your thoughts and questions and comments. If you absolutely re do not want me to interview a paedophile, I will not do it. If you think that that should be done from a, a criminological perspective, 
then I'll consider it. I'm not saying I'm going to do it. I'll, cons I'll, I'll start to consider it because there's a lot of um, possible blowback that could come from that. And James, if you want to timestamp where we are on this, because I'll, I'll take all this out as one big clip as well. Um, 26 minutes, 26 minutes in. Okay, great. Before we go over, back over to your story, David. Mm. So I was, I had my breakfast and then I'm reading Unforgiven Destiny. Yes. And I've gone way past where we were at now in part five. In part five, we finished. You had your passport with the passport photo and they had scotched taped your photo, the exact same photo from the passport. Eight by 10 color glossy. Do you want to give a summary of where, of where you are? Well, just to, in 60 seconds, uh, set the mood, uh, young David's not young smuggler anymore. He's done over a decade in an Australian prison, got out, been followed by a bunch of police, fled to Thailand thinking, I'll pick up some money and uh, go to Europe. Three days later in Thailand, I get arrested because of DA connections uh, that were entangled with one of the Golden Triangle's biggies. <clears throat> I faced death row in Thailand, but two weeks before the sentence is given, I escape. I end up in Pakistan and Baluchistan, where I have an old friend there, uh, Lord Nurjan Maxi of uh, the Maxi clan. And he shelters me there for a while. I return to Europe. I restore my fortunes by lots of mischief in Scandinavia and Colombia. And um, was I bored? I don't know. Um, but I'd uh, cultivated a, a very hard to catch girl who knew nothing of my past, Eloise. And um, she was so timid, you know, charming, of course, but she could know nothing of my past. Yet I was called back to um, Pakistan by his lordship, who was in jail over another massacre or so. Uh, he was, had political connections, and his cousin had been kidnapped and ended up over the border in Afghanistan. Well, uh, <laughs> It's a long story, but you can watch the earlier episode on that one. But by posing as a, a dealer in stolen antiquities, the uh, Taliban were just coming back in the world, but it was between about five sets of government there. Iftikhar, the cousin, was given back, and that was it. I was returning to the UK, to my little muse house down in Chelsea. Uh, I fondly look at it now and wonder if the residents of it ever found that 2,000 pounds stuck behind <laughs> the, uh, it's behind one of those things, you know, the little stash things mm. you get. When all is well, but I'm nervous. I've got a perfectly good passport, but um, I even get my local friends to escort me to the airport. And when I'm there, Lahore Airport's got a peculiar, or had a peculiar mix of international domestic uh, passengers going together. But I'm international, and there's one person who's got an interest in me. Uh, and I know it's there, and I find myself talking to two um, immigration and customs guys who then produce this picture to which you referred, and it's me. Now, there's one thing you don't want in this world is to find yourself in a fairly ruthless country, in an airport where people get taken away, never to be seen again, and having some official wave around a fifth generation photocopy of your passport photo. I was a bit speechless, and I'm not normally so, it was so undeniably uh, me. Uh, I think one of them was a little, one of the officers was um, warming up to some bribery there because he was saying, well, it's a similarity. <laughs> uh, yeah, 
hey, you, you're my guy. You know, they, <laughs> they stand forward, these people. You know, somebody wants to be bought off, you know, <laughs> he, he, that's his greeting card. He, <laughs> he, he sprinkles a seed of doubt over the most plain <laughs> allegation that there might be. Um, and uh, it was a kind of odd passport because it just had the one entry stamp into it. A British passport it was, and genuine at that. So this bears investigation. I've got my friends outside. One of them even works for the immigration department. Surely they'll be there. They were going to wait for me, Sean. They promised. <laughs> yes, they dropped me off at the airport and said, don't worry, David, we'll <laughs> stay here till your flight takes off. <laughs> Any trouble? I said, well, that, that's what I arranged. You said you'd bring somebody out here. Yeah, yeah, here's our man. I get taken out in the front. What is it? It's a ghost town. <laughs> On instinct, there's nobody in the most crowded place. They've just, they, I, I bet you they even saw me in the company of uh, policemen and thought, uh, yeah, well, uh, we'll let him sort that one out. So um, then I get um, led away. Now, why is this so extraordinary? It's because, as one of the officers said, we just, it never happens. Even fleeing dictators don't have their picture stuck up there. Somebody's gone to a lot of trouble uh, to know that you're here. Uh, and to, to because it, it wasn't even an inquiry from there. It was from Karachi, not Lahore. Uh, um, is there any way around it? This is not a place where you ask what the charges are and, and then um, ask for a lawyer. It, it doesn't go any way that way. Uh, if you start asking for a lawyer, all you're doing is inviting somebody in to feed, <laughs> feed at the well, you know, to, to take some more money off you and, and throw you back into the pit. So I was flown to Karachi, and even that's unusual. Somebody was bankrolling this little mission. I don't know what it is that's at issue, but... Uh, one of the guys said, well, it's something to do with the National Narcotics Police. Mm. Okay, that, you know what, I'm thinking Thailand. Okay, this has come back to bite me on the bum again. No, I'll deal with that. <clears throat> I get there into Karachi. I'm left in a room for a little bit in the narcotics office. And then... I'm already working on the plan. This shouldn't be too difficult, jurisdiction, all of that. But two Gora come in. Gora's uh, sort of slang Urdu for a white man. Uh, and one of them was a familiar face. A little older than when I'd seen him last. But it was my old chum, Bill Shankman. Now he, viewers, um, was a young... DEA agent who was in on the bureau when it first started. He was in uh, ex-Vietnam, low-ranking soldier, went over to that. And they had some uh, disasters uh, and wasn't welcome everywhere. And he, for some reason, became, well, I wouldn't say obsessed maybe, but it was a hobby. Destroy Macmillan, as you can, and when the opportunity comes up, because he was there for the Thailand arrest, which was in very unusual circumstances too. So uh, he walked in and uh, now you could expect the villain, I'll make him the villain of the piece to have some good lines, but they don't. I mean, what does that policeman who's been chasing you all these years, uh, what does he say? Uh, well, he said, you're in trouble now, Macmillan. You won't find this country so easy to get out of. Hmm. Okay, and that was about it. He was with the young guy and just, I suppose, what, breeding the next generation of pests to, uh, <laughs> I, know what I, mean. I, I, I did say to the, um, uh, the Pakistani narcotics guy, uh, but, you know, you work for the Americans, is it good? You know, are they your friends? No, I'm proud to be. No, what am I? Narcotics officer. <laughs> <laughs> All of these people were not really going to be helpful. Bill had come in, he'd done whatever he'd done, and uh, then I was thrown in another uh, pit. And eventually, uh, I was taken to a room and asked, 
What do you know about uh, your last operation went bad? Uh, we got one of your uh, your men, one of your couriers. I'm thinking, well, how, far, how far back does this go? You know, uh, somebody confessed to something from years before? I can't think so. Because I'd more or less retired yet again. And uh, I couldn't think of anybody I knew around the place who, who was working. Um, so I thought, well, I'll take the traditional stand and said, uh, look, really, uh, I'd like to help you, but I have no idea what you're talking about. Ah, he said, well, we've had people like you in before. You're going to have to see the doctor now. Now, there's a sick kind of thing in the world of police brutality where uh, they like to use medical terms as though there's some kind of justification for what they do, or there's a system, or there's some professionalism. I don't know what the hell. I suppose they want to scrape themselves off the floor of being the slime they are. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the only reason this uh, you know, frequent and usually empty threat meant anything was there was a, a, a tea caddy, a kind of old-fashioned tray in this rather jumbled office. And on it, instead of a teapot, was a 24-volt truck battery with some alligator clips. And uh, was that for show? Um, uh, I'm reminded of that scene in Silence of the Lambs where the girl's down in the pit and she looks up and she sees fingernails stuck out there. I'm sure on those alligator clips I saw a bit of flesh hanging off one of them. But put that out of your mind, David, I said to myself, uh, uh, some money's got to talk here. But as you know from my earlier adventures, you have to have the person there at the right time and all of that. The next guy to walk in, he sat down, big, kind of chunky, good looking. You know, he could have been in a, um, an Indian uh, adventure film or something like that. Uh, Ahmed Bush was his name, or Babush, really. Um, he sat down, leaned back, uh, started chewing on some pan, which is a, a little bag of crystals of uh, aromatic spices uh, and betel nut. You can tell it's popular because <clears throat> uh, all around Karachi and the big cities, everything under about spitting range is covered in this sort of brown expectorant <laughs> as it's spat out all over the place. <laughs> anyway, he had a munch on that and he started playing with his cigarette lighter, a Zippo, which had imprinted on it the DEA logo. <clears throat> Things are not going good here. I, I, he, I looked at him, and I could tell from his manner that he was from um, what would be an upper-class uh, Karachiite family. Now, that doesn't mean he, he can't be bought, but when you're wealthy, you get to choose whose money you take. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> I later on found out that he took all the hashish smugglers' money, but he drew the line and had nothing to do with uh, opium or heroin or anything like that. Um, well, that make him an honest man, no. But it seems he'd been seconded to, or not seconded, but he, he'd undergone some training with the DEA in Washington. And that's where he met Uncle Bill Shankman down there. <clears throat> so, but I thought, you know, the, the, surely there's got to be some, some, some substance to that. But I, I, I kept up my denials, which... The thing is, if you get arrested in some place that you don't know the rules, watch a few of these things because it'll help, honestly. Firstly, and I didn't know this, you can say what you like in a, a Pakistani police station. You can sign anything they give you to sign. It doesn't make any difference. None of it is admissible in court. Such is their record for uh, torture and duress that... Um, no judge there will even entertain it in the courtroom. Now, of course, yeah, you don't confess to anything which will get anybody in any trouble, but nonetheless, 
you don't have to be fearful of that. Um, but I'm holding out. Now, little do I know that old uh, Ahmed there has been told, uh, and he, he's reading off it, connections with the Russian mafia, uh, one of the families in New York City. Uh, the, yes, sort of, but not in any. Um, <clears throat> all this is getting his back up. Uh, and he said, this means nothing to us here. They have to clean this wall every day. He meant the blood that's all over it. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> you know, uh, oh, just to fill in the blank here, somebody had been arrested at an airport with a couple of kilos of heroin some weeks before, um, but that's about as much as I knew on that score. <clears throat> Now, <laughs> oh, in addition to the uh, truck battery, there are a range of interesting sticks along on, on the wall. And I'd heard stories, none of them pleasant. Um, have you ever found, Sean, that during the course of your life, you've asked yourself questions about something dire and dark and said, I wonder how I could deal with that, or I wonder what, that's really like. Uh, have you? In Sheriff Joe Pyre's jail, second year, when they told me I was facing a maximum 200 year sentence, that was probably the most I was pushed to kind of a suicidal insanity questioning frame of mind. But I was thinking of those things where you ask yourself, uh, you, you're curious about something and then dismiss it by saying, well, of course, I'd never be in that situation. You know, there's people watching this who say, "Well, this is fine. I can click off." Uh, like, could I take a crucifixion? Uh, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't but think I could. They, you're not allowed to drink while you're up there. <laughs> they put a vinegar on a sponge, and you're, you're well wishes. There was there was an author out of Soho that went over and got crucified in South America or Central America, oh. and there was a storm and lightning struck and the cross fell. <laughs> Sebastian. Fox, I think he's Sebastian. Right. A dandy in the underworld is his book. It's absolutely brilliant. He's dead now. I think he owed the yeah, It's a good yeah. title. Right? It sounds yeah. worth reading. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, well, I, I had asked myself, um, what is this about torture? Is it, is it, I know there's something bad about it, and there must be something more about it than just extreme pain and, and being tormented. After all, you hear those stories out of South America where uh, you know, uh, people uh, turn on their own children. They've been. You know, how, how does it work that uh, your mind gets warped and what is its essential evil? Good questions, perhaps. Not ones I wanted answered in, the, in what followed. So um, a, a cretinous guard came in, chained me up uh, by the hand. <clears throat> and some heavy chains, and then, um, oh, Babush kind of matter-of-factly, like arranging his desk, pointed to the table. Oh, and this guard had a gun. He said, don't try anything with this guard. He's an ignorant village guy. he just shoot you. He does it all the time. I tell him off, but he doesn't listen. Um, so uh, shoes come off. Uh, they start with the canes. Now, the the reason of the the beating of the feet is because it doesn't show. Um, the foot doesn't show and it's bruising. So when you uh, and that, the way it works is I found out um, because it's like a jolt of lightning when it hits you. Um, when that stick lands on your tendon, it tugs at all the nerves that get sent straight up the leg uh, and into the, oh, into your middle. Um, uh, and that hurt, but it was kind of like surprise, really. Um, so I started to say something to him and the village idiot started slapping me around the head. Not too hard, but just to make the point, no, you're getting beaten now, that's what happens now. You, you don't say anything at the moment. Yeah. Um, 
so, and he was, he must have been a cricketer, old uh, Ahmed, because his aim for the most part during about 20 blows was pretty much in the right spot, apart from a couple of toes that he got by accident. Um, you know, I'm thinking, uh, and you, oh, you start to scream a bit, by the way. <laughs> um, I'm thinking, okay, don't break anything because it'll take a lot of healing here. But this is a rational thought. Things start to go when it doesn't. I asked him what he wanted, got a couple of slaps, and he, he yelled out the truth. Well, it's a broad statement, isn't it? <laughs> that doesn't get us anywhere. Whack, 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 whack. So when that, uh, he, he paused for a bit and, and then kind of politely said, do you, do you want a cup of tea or something? I'm thinking, all right, I'll try this. Uh, Look, my family has a lot of money, and you, whack, he had a hand like a side of beef, and I'm not big. Um, so when he knocked me, I literally flew off the chair and ended up on the floor. I thought, maybe I came in too quick with the bribery or something. <laughs> like that. I warmed up to it a bit, but he, he'd kind of got his own clipboard, Sean, with a, I'm, I'm going to, this sort of point. And now I'm starting to remember uh, the spycraft rules of um, uh, confessions uh, under torture. You, you put up with as much as you can, then you appear to break down. Um, oh, you give one story that's not to be believed, then you break down and, and give, you know, what supposedly. The spycraft you know, rules of torture, did you say? Yes, yes. Um, and where did you pick those up from? Um, well, Le Carre, who knows what he's talking about uh, to some extent, that's the uh, spy thriller writer, um, but also to uh, a couple of uh, scallywags I met who ended up in, in bad places. So you had pre-programmed yourself if you've ever got into this situation? Yes. Um, I thought, uh, what you, there's no avoiding because they like to do what they do. There's no avoiding a certain amount of damage, but you um, you don't want to lose any vital organs. So you put up with as much as you can um, until you think something's going to be irretrievably damaged. When you say you put up with as much as you can, how do you oh, mentally well, focus? Your, 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 to your do body that? tells you when. Um, you, you've got to get out of this. It, it's um, also, there's a very different thing here, which I'll get to in a minute. When somebody else is inflicting it upon you, it we could probably, under some circumstances, sit here with a pair of pliers and pull one of our own teeth out because there's no anxiety. You can stop, even though it'd be you know, hugely painful. Um, you know, and you hear of those things where people have been trapped somewhere and have to chew through an arm or something to get free. You think, well, how, how could they do that? Uh, you're in control. The, there is no customary anxiety level. But torture is a different thing, and it's to do with timing as well, uh, which I'll come to. Did you have a technique when this guy was hitting you? Like, did you go mentally somewhere else? You can't. You can't. Um, you're just there, there you're, you learn that the part of your brain that does the talking is an independent office. It um, will um, carry out your wishes to some extent, but uh, at an animal level, all, all the true thinking is going on somewhere else. So your um, whatever is essential that you remember, that is in place. Um, but I'd spoken to a couple of people who'd been in Iran and uh, been tortured there. And, you know, the funny thing was they were never quite right after that. Uh, never quite right. But this this was just a warm-up. Um, <clears throat> then when he wasn't getting anywhere um, and I was kind of developing during the break, <laughs> during the intermission, uh, would you like some pound, he said. You know, it's quite nice. Even my wife likes it. You know. uh, yeah, and this is the same guy that was doing this a few seconds ago. Uh, 
Um, and, you know, I'd been told it was lucky he was a professional at what he did. Um, getting nowhere there, then the truck battery comes into play. Now, <clears throat> the thing about uh, pain is that there nothing beats electricity. Ask your pro torture, he'll tell you, Sean, no, you can pull all the fingernails out you like. Uh, when you get that juice flowing, nothing beats that. Okay. Now, I I had by then what I considered to be the highest level of pain I could imagine of a blocked kidney stone. It, that sounds little, but it is extraordinarily painful. You're screaming and all of that. Uh, crawling around the floor, uh, wanting to die. Uh, except, strangely enough, it's your own body doing it to you. So the, there isn't this the, the key timing thing that comes up. Um, okay, uh, there was a little bit of banter between uh, the two of them about where to put the clip. So they started off on uh, toe on one foot, toe on another. And uh, then with the other lead, just a little intro. And that that jolt is very strong. It's got tendrils. It's got fibrous roots, that pain. It, it searches out all, all the places where your stomach and groin, a groin and uh, even your elbows for some reason, and up the back of your spine to your skull. And that was just the, the touch of it. And... Um, uh, then um, he he moved. I mean, you're paying attention at this point. He, he moved the the heavy clip around and, and it kind of caught the end of it on the on the the tip, uh, the nipple of his machine there. Um, and it didn't actually send any electricity through. But I I, I jolted anyway. And uh, oh, that got a big laugh. Oh yes, in in, in torturous mishaps, you know, with uh, the customer. Uh, yeah, look at him. Yeah, we didn't yeah, do it again. Say, no, he's not out. Do it real now. Uh, and then um, I don't know uh, how in, in films they show um, more than a few seconds uh, of that. You sometimes see it. I don't know. I, I can't watch those things anymore. Um, you know, some part of my brain's counting seconds. Uh, no, anyway, I, I won't watch them. Um, and you, you can't breathe, of course. Um, this it's it, it's like uh, like some kind of a thousand fish hooks on fire, uh, uh, drawing at your very insides. Uh, and then um, uh, uh, what do you want? I'm saying I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, something or other, just making conversation so I'll get a bit of a break here. Uh, and so, well, you, uh, you're going to tell me all of the truth. And I'm realizing he doesn't want to have a, a, a Q&A just at this point. He, he's got a bit more to do. Um, so then um, there's a bit of uh, experimentation where to put the clips. Uh, I wouldn't recommend the, the nipples. I mean, I've seen these kinky films where right some himself guy's got a nipple clamp on. What the hell is he thinking? I mean, just with a clamp alone. You certainly don't want to send, like, you know, what is it, 45 amps on a truck battery or more. It's the amperage that counts. It's not the voltage, guys. <laughs> I must confess, there was a time in my life when I did own a vibrating nipple clamps. <laughs> What made me not surprised? <laughs> yes, well, whatever works. It's funny how we go through in phases in our life with these things, you know? What you might have done 20 years ago, you probably... I'm normal now. <laughs> That's normal, not on planet Earth, but that is on Venusia Plus. That mm. So here's where I learnt uh, a bit more about all of that. Uh, okay, I've got... Um, when, when he stops to take a couple of phone calls or something, um, 
he barely listens because they don't really want to know anything terribly much. They're not interested. Um, uh, he says, that's not the truth and, uh, and you know it. Well, I know he's not going to believe that one. So I get um, taken back to the cell and I start to notice even things like a big hanging bar in the, in the middle uh, of the corridor there that's for stringing people up in um, this is a Spanish word for hanging somebody in a, with their arms backwards, isn't it? I forget what it is. Uh, trapezo or something. Anyway, uh, this, is, this is what gets you. It's the waiting for the next session. I was in that cell, and it's a, a suicide-proof cell. There's nothing in it. Um, you, it's a myth you can swallow your tongue. It's a, uh, you, you, need, you need some device. You need something. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Swallow your clothes? I don't, don't know. Didn't have my boots anyway. Um, now, as you can imagine, my ear is stuck to the crack in that cell door. And every s footfall, every scrape, Every person, I'm judging it. Are they slowing down? Are they coming to my door? I hear keys jangling. Is it my door that's going to be opened? Um, because uh, he took me back, uh, had a little bit more, mostly just slapped me around. Um, but he, he was tied up with something else. But I, I knew it would be. You know, we were saying all those things. They say, we'll really get started when you get back again. Um, <laughs> it, I came to have really most of my questions about what torture is uh, and, and what's going on and why it's bad. What is happening is as we, we become who we are by our brain responding to... Uh, the DNA, is, of course, but also our life's experiences, and it wires itself a particular way. This repeated torture sessions utterly rewire that brain. Mm -hmm. I would imagine fate intervened, and things weren't so bad. I had a bit of luck. But I know that um, somebody who, you can imagine the poor Bastards that are, go through uh, daily torture. Think of Pol Pot's regime in Cambodia. They had a, a, a mattress. Uh, it wasn't a mattress, it was a bed frame. And that the whole thing was wired up. And they used to throw water over people and, and charge them. That, they, it, it's worse than killing somebody. A, a torturer is worse than a murderer because what he's doing is rewiring that person's brain creating some hideous deformed creature from within that will never be able to experience or, or see the world in any way again without that distortion of fear. Uh, and it's the timing that particularly does that. Every so, event is loaded. So does describing this then take you to that place? I've had some kind of distance from it, but I know that it's still there. If I hadn't have been saved by uh, a chance uh, intervention, then um, uh, I could have ended up rewired to, uh, I don't know what I've been, it would have been a shuffling wreck, uh, fearful of something, phobic about something. Um, but I know when I sleep, uh, the, the dreams that I have, uh, always some kind of a prison and with extraordinary set decoration I might have you know. uh, very novel um, no what happened was um, uh, a Manchester um, policeman with the embassy was down there on other business and somebody had tipped him off that there was an Englishman being mistreated down in the bowels of the place and um, he well I'll, I'll give them that. I mean, I've never been exactly, 
I've been on the opposite side to police, but I'm not an enemy of people. I don't regard all policemen as, as my uh, natural enemies. Uh, life's not like a simple black and white thing. Everybody plays the, the, the games with their own set of rules. And one of the rules for this guy was that uh, Johnny Foreigner does not mess with the Englishman. So uh, even if anybody's going to do it, we'll do it. But uh, he came down. And old Babush was furious. He was outraged that um, you know, he wasn't able to see through this thing. And he, he'd agreed, uh, the policeman came in to see me. And you know, I was a bit pale, as you can imagine, and a bit shaky. Uh, and he said, well, I heard they were giving you a hard time, but uh, it was just like when you get taken down the back of the police station and punished out. I said, no, 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 no. This is a different game entirely. This is uh, absolutely twisting somebody around. So he said, oh, uh, uh, look, is it, he came back. Is there anything you want to tell him? Oh, I'll tell him something. Will any of it be true? I said, I very much doubt it. <laughs> Only by coincidence. Anyway, he knew it would be a lot of crap. But uh, he went back and, and said to him, oh, he'll, he'll tell you the truth now. And he didn't even care. I told him a taxi driver and, a, and a something or other. I didn't even know who this guy was that was... Uh, um, had been arrested and I still never at that point found out who he was um, only that it was at Lahore airport and we're here in Karachi oh no it was Karachi airport that's right it's interesting that a DEA agent a US cop dropped you in it and then a UK cop got you out I've always got along quite well with UK officials um, embassy staff and um, and um Policemen in, in, you know, when a British travel around the world, it doesn't matter what you do, you're pretty much still an Englishman abroad. You can imagine even people who are great Republicans could sit in a bar in Hong Kong and if uh, locals uh, started insulting the Queen, they'd get upset. That's our Queen to insult. We do the ridiculing of Her Majesty, <laughs> not you, you <laughs> bastard. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, he gets himself in enough trouble. Yeah, lucky guy, isn't he? Whoa, close to it. That's, that ship scraped at the very edge of the dock, didn't it, that one? Anyway, um, so um, apart from a lot of uh, anguish there, I was handed over to some low-level and very terrified um, investigator. And uh, I just said, look, right, what do you want? I couldn't care less. Um, <clears throat> a thieving lawyer was brought in who instantaneously relieved me of 5,000 uh, pounds. <laughs> people later told me, oh, him, yes. Well, he's wearing a new suit, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, he's been dancing around the courts, you know, looking like you've made his whole family there. <laughs> I thought to myself, well, I knew it, but... <sighs> You know, I wasn't in my right senses <laughs> then. Um, I had a lot to learn. I had a lot to learn about the country. Um, okay, I'd, I'd traveled it. I'd been up north. I'd uh, been through the Khyber Pass. I'd been to uh, Faisalabad, Multan, uh, Sialkot, all, all around. And, and I thought I knew something. But if you really want, and you can no doubt testify to this, Sean. If you want to get to the heart of a country and you haven't got much time, throw yourself in one of their prisons. You'll learn an awful lot about how the heartland ticks. And I'm sure you did that when you were in Arizona, didn't you? It's a microcosm and also it's like the underbelly. So from the underbelly, you can understand a larger picture. Yes. Well, um, I uh, I didn't know much about uh, where the prisons worked. I had noticed from the uh, the, the papers um, that something <laughs> meant it was a world of its own. But I, I'd been in Thailand. I knew that um, prisons in poor countries have their own kind of economics and system. But 
<clears throat> I was not quite prepared for Karachi Central Jail. And <clears throat> uh, I did find uh, one thing uh, to my dismay. Um, when I got in there, they'd somehow the story about Thailand had started floating about. Uh, escape from there. So, but the, their more interest was that they thought I had money. Um, so I was put. I didn't know it. Or it was an unseen hand, helping hand here. Uh, I was put in the care of one of the. The whole jail is divided into sections, three classes. Um, C class, just regular poor people. <laughs> sleeping on the floor in overcrowded dormitories with a hole in the floor to take a crap in, eating uh, a few beans off an old newspaper. Um, B class, uh, people, <clears throat> as the law says, an uh, English law, I should add, uh, that if you've got an education, a taxpayer, uh, various other things, uh, you're entitled to a better standard of accommodation and A-class, which is political prisoners. So I ended up in one of the A-class sections. Not that it was particularly much better of one of the political factions. So after that exhausting time with the interrogating police, uh, I found at least I was, these guys were nice to me and they gave me a, a little room which was covered all around with um, uh, some blankets. I thought, well, my life's a ruin again. Um, I'd been rich when I was in Australia. I'd had my own caravan right crossing the world on the old Silk Road. I'd lost all of that, got out of Thailand, built it all up again. I've got a girl in London who knows nothing of what goes on. Uh, no doubt this will destroy me in various ways, uh, but really, at least I'll get a peaceful night's sleep here. No. Door opens. They leave the doors open in these sub-compounds. Ah, Mr. David. Ah. Oh, we've got a friend for you. What? Another Englishman. What do you mean? Your case. He's the man. And you know who lumbered through? The cretinous, broken-down, liver puddle in flat-faced, cauliflower-eared ex-boxer Billy Green. Last seen at a cafe somewhere in uh, South Kensington where I handed him over to some um, Danish guys and he was going to organize couriers. Did he organize? Yeah, he organized himself so he could scoop up the money. Did it work? No. Paralyzed with fear, apparently he melted in front of the just the standard check-in desk. Such a quivering lump of jelly attracted the attention of passers-by, including officials. And when they pointed to his bag, so did he. Which kind of tells a story to your average customs guy. Anyway. <laughs> oh, by the way, uh... What did he do when faced with, he didn't get uh, any of the bad interrogation. He wasn't listed as being down as some hard nut that uh, uh, nobody, nothing had been done to him. Didn't have to. They had to hit him to shut him up. <laughs> Macmillan, you want, that's MC, not MAC. A lot of people get that confused. <laughs> he spilled his guts and added to it. He thought his best defense out of his troubles was to say that I'd uh, uh, threatened him. He owed gambling debts from uh, Manila casinos. I'd forced him into doing drug runs. It goes on and on. Oh, and just to get old Mr. Babush, ex, uh, you know, uh, primed DA headquarters in Washington, my interrogator, just to get him in the mood. Old Billy Green said to him, Oh, if you ever get him, he'll have you killed. Uh, this guy uh, uh, in his country, he'll have you shot like that. People disappear all the time. And yeah, painted a nice picture. Is that why he said as he put on the juice, well, you're in my country now. So when Billy Green walked through that door that night, I wasn't getting that peaceful night's sleep after my exertions. Far from it. 
What did he say? Oh, Jay, that wasn't in the script. None of this. <laughs> you happy your friend's here? <laughs> <laughs> Curtain on Act One. <laughs> Uh, so, well, this isn't going to be so straightforward. <laughs> I've got my own problems. Um, I'm in a, a prison which, just to give you the briefest outline of it, there were people in there for years. If you wanted to go to court, you had to bribe the munchie. He's the guy that writes down the, the list for people. You had to bribe the guard that makes up the, is in charge of the list. To get a court appearance. To, to, to go on your appointed date. And you have to bribe the guards who drive the damn thing. Once you get to the courtroom, you're milling around like idiots all chained up. If you want to go before the judge, you've got to send somebody in to see the clerk of the courts to bribe him to get before the judge. That's the opening act. Yeah, so this is going to be a place that needs careful handling. And I've got drooling, cross-eyed Billy Green saying, Oh, it's just you and me now, Dave. <laughs> yeah, Bill. <laughs> yeah, just is. <laughs> but then, of course, fear started to creep in. When I paid out, ridiculously, another uh, 2,000 pounds. And for your friend? Yeah, I guess so. To go over to B-class accommodation, which meant instead of being on the floor, you had beds and, and servants. Uh, and the servants I'll describe in a minute. But um, I had to take this idiot with me. I mean, he'd already, when, when Jeremy from the embassy came in, said, David, this guy's ratted you out to the max. And he's been asking me, I mean, this is supposed to be a guy from the, the consulate. I mean, he's supposed to be a bit, you know, uh, he's meant to be um, discreet, isn't he, with other people's information. <laughs> Dave, watch him every minute. He's been saying, can I do a deal with the English police? I know so much. Why did, oh, by the way, I didn't tell you, Sean. Oh, yes. You might have recalled from an earlier interview that when I was talking to Billy, I said, all right, Billy, Oh, he changed his name, by the way, to William Power. Will Power, something <laughs> of which he had none. Reminds me of another uh, ex-courier who changed his name to Roland Wynne, with two ends. <laughs> Gambler, of course. <laughs> anyway, um, so I had to drag this idiot around with me uh, to keep an eye on him. But... Um, and uh, also for me, um, when I went over to the very top accommodation, it was a kind of, I wouldn't say it was luxury, it was still cells, but they were never locked. There was a chairman of Pakistan Steel there. There was a couple of uh, spies from various government agencies. Uh, Benazir Bhutto's husband had his own house in the place. So explain who Benazir Bhutto is, was. Um, Asif Zadari is his name. He since became uh, president of Pakistan. This was one of your former neighbors in the prison. Yes. Um, now, in the, uh, I'm just stealing a, a glance at my watch here. To, We've been uh, going for an hour and right. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Because this is uh, <clears throat> really in describing uh, Karachi Central Jail. Uh, which is notorious, which has had celebrities in there, in, in their own terms. Um, and it is, is kind of everything ab uh, about the country that you'd care to know. They often say that Pakistan is owned by 22 families, meaning the old clans. And, and, and Benazir was from one of the, the Bhutos, uh, the Bhutto clan, you could say. I mean, they retain, even though they're you know, many generations wealthy, um, the clan name. And I've said before here, when we were talking about Afghanistan, you know, people assign things to uh, Mujahideen, Taliban, whatever the hell. I've said before that none of that 
it, this is just our Western shorthand for imposing our idea of organization on places we don't know. This tribal clan thing is, is what holds in that part of the world. And uh, <clears throat> it's very much so. And, and, and of course, it extends down to um, the prison. The, the, I think I, I spoke before when I was in Peshawar on the Afghani border getting help from one of the Afridis, the so-called uh, Jews of Pakistan. They, um, they had their own kind of section there. And we must remember, too, that Pakistan, in a sense, doesn't exist. After all, it was drawn up uh, or signed to by a guy that was a lawyer, not even a surveyor, just before Indian independence, with Churchill's explicit plan of thinking to himself, well, <laughs> I'm not going to leave that country to become uh, a serious rival, a world power. I'm going to do what the British always do when leaving something they formerly owned, wreck it. And they divided up sections, made a mess with Kashmir, split Pakistan into East and West. You remember Bangladesh? It was once East Pakistan. <laughs> but what? You know, somebody making a joke couldn't have thought that out. <laughs> yeah, you can have your own country. Guess what? We're going to put part of it in Hawaii. <laughs> you like that? The beaches are nice. Um, it it was it, so <clears throat> that was imposed, and it doesn't doesn't mean anything to the people there. They are uh, in Karachi as part of Sindh province, and they're Sindhi nationalists who want their own country for that part of the world. Um, uh, Sindh was actually stolen, uh, well, I say stolen, finessed, yeah, organized by the British. Well yeah. done. Um, by um, one of our, our famous uh, uh, generals who um, wrote back to the king saying just one word, Pakavi, which for a Latin schoolboy translates as Pakavi means in Latin, I have sinned as in made a bad deal, but I have sinned province. I have mm. taken it. Mm. <laughs> yeah, the elite like to use Latinisms in their little jokes. You know? okay. Anyway, <clears throat> um, so I had to kind of come to understand the jail, who was in it, uh, how it worked. Um, there's distractions there, people are being dragged away and beaten with a titter, which is a, a, a large um, leather um, strap, um, which has lots of things engraved on it. Somebody's lovingly made this thing for the beatings. Um, it looks like a kind of barber's belt. And it says in various languages and scripts, uh, Pashtu uh, and, and some other ones, I love you very much. We will be friends forever, all that sort of thing. So they're being dragged away and beaten. So, oh, Will Power next to me, <laughs> Cacaria la Pantalone, he's shitting himself. Um, and oh, I'm staying with you, Dave. You know, I don't like it around here, uh, which is, is not uncommon for um, people who are, consider themselves, not that he was ever one, but like to think of themselves as villains in, the, in, in their own neck of the woods, seem to fall utterly to pieces when they, they had to absorb some new uh, culture. But I was aided in on all of that, um, or hindered, I'm not sure which, as when I arrived in this new section, which I'd paid a lot for. How are you accessing money at this point? Mm, with great difficulty. Um, firstly, to be robbed by the lawyer, I had to send out, uh, I had to give a message to this crook. Um, you know, I, I thought I still was kind of glowing from uh, the attendances of uh, the electricity, so I, I wasn't being entirely rational. But I gave the code word to the lawyer, which meant this is genuine, uh, which I gave to my uh, longstanding friend and accountant, Max. Hi, Max. 
I know you sent the money and I know you were thinking, what's this idiot done now? But it was bang there within a while. I mean, who would you call for a quick 10 grand? Well, the police arrested all of my co-defendants with me, so I had to call They do my make family. it difficult, don't they? Yeah. yeah. So you end up, end up with family. Yeah. But I've kind of wrung them out. So, um, yeah, that, that's, uh, my brother was good for a while, but you know, he just wasn't quick enough. You've got to be Johnny on the spot with these things. No, that, true, I did end up in a, a hotel in Paris with uh, no ID and no um, credit cards that worked and under a cloud. And um, he did manage to get me a room and carte blanche there once. Um, it, within seconds, I mean. Mm -hmm. So, Simon, thanks for that. Mm. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, uh, then later on, I organized a system for money because I wanted cash. And uh, it's good that they, oh, Jeremy from the embassy, who was um, on the consular staff in the British embassy, um, he uh, he came in. He said, well, who are you going to be? Um, I think you were Australian in Thailand, weren't you, officially? You were British or what? Well, I said, let's go by the numbers. I had two British passports here. I'll, uh, I'll stay with you guys. You've got to... I hear you've got a better commissary. <laughs> <laughs> he said, good. Anyway, um, so he used to uh, see us in court and you could send money there and he'd pass the envelope. Right, okay. And uh, we'd trouser that mm. and go back with it. But it's a bit of a thing. You've got to slip them 500 rupees, about five pounds, uh, when you return to the jail. You know, the, the, the pat-down guard coming back to the jail... Uh, mm. What well, you don't want to have any chit chat? Just give me that money. <laughs> um, I didn't once, and he got all offended, and it cost me like three times as much to get it back after that. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you need cash to um, organize the grocery shopping. Um, the the section that I was in, this B class section, had um, the funny thing about the prisons in places that are their own city state prisons, the guy who does various jobs has got a name, and he usually has the name uh, like uh, Smithy, would be the ironmonger, wouldn't he? Because he's a. Uh, but um, Chandio is a guy, a, a name of somebody that uh, does shopping and. <laughs> And the people who call around Chandio. So we'd give him a list, give him some uh, pocket money. And uh, Pakistan still, uh, uh, though otherwise a miser, did like his food. So he would send him to the Marriott Hotel. and But he made his uh, uh, manservant sleep at the foot of his bed on a mat, um, who was a little guy from up north, a Khan of some kind. Um, the Khans are all kind of a tribe of their own, uh, that lot. What was the actual prison food like? Did they provide anything? I'd rather say I have no idea, my dear. <laughs> um, no, and it was um, uh, very watery lentils. Uh, see, I asked myself once, Sean, having not learnt from my experience in the dungeon with the electricity, what would it be like if you actually had to live on this shit? It, no. Anyway, um, it's a watery dal and very gritty uh, naan bread. Oh, okay. Very thin, chapati. Yeah, right. that's it. Okay. Yeah, don't even think about meat. I forget that. No, I'm not getting it. Um, but Chandio did his shopping, and uh, so he would... Uh, and I would need servants, of course. Really? Yes, uh, Mr. David, you're, um, you get, you have two servants. You have a Badashi and a Dobbywala, who does your laundry. And uh, Badashi kind of did everything. Um, ruined your food, uh, bought the wrong things, got himself into trouble that would you know, be expensive to get him out of. Mine had been in there five years and had one eye missing from 
conversation with the police that didn't turn out to be... Uh, what is the procedure for them to be allocated to a person, a servant? In well, it's a good question because I would have thought there was something even... This is how distant this place was from anything I, I'd normally understand. I found out from them, the two guys, that they had had to bribe the guard to get the job working for me. Now, why is that? Because they came from the C-class pit, from Cheka, which is a five-sided pit. And um, to have a job working for uh, a person of allocated and official class would be good. They could fit, eat well, they'd maybe get a little bit of extra money. Um, they could move around the prison and you know, move things around, do things on the side. All that good stuff for them, but that uh, this fat pig that uh, was in charge of giving out those sort of jobs, uh, he did well. He drove a proper car, I saw from the car park. Um, he uh, he would charge them about ten pounds or something like that for the for the job, and it had nothing. Oh my, we won't even start to talk about merit or, or deserving cases or anything, but it was solely on a kind of waiting list and, and, and the money. Um, and that is, as I said, with the going to court procedure where you have to, to pay for everything in stages, in pieces. Now, you can imagine here too that um, uh, even though some people would be B-class officially or non-officially, like I was. Um, that didn't get you off the hook. You don't just pay once. It, it, it goes on. Some people paid uh, a lot, some a little. The political groups tended uh, not to pay anything very much. Uh, they did, but I, I did a kind of a survey of the place. Um, and I was aided by... Uh, the next morning, when a cloud of um, white tribal dress poured out, covered in gold chains and Rolexes, and it was none other than my friend or John Magsy, who was just passing through between bail applications. Ah, oh, David, <laughs> what would you do? I did nothing. Oh. All right, yeah, I did everything yeah, badly, um, <laughs> and. I thought, well, this is not necessarily good. I kind of like to, to make my own judgments on the, these things. But I, I realized he would, any of Nor John's ideas would be you know, part of one of his schemes and, and, and all of that. Um, and even at that level, this kind of upper level leeches. But in the, the, the group next door was, if I just outline that, uh, I, I mentioned that Asif Zadari, uh, Benazir Bhutto's uh, husband, was uh, inside the jail on remand for charges which included attempts to kill her um, and various other people. Um, how true they were, who knows? Um, but in that kind of that family, they're a bit like the Kennedys in their own way. <laughs> they're always killing each other off when it suits their political purposes. Like Cleopatra? It's her old Ted. He's still alive, isn't he? Mm. You know, they used to, there was a there was a he's what Ted Kennedy's political chances were ruined, weren't they, when he was uh, had to dig himself out of a creek once. Um with the, the secretary, uh, Mary something. Kopechny, that was her name. And the wedding ring was in a matchbox, in the glove box. Yeah. They were in Epstein's black book as well, most of the Kennedys. Mm, that's not a surprise. Do, do you think uh, Epstein was a, um, a collector of useful names and contacts? I suppose he would have been, wouldn't it? Good grief, looking at the black book, it was just a who's who of billionaires, mm. royalty, stuff. Um, TV uh, celebs, actresses, models, Naomi Campbell, to Naomi Campbell, Tony Blair, um, Trump was in there. Um, you know the names that would be interesting too, uh, the names that didn't seem connected with anything. Like, he wouldn't write his gardener's number in there perhaps, but his fixes are probably in there. And you know, if 
if uh, the number might not mean much, but if if the name seems either coded, you know, <laughs> mind you, I suppose a lot of uh, a lot of telephones were thrown in the river uh, when he looked like he was facing the end. I'll, uh, I'll send you a copy of the unredacted black book if you want to have a perusal. Yeah, a couple of names might ring about. Okay. Never know. <laughs> um, I've always, I've got a big bag in my loft of uh, old dress books uh, from people. The Rothschilds were in there. There's George Soros, his nephew was in there. Some big family names. Mm. Yeah. What do you think of George? George. Well, when I was a kid and I was getting into the stock market, I started following his career back then, and I've read his books as well over the years. Okay. So. Uh, where do you think he's is more intuitive than uh, what's that? Um, Warren Buffett. Uh, he's not a, a kind of independent player like that. When he sold short the British pound, do you remember that? And he made he filed one of the highest incomes ever filed in the history of the world. Mm. I don't know if he made a billion off it or hundreds of millions or whatever. But back then, when I you know greed was is good was my motto. I admired him, but now I see the dark side of it all because i was only a kid then when i first found out about him but now i see the dark side of it all it's um well i mean this this the hedge fund trading is not inherently bad after all uh it is a form of protection uh and a, and a, uh, it's not as desta destabilizing a, an effect on the markets as some people fear i i think it uh there's bound to be some good things you could say about it. Oh, yeah, I, I'm a short seller as well, which they've often mm. been described as evil. Um, but oh, I don't know. I, they, <laughs> people, you know what? People will think um, anything that works is probably voodoo magic anyway. Yeah. And secondly, something that seems uh, counterintuitive or, or works in reverse. If you're a short uh, seller, they say you're rooting for disaster. <laughs> um, or protecting those who uh, uh, might find themselves subject to it. You know, Adding you liquidity know. to the market is the way. Uh, uh. Um, but we won't win any friends on a. <laughs> yeah, I, I used to see it once worth uh, last time I was stuck there. Um, a whole lot of the um, bankers um, in those years that I was there. The, it was kind of a wave of traders. Uh, the inside trading never stuck. Money laundering, they usually did a deal on. Uh, they were mostly in fear of um, their, their assets being taken away. Uh, you look at the Hatton Garden guys. Okay, what was it really? A, a fancy sort of burglar in a sense, crime-wise. But the 10 million plus uh, confiscation orders uh, the things that really worried them, and that these bankers were certainly um, more terrified by ten and fifteen year uh, penalties. I won't even call them sentences because you can't say <clears throat> I won't pay you the ten million. I'll do the ten years. You still owe the ten million at the end of the ten years. Mm. That's just a, a slap you in the face for not paying on time. Mm. You, you never can own a thing ever again in your life. Um, and I, I noticed too that uh, we had a little school down there for uh, playing card scrabble in the ones worth where um, all the bankers would discuss their cases. And uh, like Uncle Festus, I'd sit back on my pork <laughs> barrel and give him my opinions on juries and, and uh, what you should look for. Um, and uh, I had to say, Though, honestly, guys, I think none of you should say a damn word. You will hang yourselves in there. Firstly, you're getting up and people are thinking, yeah, this is the one who's been profiting off my misfortune. There's no connection, not a truth to it, but that's the way they feel. So very hard to get a sympathetic jury. Imagine yourself as a lawyer and you've got somebody who walks in there with uh, having earned I don't know, eight million a year in bonuses. You'd be thinking, how can I defend this idiot? You've got Dick Cheney, and he's just handed himself hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayers' money for, through Halliburton, was it? Like, yes, something was. like that. Oh, did you see Vice? On? The, Vice, the um, 
movie with Christian Bale playing Dick Cheney. Oh, I'll have to watch that. Oh, it's terrific. I mean, you wouldn't recognize Christian Bale in this thing. It looks very much like my brother for some reason. Um, but uh, it, it's quite a good character study. And, right, I'll uh, talk about that. No, it's a, uh, I don't know, one of these days we should do a little, um, <clears throat> or a roundup of uh, what's good out there in uh, TV land and movies. Yeah, we can always and, discuss that. Uh, and, and books, because uh, that's one of those things that, I mean, I had, you know, it was, I was hard pressed to uh, convince uh, uh, my other half uh, to uh, watch it. She said, what, a vice president of the US? No, it's good, it's good. And uh, it, it was. Oh, did you see? Um, Sasha Baron Cohen in um, uh, The Spy. No. Ah, yeah. I've always thought, you know, that comedians, when they stop being funny, end up as terrific actors. Uh, there's something about their timing, their control of uh, face. Eric Banner, who played uh, Chopper in uh, the early movies and has since become a, a very good actor, um, for lots of things. You get, not always gets good roles, but he is a, a good actor. He was a comedian. I did, I, I gravitate towards darker things to watch, such as the most recent is Untouchable about Harvey Weinstein. Oh, yes, yes, is it, is it worth, I thought it'd be, I think I read a review or something where it just sort of paints him as a obvious lecher. Yeah, it's harrowing because they're speaking to the victims and it's really sad. Oh, it's a doc. Hearing the stories. Documentary. Yeah. And people will ask now about the stock market as we've mentioned it. So I do have a stock market playlist on the YouTube channel. I will now add that to the links in the description box below this video. And one of my most recent, well, I don't know how I'll explain it. It's been months and months since I posted it, but I was recommending selling short Tesla Motors at 340 and it did crash to below 200 but now i think it's back up about 240 250 so could be getting ripe to reshort there cannabis shop um, shares are presently down considerably so they're getting cheap again and bitcoin i think over ten thousand possible reshort on bitcoin there as well really you know there's uh, a friend of mine called me a few months ago uh talking about um yeah, yeah. <laughs> It sounds like Eurythmia or, or, or it's, it's one of the um, cryptocurrencies. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> oh, it can only go up. It's, uh, it's, it's worth an F all at the moment, but that's the point. It's going to go up and all of that. It's a bit uh, uh, pyramidal in effect. Um, he wouldn't be the only one uh, on the phone to his friends saying, and, and the more of us that fall for it, then. Yeah, but it, really, cryptocurrencies, um, I think they've got a past to live down. They don't integrate uh, very seamlessly into the regular banking world. And then that link has always been the difficult area, hasn't it? It was a millennial bubble. It's computer code that's gone more valuable than Blockchain. gold. Yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah. You know, anyone can create computer code. The supply is potentially unlimited. Not the supply of the main ones, but the competition can just increase the supply and bam. You know that over 1% of the world's energy generation is used on um, mining for mm. cryptocurrencies. Mm. Something like a third of the power generation of, in Norway is dedicated to machines grinding away that using the cold climate for uh keeping them cool wow well on your point about your fr you know people when they suddenly start getting excited about investments there's a saying in the stock market when your barber gets excited about an investment it's all going to crash <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a good one i like that yeah yes because by the time he's heard about it the smart money's left <laughs> the, the smart money's selling it to you yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, left a long time ago um, you, know, you ever get um, tempted to go back into that? And not that you'd have time. Do, but... do a little dabble every now and then, but I'm not, I haven't got nowhere near the money that I used to have. So I, I think eventually down the road, I'll get back into it more more solidly. Mm. 
Yeah. No, but you, the idea is to use other people's money. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have you watched Billions? Billions. Yeah, well. that's a um, uh, a season series on with uh, Damien Lewis, isn't he? He's an English actor, but he plays an American uh, kind of, uh, hedge fund trader, and his nemesis is a New York state prosecutor um, or federal prosecutor, perhaps in that district, uh, <clears throat> who um, uh, is always trying to get him. It, it, it's, it's worth the first couple of seasons. Have you watched Ozark? Oh yeah, I love that. Season two of that I thought was as good as Breaking Bad. Yes, I think so. Is season three out yet? Uh, it's being made. It's being made, I okay. don't think it's uh, Can't wait for that. been released. Yeah. Uh, it has been. Um, yeah, so I, I, I should, uh, flag that up to everybody when it starts coming out, but it'll be on, on Netflix anyway. Anyway, uh, having taken that little um, uh, aside for there, we have... Uh, do you want to keep going or do you want to move over to the questions? Um, I'll just uh, spend a few minutes before that on outlining um, where this is going. As I mentioned, um, this is kind of draining me. I'm my early forties. Uh, <clears throat> um, up, down, ruined, back again. Uh, then having that experience in um, uh, when I was uh, when I thought I was going back to be uh, uh, tortured again. I was even unscrewing the. I had a pencil sharpener in my bag, and I was looking at the blade in that. I, I was particularly depressed <laughs> the torture was one thing and just horrible in its own way but <clears throat> i'd also taken into account that here i was again facing uh <clears throat> not only being linked up with this guy's ridiculous uh, smuggling attempt and it wouldn't have mattered if it would <clears throat> excuse me if it was my own but uh, a thing was, again, I was in some strange place, well, unfamiliar to me anyway, where I would have to fight a battle that turned out to be a lot worse than Thailand, more frustrating. Um, I was expensively a B class, and, and I'd, I'd go to court, and I wouldn't wear handcuffs. I could run down the street. This, this was not a battle of um, uh, getting over the wall. Besides which, the wall was full of uh, rangers with rifle from the army, and they were there because the guards couldn't be trusted not to do their own deals to let people in and out. And you know what the deal was that they were most afraid of? Not people leaving there. Uh, they were most afraid of the enemies of the people who were in there getting in there to kill them. <laughs> That's what those, their guns were trained on the outside of the prison wall, not the inside. <laughs> there were people in there living high on the hog, Mehran Bank sprang up, speaking of uh, stock markets and trade. Uh, 250 million US dollars went missing from it. And the guy who ran that built his own house in that jail, had air conditioning, had satellite. His servants, I mean, were I mean, top, he had a manicured lawn. I'd go around there Sundays for lunch with all <laughs> these spooks from the Pakistani, uh, sort of, what do they call it, ISI? Uh, <clears throat> and they'd be speaking perfect English, and um, uh, so the servants, did, we, we spoke that, so the servants didn't hear, though I was picking up some Urdu by then. Um, <clears throat> and, the, uh, oh, the, the guy from the bank, he didn't want to get out because he knew he'd be kidnapped. He used to go to court every day on some fictional kind of appearance paper because he had a little office that he rented in the court and was the only safe place he could see his family without having the risk of them kidnapping him, <laughs> his own family. <laughs> this was an upside down world. Uh, all the servants used to gossip. That's why I, I, I got uh, uh, the ones I did. Um, so this was not a place that I physically couldn't get away with, but there was nothing to it and I had this quivering informer on, on my hands. Willpower. Uh, oh, willpower, yeah. <laughs> and um, 
and on top of that, oh, you ask, though you haven't, uh, what happened to um, Eloise in London? I was London? about to ask that. Yeah, were well, you? Yeah. Um, she didn't hear from me. Disappeared off the face of the earth. Uh, through things I said, managed to work out who my brother was and went to his uh, film company in Soho. Uh, he was civil about it, invited her in to take a seat, got her a coffee. Uh, Eloise, is it? Yes. Look, David is, um, I, I, I spoke to his uh, landlord uh, from the place in Chelsea. He said he was caught with two tons of cocaine in India. Oh! Uh, Simon shook his head. No, I think that story is a bit upside down, but <laughs> it's not like he wouldn't have done it. Um, <laughs> what did he say that you were, that he was? Oh, he said he was a, I can't remember whether he said was a, a troubleshooter or a troublemaker. One of those two things. <laughs> well, a bit of both, a bit of all. Um, you'd be better off, you know, without him. And then when she found out more, she went up, went back home and tore up all the soft toys that she insisted I buy her and some other things I'd given her. Not the jewelry though. They never throw away the jewelry. <laughs> anyway, um, there was a, so was uh, that the end of that? Was the more to come of which Eloise? Oh no, there's always more to come. Okay, <laughs> the love story is not over. <laughs> no, um, hey, yes, you know when, when I was um, putting together uh, Unforgiving Destiny, the book, I signed copies of which I'll. Uh, uh, I'm sending out quite a few, and bear in mind I personalise them. You can get in touch with me. Well, one of the uh, questions my, here is how do we website. get signed copies and how do we get your audio book? Uh, so Dave, DavidMcMillan.net uh, has a contact page, and people. And I like to know a bit about the people, even if it's fake, so that I can personalise what I write in the books to them. That's a nice so, touch. Yeah, um, uh, I can do that. Um, An audio book update. Uh, I've recorded quite a bit of it, but um, some doctors want to cut me open next week. So recovering from that will give me a chance to uh, wince my way through the completion of it. Will your voice be different after this? <laughs> <laughs> no, they want a little sack with, like with uh, balls in it, but not that particular one. It's gallstones from my gallbladder that uh, they'll be taking out. I'd like to be awake for it just to have a look, but I think I'll pass on that one. Gallstones uh, and mm, your gallbladder. Yeah. And they're removing the gallbladder. Oh, they take the whole thing. I've got no use for it. Well, you I, get to keep it at the end. I used to keep those mementos. When I had my tonsils out, they let me take them <laughs> home in a jar. Um, but uh, the, and I, I don't think so. Anyway, you I stopped You could put your gallbladder on eBay as a uh, giveaway. Let's see. Uh... You know what I'm thinking of? A, a T-shirt uh, with, I found all these old travel clothes and it's got sand from various countries. I've been pulling that together. I was thinking a little sealed capsule at the back. And the reason for that is it, it's, it would be pressing against the back of the neck in its tiny way, reminding people uh, of those places and those things. Because the T-shirt says, what I've always said, almost everything is not worth saying to anyone. <laughs> and <clears throat> if they you bear that in mind next time you go to open your big yap, you will realize it's very much true. Why tell somebody something they don't need to know? <laughs> 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 so uh, yes, yes, I'll have time for that. But the, the, the Pakistan saga, as we'll go on at some point, took a lot of very tough resolving. So, Dwayne Dibley, mm. hello, David. I think your story is one of the most interesting on this channel. I've got a question for you. I am reading Hotel K at the moment. I was wondering if you knew of Chapelle Corby or had any stories about Bali. Yeah, Chapelle Corby was an uh, Australian girl. She was arrested. Um, I can't remember whether she was in a group or by herself. I've got a feeling there were others involved. But uh, she was a good self-promoter, and she managed to um, 
take that sort of I'm pathetic, I was in above my head approach. Is this Indonesia where it's the death penalty? Uh, Bali? Yes, yes. yes. Um, and uh, being Australian, uh, it, what goes on there is well known to Australians because they had the Bali Nine, some of whom were actually executed. They have a special execution island they take them to for that purpose. Is that the recent one? No, it was only a few years ago. And that, that came about because the son of one of the co-conspirators contacted the Australian police because he wanted to get his son out of the conspiracy. And then the Australian police contacted the Indonesian police and they all got the death penalty. Yeah, that was a phone call that shouldn't have been made. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I don't know, I sometimes, but I do know with Australian police, they, and this might apply everywhere, if they really don't like the people, um, they will get the locals involved with this a death penalty case, and they, like they did with you. Nature take its course. Yeah, mm -hmm. Robertus mm -hmm. Janusowskas. Janusowskas, yes. Do you I believe remember. that we are probably being lied to about the place we are in? Since um, I've been posting about Epstein and, and I had David Icon and stuff. A lot of questions coming in now that are not related to prison, more in the conspiracy research world. So you might notice this. Yes, I, I remember him asking, and um, he referred to a book, um, which was um, um, something about Here it is. I'll, 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 read you, I'll, read, I'll read you the rest of it. Do you think there's a way to escape the world and go beyond? Have you read any interesting books or heard stories about that? I'm talking about Worlds Beyond the Poles by Amadeo F. Gianna, Gian, Giannini. 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 Um, yes, it, it's a kind of one-off uh, idea about, um, um, you, you could kind of say alternate universes, that sort of thing. Um, uh, and, but the thing is, um, people also bring into this, are there people who know a lot more than they're saying and cover everything up? But really, um, you can't cover up aliens. Um, because the aliens wouldn't come all this way to conveniently drop dead because they never realized that to breathe earth air or something, uh, despite having the technology to get here. Do you think something could be out there that doesn't have the technology to get here? Oh, almost certainly. There's a water world being discovered uh, about twice the mass of earth, 110 uh, light years away, and uh, which is too far for a probe, of course. People often think of sending things out that way, but do you think what it's going to take to slow yourself down slow enough to take a picture? That means half the way there you accelerate, the other half the way you're slowing down. No, they're, they're probably, I think um, the, the universe is teeming with life. The DNA that we have is almost certainly not uh, originally from Earth. Um, and I say that because it, the first living things seem to appear at about 350 million years after the uh, earth cooled down enough to have uh, the water sloshing about. Um, and that's a, rather, a bit too quick for that evolutionary leap. Um, but um, they were eukaryotes, which is kind of the, the simple cell. Uh, we have the unique thing of mitochondria in our cell. It's a bit like, there's one kind of bacteria and another one somehow got into it and, and they work together. The mitochondria make a, a sort of power pack battery out of it. Point is, the odds of that happening are hugely remote. And for two billion years of life on Earth, that never happened. So that probably happens throughout most of the habitable uh, planets in the universe. But um, it, it, well, if you do the maths, then... Um, if there was an intelligent um, off-planet civilization in our galaxy, we'd probably know about that already. They would have had time to send the messages. What about the theory then that we can't comprehend infinity, but over infinity, everything that has happened to create us has happened previously. So we have existed within infinity and this very conversation has happened before. Um, yeah, of course, if you take... Uh, infinite number of things, even 
that there's no reason to suppose that um, the observable universe is all there is. Uh, there's probably lots more beyond that. And the fact that um, it seems to be expanding uh, more quickly than it should, you know, if it was heavy enough, it should be slowing down and then compress back from the Big Bang to a big crunch. But that's not happening. It's actually going out further. So for all we know, there's a lot more that's been going on for a lot longer than the 13 and a half billion years that we age it for. And besides which, there could be other universes around that didn't quite work out. There are seven key formula uh, that matter and nature have that if these measurements weren't exactly right, nothing would have come into existence for more than a brief nanosecond. So sure, there could be, if you say there's an infinite number of possible worlds, there could be a Sean and David having this conversation we're having now and then slightly varying it. But that's not really helpful. The maths is worse. If you mathematically uh, calculate the uh, probabilities of existence, uh, then it's which one day we might have time for. It's almost certain that uh, I, Sean, am part of one of your simulated worlds, simulated lives. And why don't you? Why aren't you admitting that you're living a simulation? Because you've become so bored with these end of simulations as Roman soldier and as the queen of the Nile or whatever you might have been, that when you do a life simulation now, you don't let yourself know until it's over. Don't you find it makes it more exciting? <laughs> and the fact that I'm telling you this now, Sean, is because more things are being revealed to you about your own simulation that's programmed into it, including me saying this to you now. <laughs> That is what mathematics tells us. See, we not only bring you blood, guts, horror, prison gang rapes, beheadings, international drug distribution, we bring you metaphysics, philosophy, Immanuel Kant, eat your heart out. Next question. You should have had a channel. <laughs> Three subs. <laughs> Frosty1002. The thing I am wondering is, do you think this man knew the authorities were onto him and tried to get out, or do you think he shat his pants at the last minute? Um, so I'm a bit lost. Uh, who, who tried to get out? Who is he talking about? I think he's on about willpower. Oh. Um, do you think the man knew the authorities were onto him and tried to get out, or do you think he shat his pants at the last minute? I, yes, I could never quite... Uh, Frosty, you have to be a bit clear about uh, who the many uh, miserable failed characters that I describe. He has uh, added that... some description here. Mm. After watching your videos, I can straight away see a few mistakes and errors that may have raised risk on him. Body language is not relaxed and natural. Oh, yes, yes. When yes. the bag was coming round, he didn't ignore it. He showed interest but let it go while still staring eagerly at the belt. Mm. Attempting to do this at one of the hardest border control airports. Flying in from a drug hotspot, which is known to authorities. Another thing that crossed my mind was what do you think he was burned out to allow others to pass through? And that was all part of the Oh, plan. yes. I was showing, I had a little... One is of my is own, it willpower? No, no. It was one of my own videos about body language. Oh, okay. People show. Okay. And um, I, 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 it's hard to say, but um, I think uh, crapped his dax is, uh, pooed his pants is probably the answer to that one, Frosty. That's usually what it is. Yeah. Okay. Next question is from PG1 Driver 3. When did you realize you were smart enough to act on your thoughts? Mm. Huh. Well, you, you never realize you're smart or dumb in this world. Yeah, uh, you try things and they work or they fail. Um, it's not like this uh, uh, a sudden moment when you decide, oh, I, I, I think what the guy's really doing, the, the person asking that question, you're asking, am I smart enough to uh, get away with things? Well, You'd be doing it by now, so you're probably not. <laughs> Samia Al Havzi Said Mohammed Abu. He's from Australia. <laughs> has asked, David, are you on the methadone program? 
What channel is that on? Hmm? Uh, no, uh, methadone is um, a, a trap for people who um, it's almost impossible to get off. It's easier to get away from heroin than methadone. Uh, yeah, and people have told me that uh, if they uh, to withdraw from methadone, it's uh, like uh, torture, sleep deprivation, and really they drives them insane. Russell Brand's not fond about it. It's mm -hmm. um, is it another industry than the methadone industry? Is that just another shakedown of the tax? Um, it's cheap to make. Going back to the more conspiratorial now, and I do appreciate all the new subscribers who've come in off Epstein and Ike, and appreciate all of the donations as well that have come into the donation links to help the channel and the True Crime Podcast keep going. And those links are all in the description box below the video. So, the grime rap critic, does David know about the secret bunker at Westminster? Oh, no, I tipped you all to this uh, somewhere. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> you do know about it. Uh, no, I was the one who told everybody oh. about it. Mm. Okay, uh, we've already covered this. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it, it was in the last one. Um, he might be asking, have I been in there? No, <laughs> but I'd appreciate anybody who has the time to uh, take a little look around and see if they can see where it opens. Papa Lima Charlie has asked, what happened to the guy in the hospital who got shot in the eye in David's movie? Hmm. He died. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the link to David's movie will be in the description box below this video. It's actually Australian television. What's film. it called again? Uh, the man who got away? The, uh, the, or the one who got the away? The one who got away. The one who got away. Yes. You want to Google it. Um, it's, it's not bad. It, you know, pretty cheaply made. I enjoyed it. Mm. So he's dead? Yes. Craig58352. Cool, Dave. Some more content would be appreciated. Even reading aloud your supermarket receipts will do, mate. Have you ever met or do you know Freddie Foreman? I just love hearing him and what he has done over his career. Staunch C word, and that's worth everything in the rat bags world. So Freddie Foreman, James, he's, he's the one who's still alive that we want to get on the podcast. That I'm reading mm. his book, Underworld, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yes, I've, well, I've started his books good. Uh, Start, I'm only at the beginning. Mm. Yeah, if anyone's out there connected with Freddie Foreman and you can arrange that for us, we would appreciate you getting in touch. Mm. Do you have any That'd thoughts on Freddie? Him. Well, you could ask him how he survived with such good fortune. Okay. <clears throat> if we, I, listen, Sean, I'm, I must away soon. Uh, right, we've got so, one more page. You want me to get over, do it, or do you want to just get going? Uh, I think we might save that one for later. Okay, no problem uh, at all. I'm, we're going to have a traffic we dilemma. We appreciate so. you coming on, man. Give no, us, no, it's good. Yeah, all yeah, right. Yes, yeah. always good to see you. Thank you, man. And, ah, looking forward to part the next one. Mm. So in the next one, um, I'm we'll sorry, be... put your questions for David in the comments below this video. If you've not read David's two books yet, Escape, Unforgiven Destiny, they're in the description box below this video. Please also, David does put content on his own channel. The link is down there. And I'll be doing more of it soon. So uh, um, in October, there'll be some good stuff there. After his operation, there'll be more content coming up. So please subscribe over to David's channel and support him however you can. We appreciate all of your love. Cheers. Okay. Take care. Bye. <laughs> David Macmillan is the guest that has been on this podcast the most. I received constant messages saying, when's David coming back on? You left us hanging last time. People are mesmerized by his Queen's English voice from Australia. And it helps that Sean keeps me locked up in another room. <laughs> uh, those chains are a bit tight, Sean. Thanks for taking them off. And he's back this time minus some body parts. Oh, yes. I am. Um, I usually dispense with some organ that I have no use for. That'll draw the line somewhere. Um, and it was a gallbladder that uh, I was really talked into uh, getting rid of. It wasn't doing anything. But what happens is if you've got gallstones and a piece of it comes off, it can get stuck in a little bile duct, and that causes a lot of agony. What's it all about? Bile is used to digest fats. Now, I'm not a big fat eater, so my only use for bile 
was usually the next morning after a massive bender when you've got nothing left to throw up. So bile comes to the rescue. Horrible green stuff it is. So I'm happy to be rid of it. Did you bring the stones with you so we could do a giveaway at the end of this podcast? Well, they looked like kind of uh, squishy Maltesers. So I'd, I think only the diehard fans would want those. Did you squish them? I'm, it's funny, I thought of that. Um, I did with some kidney stones I had years ago. You know, a lot of people have clicked off by now. <laughs> <laughs> I think they come for this on my channel. <laughs> but um, I really had it in for this kidney stone. It was coral-like, uh, crystalline, and it had a lot to answer for because anything that leaves me crawling around on my hands and knees on the floor wanting to die... That's something I want to have words with after. So I tortured it to death, but, you know, it's a rock. <laughs> <laughs> what satisfaction is there in that? Um, don't get them. Drink a lot of water. My urologist used to say, you need at least one pee a day that's virtually clear. Oh. Not easily done. Mm. If you're not familiar with David yet, this professorial, well-spoken, sparkly-eyed, Gentlemen, is the scum of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's me. Was the first Westerner to escape from death row in Thailand. No easy feat. He's Big got, prisoner it was. He's got two amazing books out. Escape. And now Unforgiving Destiny, which covers escape with a few more things that escape didn't actually say. So Unforgiving Destiny is the one to... Lay your hands on. And, and you know what? I'm doing some special signed copies just before Christmas until it drives me mad where people who let me know a few things about themselves, I can write a few clear words to them inside the book. After meeting, what, 10,000 people over 40 years, it doesn't take too much to get quite a clear picture. And I'd had to be a reasonable judge. If I wasn't, we all got arrested. So in the description box below this video are links to all of David's stuff. Please subscribe to his channel. If you want his books, Christmas presents, please go down there. He's providing signed copies. And most books, crime books, are shoddily written, to be honest. But David, as you can tell by the way he speaks, has the metaphors and similes of Proust. Never have I read such fine prose. Well, um, certainly I'm getting better at making it easy to read. Um, yeah, really what you want in a book is something where it is transparent. You're not aware of the words, just the images appear in your head. And I'm kind of getting there. So um, it, it certainly, I had no advice with my first book and it was a little bit, uh, uh, once you know me, it reads well. But the audio books will be out by the time anybody sees this. So the emphasis and the intonation will kind of tell the story, I hope. If you want to fall asleep listening to David's voice at night, we urge you to get the audio books. And <laughs> David's got about 3,000 subscribers on his channel now. He didn't have hardly any. It's growing fast. He's putting more videos up now. And he's got all these different stories from his smuggling days. But now, coming back to what we're doing here, this is part seven. I don't even think we've got a part. Well, yeah, Wild Man's got a few parts. Um, but with the other guests, we've not... We're, Does he have a gallbladder, though? <laughs> <laughs> I think his gallbladder's about this big. And, and So then. we're at part seven of what you may ask if you've not seen anything with David before. So let me just give you a little summary. At the end of part six... We were in uh, Pakistan. I'd been arrested and thrown into jail there. And his co-defendant, Billy the Boxer, a.k.a. William Power, he called himself in his new Will false Power. Password. Yes. Had squealed. Uh, you know what they used to say? It, uh, policemen cynically say something like, well, it took one slap to get him to talk, but seven to shut him up. <laughs> and uh, Billy Green was uh, a bit like that. And he even uh, amplified the story. Um, somehow to make his own, he, he was caught um, 
running some drugs, a couple of kilos of heroin at uh, Karachi Airport. So the best defense he could think of was to um, say that he was uh, indebted to some Mr. Big and that I was involved with the Russian mafia. I, oddly enough, I met them after him, but still. Um, that he owed money and gambling debts that I, I don't know how far the story went. I had his wife and children tied up in a basement. He just went berserk and it didn't help when um, the head of the narcotics section had me in his own dungeon that old Billy had added, oh, he'll have you killed if you slap him about or anything. Well, he rolled up his sleeves and showed his independence from threats. <laughs> so in the previous six sessions, you've got David in multiple contents getting incarcerated and tortured in some and escaping from others. He's got a woman in London, Eloise. Uh, Eloise, yes, uh, Eloise Morse. Well, that's the name I gave her. Um, but she um, she knew nothing of my activity. She was kind of well-bred girl. I went to a private school, judging from her accent, and um, uh, a little younger than I, so um, there was that. But also she knew absolutely nothing about what I was doing. So at one minute, I'd be on the Afghanistan border, you know, ducking under the suddenly exploding bits of dust around me, and, and then back with her in uh, Blake's Hotel in London, uh, um, trying to dismiss what I've been doing the, the last week. But uh, no, and, and she was, I was infatuated in love, well, you're a man, Sean, what's that mean? You know, exactly. Um, but I, I certainly wanted her, and by the time it was consummated and we were together, um, it was quite a juggling act to perform. And that's kind of where we were last time we spoke. But for people who've walked in from nowhere, I should just outline. Please do. Can I just this, say before you do that, yes. one of the most gripping stories is the shootout in Afghanistan. I don't know if that's part four or part five of his series, but they're all down there in his playlist in the description box below this video. It's the one before last, I think. Part five, then. Yeah, I guess so. Um, and that, I won't go into it again, but it um, was one of those things you walk into not expecting anything, leave the room and come back and decide that everybody's kind of changed their position, which was in Jalalabad just after the, uh, just before the Taliban uh, had come in. Um, it was really the Wild West. Um, it was even hard to find a place where um, you could meet anyone. In fact, the guy had come back to um, purchase. I had to buy back to somebody who'd been kidnapped. Um, they never use that word. Eh? And they say invited to stay. Yes. Uh, if you owe somebody money, uh, especially with the Afridi tribe, they'll invite you around to discuss it and uh, say, well, it's getting dark. You stay the night, <laughs> the next hundred or whatever it takes to get our money back. You know. Um, so um, a couple of bits of uh, uh, mail I've got since then um, was saying, well, I don't see how anybody could survive dealing in that part of the world. But it, it, isn't, so, um, it isn't so threatening as all that. Once you get past the first element, which is you're a Westerner, uh, you must have money or access to it. We'll just keep you and wring out all we can get. If you have to approach such a situation, you really early on have to throw out that the money comes when I get what I came for. The money keeps coming. More money than you've ever seen keeps coming, even if you somewhat exaggerate it all. So um, uh, that's kind of where we were. But I, I, I thought we might try. Uh, now, oh, well, the next big chunk, I suppose, of this story is the huge difficulty of getting out of a prison in Pakistan. And, and the biggest there, Karachi Central Jail, which was infamous for holding 
Well, just about everybody who's been a prime minister or a president of uh, Pakistan has been in there. Um, right down to the absolutely most ruthless street gangs and a completely different approach than Thailand where it's simple in a way. There's a wall or seven and you have to get over them. In the Pakistan jail, there is, uh, and I'm putting up some photos next week on my own channel which will give a couple of aerial shots and you can sort of see how the... The prison, built by the British, of course, um, looks almost serene from there, but surrounding it, just dense uh, urban um, populations there. But that wall is guarded by rangers whose job is to stop people getting in because some of the guests in there are so, so rich and high profile People want them. There was a banker there who didn't want to leave because he knew he'd be kidnapped as soon as he, he went out. So he built himself a house there, had servants, really good Sunday lunches and things like that. Slightly creepy with all those spooks that used to come around. The better their English, the more trouble you're in. That's true. <laughs> I don't know why it seems to work like that. I, I think when you go to some place a bit rough, I mean, did that apply down uh, when you were dealing with uh, Mexicans and across the border from the U.S. Did was there any correlation between if they speak English too well? Did that put you off? Yeah, you would think that they had some relationship with the gringos, and the mm. gringos are the authorities, the DEA, and likely the CIA. to be double crosses. Yeah, so the raw local people were what we would deal with because you could just see you know that they were based there and they spoke yeah and um, uh, yeah i think you're right there is that balance if uh, uh if any of our viewers find themselves uh, adventuring in other countries they should bear that in mind and that used to apply to thailand too there was always some guy who came up in white shorts saying he was uh, he played on the local well, it was a police football team, but a football team. And he'd kind of chat you up as you walked around, but he was a, a local informer, and that was his job was. So um, adequate, but uh, uh, broken English is good. And you don't want to let on that you know the local language too well. That so makes them drop. think you're suspicious. And also, um, you can hear the words, uh, yeah, when we're finished here, we'll leave the body by the side of the road. Um, that's something you want to know in advance, generally. <laughs> but I also thought we could cover um, a few things from this great year that will be passing us by. Um, and um, there's a couple of uh, notes I've got here of things that, uh, especially with sex in prison, this has come up a couple of times. I kind of... <laughs> If I can phrase it, needed you to bounce this off. I, I thought it would be a bit. Uh, I am the guy to bounce sex in prison <laughs> stories off. Um, <laughs> and uh, also, what other things have you know been happening in the year that are of interest? Um, because uh, my own story kind of does go on and on a bit. So, um, well, would you like to do your story first? Uh, I think that might be the, the other way around. Um, okay. Oh, I did want to, there was just, if I can kill off a few of my uh, uh, notes. You've been studying the uh, Epstein story in depth. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that must have really kept you um, researching on all of that. Your Hannibal Lecter method video got like 100,000 views, I think, more than. Uh, most people are very dismissive. They... Um, uh, but it's not easy to uh, kill the usual method, and you know this, to kill, have someone killed in prison. You hire the vicious people who are already in prison and have him killed. If he's in a, a high security or a restricted section, then that becomes more difficult, but you find some nutter that is in there. And, and that's been done, when I was in Australia, that was done a couple of times um, where somebody didn't like somebody else in the supermax facility and they got in touch and and had that done what would it cost to get someone wiped out of the australian supermax um quite cheap really it depends on the personality of the psychopath doing it um 
your average psychopath fee is around only five thousand dollars so there you have it david's been in prisons all over the world five thousand dollars to have someone taken out in australian supermax i think the people who had epstein's non-best interests at heart had more than five thousand dollars i think they must have been if his prince death was, <coughs> prince <coughs> <coughs> don't sweat i don't sweat what do you, you think his allowance <laughs> runs to that his allowance he's still getting an allowance isn't he now andrew um oh yeah i suppose so but he can join the long list of people who groped a teenager or worse and ended well, you up could, uh, you could be part of a sex trafficking organization and not spend your life in prison like a n normal mortal andrew's punishment is they cancelled his birthday party and reduced his allowance very harsh treatment indeed um probably as bad as when uh, prince charles was sent to um wales for a term of his schooling no i remembered a few things going back and b because this was at a time when i was really busy and uh, just as the 80s were starting and before my big troubles um a lot of things were happening that year but i i mentioned i went to lebanon now i met a guy there uh, who was part of the christian Maronite group, as you know, Lebanon's divided up into a lot of, lot of uh, religious factions, but they all get along or used to uh, well enough until civil war broke out. But anyway, he had his big ambition. He looked a bit like Omar Sharif. He wanted to court and marry Nabila Khashoggi. Now, if that name seems familiar, but you can't remember what it was, her dad, Adnan, was a notorious arms dealer. Um, and he had built a, oh, yes, he had a yacht built, which he called Nabila. And that was for her. Uh, Epstein had done some work when he was high in debt collecting. Uh, and, and that was in the 80s at that period of time. And he used to, now, you never know, when somebody says that they, they're working for intelligence agencies, <clears throat> generally that means nothing. It, it might mean they have a conversation with some spook and uh, quite happy to feed them some information. But Epstein, as you would have found out by now, was an, in, was an intensely secretive person. Um, I looked up some of his interviews and they're absolutely empty. Um, He'll show people around that great place he had, the apartment or house, really, it was in New York City, which had, uh, you know, he used to keep eyeballs on display there that he got from London from some medical collection. As you walked into the, um, the apartment, um, there's this huge display of thousands of eyeballs. Um, I think it was something the Welcome Collection in London sold off. Um, but... Uh, he was not somebody who would uh, give away many secrets, so he didn't even drop hints. Of course, that's where the worry was, wasn't it? That when you look at his face just defeated there, was he going to spill? Now, the assumption is that it's the, um, well, we we're calling it the sex trafficking ring, but... Um, I think we could string that word around a lot of people in the 70s and 80s who were wealthy uh, and had uh, entertainments, but clearly they were all on the young side. So, well, um, <laughs> they, uh, the assumption is that it was that group, people up high, that would have wanted him disposed of. Bill Clinton. But there... <laughs> names seem to be coming out of the are you sure this is an anechoic room it seems to be <laughs> reflecting i'm writing a book yeah who no, killed no. epstein yeah prince bet. andrew or bill clinton well research back further because um epstein was getting money that was lost back from uh, people who'd done secret deals over things and khashoggi was one of them the arms dealer and he was involved in the iranian uh con no, it was a contra. Iran contra. Um, yeah. 
a complicated sort of thing that um, it was a way of supplying arms to, was it Nicaraguan? Yeah, fighters? I've just written about this in my new book that's available for Christmas. Clinton, Bush, and CIA conspiracies from the boys on the tracks of Jeffrey Epstein, available worldwide on Amazon. Links are below in the description box. Now, the reason that um, I very peripherally had something to do with um, some of the arms dealers, not to deal in arms, but because they had good connections and very good transport links. Now, I got to my late teens, got too close to something and had a, <clears throat> well, a little warning to keep away from um, that little world where American agencies drift off into doing illegal operations outside of the US. Well, those are the things that come up, presumably there are, you know, you can imagine if an agency is doing black ops, I'm sure they're doing them in their own turf as well. But we come to hear of the foreign ones. That little warning to me was, um, I came back to a loft I had uh, right in the heart of the city. It was just like where warehouses were. Which city? This was in Melbourne. And um, at the time I had um, some flights arranged with uh, Thai marijuana sticks coming through. And the uh, DEA were just setting up. And I didn't know it, but the US was already uh, flying through much harder drugs, heroin from Southeast Asia uh, at the after the end of uh, the Vietnam War. Did you hear that? The US is flying drugs. This is from someone who was on the ground in that area of the world. I didn't think it was a secret. <laughs> well, not any longer. Um, I mean, uh, you know, the secrets come out. Look at uh, Howard Hughes and the Glomar Explorer thing with uh, finding the Russian sub. Anyway, um, and the warning was so frank. I got this. This little loft was my bolt hole. I had it nicely decorated. Nobody knew where it was, I thought. Um, it was a very ordinary door on the outside and opened up into a very cute set of uh, double layered things with sofas and TVs. And I put the key in the door and there was no lock and it swung open. I went in there and within three hours, the place had been transformed back to the warehouse that it began as. I knew that I wasn't hallucinating because the torn wallpaper was there. They took everything, every stick of furniture, all the clothing, uh, ripped down the walls, bits of torn wallpaper, the lamp fittings, it was just the naked light bulb and only one of them. Uh, and I thought to myself, well, I knew they were the Americans, but do I really want to take on people who are willing to go to that much effort to not just have me beaten up or my car blown up or uh, whatever, but to have some kind of thoughtful psychological effect? We will reduce your life to a nothing. You will have nothing if you keep going there. So when I heard the same kind of sets of names connected with um, some of the arms dealers in Khashoggi, I did hear that there was um, a Jewish businessman from New York City who was in charge of collecting the outstanding debts of it all. Now, because those links would have um, really cut through to some well, I, they'd be old, but they all have children. They all have businesses. Things continue on. I mean, you can imagine if somebody's um, a successful lawyer today in the US or a respected person, if their dad or uncle turned out to be you know, deeply uh, admired in um, the darkest of dark dealings, um, and then that company was passed on to him, the tainted goods, and they all had the perfect connections for this. Epstein could not be offed or suicided by some amateur. Um, you know, I, my Sunday afternoon armchair general entertainment is to think how to get somebody out of prison. Um, 
And I usually try and pick the worst case, you know, somebody like, uh, well, it used to be Noriega or old pineapple <laughs> face. But he died, didn't he? So I, I, I had to move on to um, Shorty, how to get Shorty out of prison. You know, he's in some one of those federal prisons, which is near on all underground. It, it's uh, Supermax ADX. Yeah. From Colorado, is it? It is. You're right. That's the exact one. Um, so when the Epstein thing came up, um, I, I've realized that the only people, only group that are kind of generational and, and pass on these skills and have the connection would have been more likely people like that. See, that this the sex link thing is all good uh, in the sense that that's where people's attention is directed. Um, yet uh, I, I think that might be not going back far enough. So... You know, when you're uh, chasing your leads, if you smell anything that goes back even further. I think Kushagi was in the unredacted black book. Did I, I said I was going to send you that. Did I send it? Um, not in my email. I'll, 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 I'll do it uh, tonight then. I should look through it, see if there's any names that yeah. ring a bell. Uh, I think it, you're going to recognize be. a lot of names in there. Mm. Um, and I think, yes, I just... Uh, I'd forgotten too that uh, uh, his former English wife of Khashoggi was um, uh, the cousin of uh, Fayed, Dodi Fayed, wasn't he? I mean, he, and <clears throat> these six degrees of separation between everybody get narrower and narrower at, at, at that uh, top end of it, don't they? You well, that's what's so fascinating it. about the case is, you know, everyone from Bill Clinton to Bill Gates is in there, all the most powerful people. Mm. It's just um, mind-blowing. Never has a... a Savile had some connections. Yeah. Nowhere near the connections of Epstein. No, and um, he was so secretive that uh, he just didn't give anything away. So, <clears throat> in the sense, we're looking at um, uh, who is a suspect in having him killed. Well, you get the phone book and just mark out the ones who are not. Who's got the most uh, to lose? <clears throat> it depends. Uh, um, really, uh, there's two levels of losing um, these days. Well, what are, Kevin Spacey, the actor, uh, fondles a couple of boys and that's it. His career's finished. Um, it takes very little um, for misbehavior. In a and some context. witnesses die in his case recently. <laughs> <clears throat> Accidents happen, Sean. Sure. <laughs> witnesses, uh, witnesses is not a good thing to be, you know. <laughs> Better to be uh, blind and deaf to most things, I think. You know, I see you. Um, I suppose uh, that part of uh, uh, the sexual malpractice kind of led on to another thing. I saw you put up uh, uh, a question of. Uh, do you want a paedophile as... Uh, Should I interview a paedophile, yeah, that clip and, that we did? Yes, and the uh, quick scan kind of told me just about uh, everything is... Uh, everybody's saying kind of no. Um, <clears throat> and I noticed one of them, some kind of stroppy halfwit, uh, I forget his name. You know, I, I try not <laughs> to remember the names of people that I don't like, but... I'm not going to remember the name, which means you're off the hook, Jack. I don't even know who you are. Okay. <laughs> but uh, he had a go at me for um, telling the story. Not only, well, it wasn't the telling the story about all the uh, uh, being in the supermax and or one of the guys in there saying, I'd screw all of these kids in the talent show. You know, he was a weirdo. But um, I suppose for having a, a sense of humor about it. But... There's two things here. <clears throat> it's a, if you go to, um, if you look at an anti-abortion rally and wonder what this slightly peculiar young man is going around holding a, you know, mock a dead fetus around the place, uh, what business is it of his? Or um, those vigilante groups that are hunting down pedophiles. Like, look, sure, I've thrown a few bars of soap on the iron stairs when I've in a prison when a paedophile's descending or even going up. But um, to actually form a group, some people are hiding a repressed 
sexual desire in that, uh, I've always felt. I've got a, um, a doctor coming on, a PhD doctor, Sarah Good, mm -hmm. who's going to talk about all of that. She's yeah. really good. She was in um, a documentary called The Paedophile Next Door. Mm. Well, don't you feel some of the most uh, vocal, um, uh, the most outraged people uh, about various things, um, they are probably that way because of something within themselves, um, uh, kind of hiding it. Not only that, I mean... <sighs> Finger pointers tend to be hiding things. That's what mm. I noticed. Sni people accusing others of snitches or snitches. People, yeah, saw that in prison. Also, really, there's another point for this guy. Um, I make light of a lot of things, and I don't think I would have had any sanity uh, today if I hadn't. But I'm sure this twit uh, and his like uh, never really ended up um, in situations where I have years ago, I was looking for Joey Three. He owed some money around town, and um, I ended up chasing a couple of uh, dead-end leads. He was supposed to be in a drug rehab center, and then he joined the Hare Krishnas. And um, I kept seeing these, by the way, I kept seeing these two girls there at all these sort of centers where you can book yourself in for three months, and they'd... I said to them, weren't you following Reverend Sun Mung Moon or something? He was a, the Moonies, they were called. Uh, they were just joiners, but they gave me some uh, tips to where to find Joey. Well, uh, I ended up at a house, and I'll cut all the middle bit out because uh, it, it's too long, but I ended, there was a four-year-old girl there, and it was clear to me uh, that his story about looking after her uh, was not right. The look on her face wasn't right. There were, I, I helped myself to the house. This guy was annoying me so much. Uh, I, in my mind, I call him Uncle Fester. He, he didn't have the size, but he had the look. If you've been in prison for many years, there's a kind of a, oh, you, sure you can be wrong, but there's a look that triggers something. And I, I looked around the house and there were things about the, the kind of pictures on his, next to his bed there from kids' things and all of that. Mm. And here's the dilemma. What do I do next? Now I was young and um, had no sense of humor much about anything, you know. Um, so... We'll transition a bit. I was trying to find out who, where she really came from, but of course she was withdrawn, and not very talkative. And then he moved. <clears throat> sorry, he moved. And then I kind of lost a little bit. So we'll move to the next scene because I don't want to make a long story of this, just to make the point, where Uncle Fester is behaving himself on the floor. And I had the girl, and I'm saying, look, he won't hurt you. You can hit him if you want. You know, I couldn't find anything that wasn't too heavy for her to hit him with. I ended up with a cleaning brush from the kitchen, you know, <laughs> it was long and plastic. And she wanted to, and she sort of took a couple of little swings. But in my mind, I'm thinking, wait a minute, am I underscoring whatever she's been through? Am I, you know, the, the idea was that she could sort of not get her own back, but feel that she wasn't powerless uh, by giving him a, a couple of kitty wax or something like that before. Um, <clears throat> because I dismissed the idea of harming him in front of her because she'd be traumatized worse. Um, <clears throat> people think this is very cut and dried. It's not. If your interests are in undoing damage that's already been done to a child, you have to think very carefully, not to make it worse. I mean, how many times have we heard the stories about children have been swept into counseling and had magnified something that was properly buried with this nonsense about, oh, it's all got to come out. You've got to relive it to um, deal with it, confront it, 
Like hell you do. We all have things in life that are better, nicely buried in a little hole. Uh, there are parts of uh, when I was tortured that are in a little hole. There are parts of when my uh, wife was killed in a fire uh, that stay neatly locked up. That there's no reason to let those demons out. And that advice came from my hundred-year-old grandmother who'd lived through two wars and knew a thing or two about memories. So the thing with the, the girl kind of worked itself off and my driver had a chat to this idiot, Uncle Fester. The, anyway, when yeah. you first came on the channel, David, we were 98% young lads watching the podcasts. Oh, yeah. I think the biggest was 25 to 35 and then 14 to 25. Since David Icke came on and I started doing regular Epstein videos, we've got about 200,000 plus activists who are a third women, mm. two thirds male, and the biggest age category now is 35 to 45. So I say to those people, David has a dark sense of humor and don't be offended because <laughs> we love his sense of humor. Well, you're going to get a bit of it in a minute because uh, <laughs> um, uh, viewers, um, I've had a disgraceful life, uh, drug trafficking, uh, and part of that has been locked up in lots of jails around the world under different circumstances. How much prison time have you done? Probably um, 20, over 20 years. And uh, a lot of that, um, half, oh yeah, half of that sentence, the rest of it waiting. You know, the authorities, they're quite happy enough to keep you banged up for a few years. And even if you do get off it, it all adds up in their book, you know, it balances. But um, I suppose during that time, I'm looking at a list of uh, 10 sort of sex in prison, um, very brief things. Top 10 sexual positions in prison. Is that what you're talking about? No, that's not on the list, but um, generally it's with one guy at the door watching. <laughs> that's that's the, the common position. But it, I thought, well, let's go back away. I mean, times change. I went, when I knew nothing much about prison, uh, I was locked up on remand in um, a, a jail in Melbourne and um, it was a huge dormitory. And the guys would get all the, uh, these mattresses down from the beds. There was a crappy old black and white TV set, uh, set up on the corner. And I thought they were just laying them out to be comfortable watching the TV, even though it went off at 10 o'clock. Um, and a kind of little tents were made all over there. And my guide to the place said, uh, uh, Dave, you uh, into the gay scene at all? I suddenly read the room in a different way. Um, and, uh, you know, there were lots of drugs around. They didn't drug test people in. And, but they were kind of relaxed. What seems to have happened in um, prison sex over the years, it's got um, more commercialized, you know, the cigarette business, and also um, more connected with violence. But, you know, that stands to reason. You've got prisons full of um, kind of weird people. But I thought um, if, uh, here, I've got, I've, I've got to point out this. When this, David said he was going to, he might offend some people in a moment, he is going to demonstrate these positions. So you can look the other way now. Yeah, um, we need a rubber sheet at this point. <laughs> no. um, it wasn't really that. I thought, okay, what um, people's imagining of, of sex in prison is, um, let me think what they might have seen, Midnight Express, they're kind of idealized. I think he has an affair with some German prisoner when they're kind of oiling each other up or something. What about Shawshank with the... Um the sisters, I can be a friend to you. Oh, yes, that's the other end of it, you know, uh, the, the gang rape thing. But here's a short and pathetic story where uh, I came across, where were they? Um, this pair of idiots that were your average jail idiot in, um, it was in Reading Prison years ago. 
and they'd actually been through some nut houses as well. They ended up um, overpowering the, the the nurse who delivered the medicines, and a male nurse or female? A female nurse. Oh dear. Yeah. Um, she'd knocked her head, and she was a bit dizzy, and she was on the floor. So, um, out of the two of them, this was their opportunity for the sex they were denied. Um, one of them started groping over the top of her, pushing her clothes around. It seems like he'd forgotten where to go. Um, the other one jumped on top of the one who was on top of the nurse, pulled his pants down, and got up him. And that was their day. <laughs> now, this is how messed up is it, it, it can be. Um, we're really not talking about people who have conventional lives at all in that way. Um, so they, <clears throat> you, you can't really um, expect that there's going to be any of this idealized stuff. I mean, I'm sure there must be some prison where you know, two guys have met and it's all wonderful. Perhaps you'd read The Marquis de Sade. Have you read 100 and, what is it, 80 Days of Sodom? Um, yeah, I flipped through it, um, but uh, a bit like the Kama Sutra, I, I, if there's not a plot line going, uh, I didn't know. Um, there was, uh, oh, him. Because yeah. the Marquis de Sade liked to have sex with a prostitute and then get buggered from behind by a man. Ah, at the same time? Yes. Well, that fills every niche in a sense, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, uh. <clears throat> and he wrote his book when he was in the Bastille, the prison. When there was a, um, a one of those prison manipulators I came across somewhere, he was gay, and uh, he told me a story about how he'd uh, held a sharpened toothbrush against some uh, young guy's ear and said, uh, well, it's either your cherry or your eardrum. And he told me, he said, you know, the kid looked around. Okay, but just don't tell anyone. Now, that little thing shows a bit of what's going on as well. There's the um, dominance of one over another. <clears throat> the threat of violence. I don't think he would have actually jabbed him in the ear because he'd come to know his way. Or, I mean, he spent his life in prisons and in institutions. His sex was all inside those places. Uh, he didn't know anything different, but he'd become, in a sense, good at what uh, managing the resources available to him. Um, on the other hand, there were kind of groups that um, came to know each other, and if they had little liaisons and, and set them up, um, a guy that was in for 20 years for... Uh, murdering, well, he was in for murder, but I'll explain that in a minute. <clears throat> he, used, he told me of his little conquest sometimes and uh, how if he was the doorkeeper that is standing at the, the cell door while a couple of guys were going at it. Um, margarine was called starter, by the way. Yeah, you get the picture. That's um, called keeping point in Arizona jail. <laughs> is it? If you're looking at the door for the guards for someone, like usually tattooists and stuff like that. Oh, right. Keeping point. Keep point for me, dog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's got its parallels in bank robberies, I suppose. And um, its strange thing was, this was a tall guy, very mild-mannered, very easy to live with as murderers in prison are. Best people to get along with. <clears throat> If they're still there and not dead, um, they've found a way of getting along with people. Now, as, as uh, pleasant as this guy was, he was my neighbor for a while, um, he, uh, he was a country boy and had uh, hired on young men as farm workers. And uh, he kept them there. But I think the most chilling bit of evidence against him in court was the body parts they'd found in the refrigerator, including the torso 
which he'd take out and have sex with, oh. even though it was headless and legless. Oh. I did ask a couple of technical questions about thawing and, oh. and so on. Oh. Um, and, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, the old claim amongst the gay community, anal sex, yes, all around tightness and three degrees warmer, you know. But I don't know quite how this guy managed to get anything whatsoever uh, out it's of Jeffrey that. It's Jeffrey Dahmer-esque, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Um, is that Jeffrey who? Jeffrey Dahmer, serial killer in America. Yeah. One of his victims, he, he would um, keep the body parts all over the house, eat pieces of them, yeah. had things in his fridge. And one of his victims managed to get to a phone box. I think he was in like his underwear and there was blood all over him. And the, the police um, came and t took him back to Jeffrey. Oh, right. Yeah. Mm. Thought it was a tiff amongst a gay couple. Yeah, see, an assumption there that uh, was wrong, wasn't it? <laughs> mm, definitely. Um, he ended up, Jeffrey Dahmer ended up, I think a guy with a mop in prison beat his brains in. Mm. Um, <sighs> unhappy ending. But then again, uh, there were... Uh, when I mentioned that guy who was a great manipulator, I'd met somebody else who uh, had his little boy in the prison, and they had a, a relationship that was going on for some months. But the kid was uh, transferred to a, a lower security prison, um, and uh, it was a kind of tearful goodbye. But let's not paint this picture too rosy. He, uh, uh, the kid ended up uh, in trouble in this new prison and got sent back. So they were reunited. But did it happen by chance? No. Um, the older gent who uh, in the relationship had arranged for this girlfriend of um, this kid to take him some drugs into prison. And he had also arranged for the tip-off to happen just after uh, the visit was over mm -hmm. and he was going back to the cell. Mm -hmm. So um, no doubt when they were reunited, he probably would have, the older guy would have said, look, you can't trust people in these prisons. That's why lucky you're back with me. Yeah, there, never mind, we'll get over it. So um, you have this strange combination of love affairs in a sense um, but also the criminality and ruthlessness of, of, of willing to do anything. Um, I, I, th I think one of your stories, uh, um, when, when I was here once, um, somebody had mentioned people having a, a Jay Arthur, a, a, a wank in prison. Uh, I don't think anybody knows Jay Arthur anymore. It used to be Jay Arthur Rank, the uh, film producers. It's very English, that one. Um, and so from time to time, I was in a, a, a four-man room once, and people were swapping stories about, you know, it's bad being prison, all you've got is some dirty magazines and, you know, uh, and what can you do? And another guy saying, "Oh, when you all go to sleep, I, you know, knock one off. You know, I've got to keep myself healthy." <laughs> um, and uh, the uh, uh, one of the because some redhead guy said, uh, "No, no, look, the best time." It's just before everybody gets out of bed because it's really quiet before they come around and start opening the doors. And we all kind of just choked on our tea. You know why? Because this guy was always up before we were awake. Now we knew why. Mm. But you know what else I noticed in my mind? Or was it the next day? But when he'd make us tea, he used to get the tea bag and squeeze the extra strong bit out of it for us. Oh. And he... Do you use your left hand, if you don't mind me asking? Oh. Yeah, it feels like somebody else. I said, oh, no, that's the teabag squeezing hand. Uh, Where was he getting his leche from? Um, 
Leche? Milk. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, God, Sean. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hadn't thought of that one. We always did seem to have plenty of it. Uh, he was a heavy comer. Uh, um, so, uh, ooh, yeah, that's true. I'd forgotten about that. Um, <clears throat> I used to be, what shall we call it? Now, I, I've always tried to get um, the best accommodation I can in a prison. So, um, sometimes it goes with certain jobs. And in, in, in one place, I, I was in country Victoria in Australia, and the place was called Ararat. And you could call me the entertainment director because apart from being a cook in the kitchen, I was in control of the video machines, which used to feed this little uh, high-end real estate where everybody had their own rooms and, and all of that. And I'd put the porno films on uh, at, at midnight and just let them run themselves out through the machine. Um, in fact, one of the uh, prison guards used to bring in things until the other prison guards stopped him mm. because... Uh, he said to me, oh, Dave is a bit over the top, some of these. Well, he was already, I mean, he was into uh, you know, Nazi torture books and all sorts of things, so I had no idea what to expect. <laughs> but they were uh, actually kind of more or less pathetic, um, uh, poo-eating, uh, coprophilia um, uh, videos. You know, I think that, that poo is faked. If you have a close look at it, it's... Uh, <laughs> It, it comes out, but to, well, anyway, I, I think it's fate. Um, but the point of the story <laughs> is that uh, amongst the videos that the guard used to bring in was a whole series of the she males. That is, um, uh, let me see if I get this right men in transition to be um, a female. And so they had their own kind of pornography. A few guys used to come up to me and ask, Dave, listen, uh, during the lunch break, can you um, whack that video on? Yeah, sure. Uh, which one? You know, the, um, the, um, the one from... Yeah, I got it already. You don't have to... <laughs> you know, they were hesitating trying to describe it. But those kind of guys were always the heavy gangsters. Uh, so why is that? Don't know. Uh, is there any connection with uh, being a dominating gang leader and um, sexual uncertainty? Or maybe with sexual certainty? Well, my trans know. friend Zena would say that the people who came to her were the biggest, baddest, most homophobic guys. Oh, right. And I did, when I was, I was on like a dictionary spree in prison, I did look up, what was it, you, what did you say, coprophilia? Coprophilia. Scatological. Mm. And, um, I think that's the one, is it, that comes from the fish? There's a fish, and there's tiny little fish that follow it around and eat its poo. Ah, oh, right. Ah, okay. I thought, um, I think that's probably the, the Scotology word, because uh, corporus in Latin is, um, I, th I think that's kind of feces by itself. So, yeah, yeah. scatological probably. I yeah. didn't know there was a fish connection. I thought yeah. you were going to tell me that old story about the prostitute who liked to had clients that used to be enjoy being hit with a mackerel. <laughs> I don't know we could go here forever, but that's um, mild compared to your stories. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll finish on that uh, uh, subject just with uh, a kind of light thing. I, I had a friend in one of the prisons, and his girl, very good-looking girl, she was. She used to come up every uh, weekend to see him. And he was getting out in a couple of weeks. And I said, yeah, not on a visit. I didn't see him getting dressed for it or anything and cleaning himself up. No, Julie's not coming. She won't be, uh, she never comes on the, the week before I get out. Why is that? Mm. Well, she doesn't say, but she'd be getting rid of the boyfriend. How's that? <laughs> well, Julie can't really live without sex. So you know, I know that there's somebody else. But, you know, we're together. Yeah, we're serious. He just gets the, the flick. So the weekend before is the big breakup. Um, a lot of people probably couldn't handle that, I suppose. Realism, but, that, isn't um, it? Mm, but it is. And, and 
though that's sort of you get that one end of the spectrum where it's very casual and then you get other things i knew somebody peter gibb his name was he courted uh, a female prison guard um and she ended up falling in love with him uh arranged their escape was there with a the car the whole thing ended in tears of course <laughs> You know, when they ended up in the countryside, uh, um, staying in inns and places like I mean, come on, people, if you ever are on the run, and we could do a video on that, <laughs> you do not go to some place where there are not many people. You book into a hotel next to the police station. <laughs> and the bigger the hotel, the better. Um, you know, passing any of those, any luck finding that scoundrel? <laughs> no, no, it looks a bit like you, but you know, he's an absolute scumbag. You know? <laughs> oh, good luck, officer. You know? <laughs> um, so, the, and I think she used to have sex with him in the broom cupboard, leading to a change of design of broom cupboards. Um, I did see that the, in Arizona. Where a female guard would usher a guy to get the cleaning supplies and then oh, and, and yeah. then go in with him. There was um that happened in another escape case in New York State, I think it was. Um I forget the name of the town, but a couple of lifers managed to get out um by really a, a six month um cutting and hacking operation. But there was a um prison workshop supervisor involved in that mm. and um she i think she was meant to be there with a car as the manhole in the street came up but she wasn't mm. <clears throat> but it all fell to pieces it was kind of uh clear um i think the 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 brains of the outfit of that one was a guy called david sweet or something but uh one ended up dead and uh the other one was it's probably in some, you know, escape proof here, uh, a prison. I mean, uh, in the U.S., um, and different countries have different attitudes to escape. The U.S. really um, dehumanizes people by putting them in uh, those you know, cells with nothing but steel and whatnot. My experience with when people are kept like that, uh, they do go crazy. Um, whereas in Scandinavia, they don't even make high walls because their attitude is, um, if you make something like that, the only way to escape is by taking hostages. They'd rather people escape. It seemed, um, I mean, the, the reason supposedly that escape such a bad thing or serious thing, I should say, is that, uh, the public are now in danger from these maniacs who are on the loose. Um, well, as you know, most people in prison are not dangerous, um, not terribly much, more of a danger to themselves. So the escapes where uh, people who are a danger to the public are very few. But mm, and people go with the style and the publicity of the times, and um, people like a manhunt, don't they? Very rarely get them in Britain. We had that one guy, didn't we? He was on the run in the north. I think he shot some police. Oh, yeah. I did an interview on Sky uh, over that. They wanted somebody, um, I don't know, to fill in the hours because they were doing a live coverage. So they had me in a, um, a studio with a remote camera. Um, I didn't know whether I was talking to anybody or not, really. It was a bit hard. So, uh, were you cracking James Bond supervillain jokes on that one? Um, at every opportunity, but they really didn't uh, uh, give me much to, uh, you know, uh, what's it like being on the run, they'd say. And I'd think, well, what's it like for him being on the run? He's, uh, it's, it's quite different here, isn't it? it the population's dense and there's, um, you're going to come across people. But it's usually, um, not in his case, I don't think. Didn't they corner him on a road somewhere? And it was a public sighting, I think, that brought him undone. I can't remember. Most people end up making contact with uh, family or friends, uh, and that's kind of 
uh, the end for them. One of your best descriptions, I think, was the Russians who went on the run from the Thai prison. And then how you described the injuries when they were tortured subsequently, when they were recaptured. Oh, yes. Um, we don't, the, the, the Thai prisoners who got out or the Russians from Pakistan. Oh, both. All <laughs> oh, right, yeah. Because the, the Thai, the, these Thai guys had got out, of, they never really got out of the prison. They, they turned themselves in and they were slowly uh, tortured to death over three months. Uh, died of internal bleeding, I'd say, judging from the acoustic. Well, the Russians, you said their bones were like mangled or something. Oh, they were actually the Israelis. Yeah. Israelis. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, they came back. You know, and the worst part about that, Sean, was that I was at a very delicate stage of my own getting out, and I was reliant uh, on the sheer strength of this Viking-like Swede. So when I was at the prison shop or cafe in in Bangkok and I saw these two guys there and you know somebody nearby told me oh they they've been caught after getting out of a Chiang Mai prison and uh, they dragged them down there and broken all their legs with iron bars and thrown rocks on it so they sat all twisted and mangled and I thought this is not going to go down well with my helper for a big escape coming up I'm trying to make light of it. You know, I went back to my office where the cook had finished lunch and <laughs> so they said, uh, Stan, ha! God, yeah, there's a couple of guys you wouldn't believe what happened to them. I mean, what are the odds? You know, they, they got out, but, uh, you know, and we were only talking about that, Stan, weren't we? You know, have a plan for when you get out because they didn't, you know, they uh, tuk tuk drivers had their photo, rough mm. photocopies on, uh, on every every building um, and um, they ran out of money and they were shopped, turned in by uh, the guest house owner who'd been there. I, I suppose they thought they wouldn't be ratted out by the owner of the guest house because he was the one who'd been supplying them with the dope. But a uh, big mistake. You can't assume. I mean, this would apply to places you've been, that just because somebody's got um, a lot to lose if supposedly the authorities knew what they were doing. You've got to know that the authorities do know what they're doing. They're working with them. So there's no protection in thinking that uh, uh, they're not going to hand you over when it, when it suits them. I suppose um, uh, across the, um, that must have been, I'm, I'm presuming from your uh, adventures that if you went across the border into Mexico, the danger of being tangled up with the um, federales and the authorities there um, was much worse than in Arizona, where it'd be pretty unlikely that anybody be working with the authorities. I situated wild man and wild woman down there first. All oh, right, because they were too hot in Arizona, mm. and people said if you put them down there and they behave like they've been behaving in Arizona, the, the Mexicans will kill them. So I go down there and the house I put them in, was, all the windows were completely blown out of it and it, the house had exploded. I thought the Mexicans had killed them. Right. But what actually happened was they'd had a fight. They'd um, stopped for a smoke break. During the fight, they cracked the gas pipe and boom, the whole uh, house exploded. So I had to send somebody else down there to ascertain what had actually happened. A guy who could speak Spanish, um, former like a US military sniper guy. And he came back, told me the full story. So then I go back down there, you know, now they're established down there. And um, what, I'm running like tens of thousands of XE pills through this place now, through Mexico. Wild man has been sold a $10 crack rock that was bunk. He goes, nobody rips me off. Don't go over it's 10 pound or 10,000. I'm like, look, we've got, you know, Hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of XC coming through here. Let's just let it go. He's like, no, just drive me down there. Well, I said, I'll drop you off. I'm not staying around. There was police talking to the guy. Oh, really? Yeah. So I pull in in the SUV, just intending to just keep going. Wild man just jumps out, 
Uses the momentum of jumping out the vehicle. Oh, this hasn't slowed him down any, the fact there's police on this. No, just jumps out, uses the momentum of him jumping out to just smash this guy's head into a lamppost and he just collapses unconscious. I take off, tell Wow Woman, $10 of a crack, he's got to be in in jail right now. He's just, you know, smashed this guy right in front of the police. Mm -hmm. So we're all panicking. We're, we're, you know, what, the the police going to come here? What, should we send some bail money to the jail to get him out? And then he just comes about an hour later, he just comes comes in laughing. <laughs> you know, the police are friends of mine. Why did you just drive off like that? All oh, right. So putting them down there established with mm. these relationships with the authorities. If you're a gringo from the UK mm. and you're throwing around, you know, free drugs to everybody and stuff, then mm. they, they didn't get robbed because they're they're quite ferocious people as well. No, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well it's a, it's a workable balance like that. It worked for me. Yeah, <laughs> because you're, uh, it, it's only really when you find yourself targeted in, in the way you were that um, it's in their interest to make sure the arrest goes through, which uh, I suppose really um, uh, new crooks starting out, you'd think that'd be something they, they should balance, that to, to look at the economics of not just their business, but their opposition, uh, do they appear to be worth investigating? If they detect a, a team following them around, what sort of money and resources is behind that team? Which often enough doesn't, it might not have anything to do with them or if you or I were there back in the day, but um, perhaps uh, we'd been doing second stage business for somebody who was very big. And so the operation behind that was huge. Uh, and you'd feel as months went on that uh, nothing's going wrong. But it isn't going wrong because the huge case is being built. And when they swoop on the, the Mr. Biggs, they're hoping to turn as many people as possible because that's their focus. So there's your position that um, you're being told, well, you testify against him, and that will put the pressure to testify on up the chain. Domino theory. So um, even if you had no ethical position on it, you'd still have to balance out where you might end up. Um, if uh, I notice that people who rat others out have got a very clear two level. One where they'll spill but they're not willing to testify. Uh, and the exceptional ones who will go the whole way. Generally, the ones who go the whole way, I mean, they're looking at witness protection, relocation. Um, they're hoping to get uh, everything, a whole slate wiped clean. Like Takashi 6 9 the rapper. Yeah, uh, he, uh, he, he did that, didn't he? Yeah, he testified against the co-defendants who hadn't took plea bargains. So he's going to go in witness protection with his rap career. Yeah. You know, boy, George said something about his own deal. I never forgave you for that. <laughs> Dress, <laughs> everything else, I thought, you're all right. You've got a bit of style about you. <laughs> a fink is always remembered. You know? <laughs> uh, he's kind of resurfaced. But I had one um, in my very big court case, which went on for six months a very cunning double-crosser got his indemnity against prosecution for anything that he might say. And during the course of his testimony, he had voluntarily admitted to years and years of things he'd done, um, covering all the crimes he'd just about ever committed uh, that might one day come to the surface. So no prosecution could be launched. It was, um, I've got to hand it to that rat, Peter. He, uh, uh, his name's Howard, that's H-O-W-A-R-D, if you're going to cross him. Um, he, he approached it in a very businesslike way um, that, well, if I'm going to be uh, giving testimony, I want it to pay off. And he got himself a good lawyer and was advised accordingly. And, and came out of it very well. He even said to them, um, well, uh, in the pretrial 
uh, stages. Oh, I know they're in prison on remand, but uh, I, I feel under threat. I think their people are after me. I need police protection. And the reason he did that was because he wanted to continue doing his dope business and had the police crews uh, looking after it, unable to stop him dealing for that uh, 18 months or whatever it was. People learn how to play uh, the system. Yeah. Um, it really, that when, of course, we wanted the jury to know that. And, and they, they thought that this guy, we, in the beginning, they thought he'd served a sentence or it was, when it was explained to them that this was the price, uh, he got all these things for his testimony. And they paid no attention to it. They just acquitted on all of the charges where he was involved. So. It's also created the bizarre situation whereby hitmen, Sicarios, people have murdered dozens, if not hundreds, of people, like Popeye, who was one of Pablo Escobar's most prolific hitmen. They're out. They're doing tours. They've got books. Yeah. Because they yeah. cooperate against the boss or someone really high up. It is a funny thing, though, isn't it? I mean, to murder uh, dozens of people and to be out is a funny mm. thing. Yeah. Uh, the, killing people is really crossing a line because I can understand somebody killing somebody else in in rage or um you know in vengeance for something that was done to their family or somebody very close but uh to make that part of your business plan um it's a kind of complete change in in the whole outlook of, of everything um but uh so I think that um, covers most of the trivia. I did, was. Did you see the interview we did with John A. Leet? Gambino oh, yeah, so Hitman bits of it. Yeah. In well, he was one that came to mind when you uh, mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, clearly he's on the rubber chicken circuit doing some tours and things like that. Um, it, it, it seemed quite uh, amiable. But it shows you, too. Very, very clearly that the the structure of the mafia's uh, long reach and long memory and willingness to um, pass on uh, their vengeance in a generational way. That is, if uh, you if you crossed uh, Carlo Gambino in 1978 and appeared now, um, there'd be still Gambino connected people um, that would do something about it just doesn't seem to happen. I think a lot of that's kind of a, a, a bit of a myth that, and, and very useful publicity that um, within your organization, if you double cross us, somebody down, even if I'm dead or, or jailed for 17 lifetimes, somebody amongst us will get you. Of course you want people to believe that. But um, the, the bigger crooks, um, I've always found um, their bits of retribution, violence, and killing are often for personal and, and quite often silly reasons. I knew uh, old Ralph years ago, a uh, nice guy, friendly sort of bank robber. Um, he came back with the, the girlfriend he had at the time, who was the wife uh, of a uh, big crook around town turned on the light switch at home, having come back from a Chinese restaurant, put the light switch on, it didn't go on, even though there was a kind of a, a light in another room and hit a second hallway light switch. That didn't go on, but there's lights kind of silhouetting him. Now, I would have been, <laughs> I would have been straight out back where I came or sideways, but Ooh. Ralph thought, I haven't got any real enemies. All my business is straight. I haven't double-crossed anybody. But he was screwing the wife of somebody who didn't like it. Um, and that was what, uh, never found the body. We, we looked. Mm -hmm. But um, in fact, um, I stopped in the Philippines to ask one of the people who was involved uh, to just make his parents a bit happier uh, by finding the body. Uh, but he, he, he wouldn't cooperate, but he was an uncooperative sort of fellow. In fact, his lack of cooperation led to somebody shooting him in a lift in Sydney some years later. He had a friend called Two Tonys. He was a Bonanno crime family bomber. 
and he was dispatched one day. Um, Joe Bonanno, his lieutenant was Charlie Bats Battaglia, who I like the nicknames. Who'd, good. who'd like left corpses from coast to coast, taught two Tonys all the burial methods, never got caught. But the hairdresser was bopping. This is how two Tonys described it. The, the, the hairdresser was bopping Charlie Bats Battaglia's wife. So two Tonys was dispatched to bomb the wig salon in Tucson, which he subsequently did, but when nobody was there. All right. But yeah, a lot of it is to do with personal beefs. Mm. Yeah, it seemed to be. Um, the 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 people who had reputations of, in the Melbourne scene in the seventies, virtually all of their um, uh, murders that came up later, they were just personal stuff. And often um, preying on the the weakest, or or, or and they tell a different story in prison. Oh no, uh, she, she was an informer. She was working with it, oh, yeah, some rubbish like that. But I already knew how how untough some of these guys were. On that video you put up of mine, that Sammy Cooper story, <laughs> in it's has him trying to open a safe that he can't, and uh, involved in it. I. Our paths crossed in prison when, when Sammy was there. And every Saturday, his sister, and she was a tough cookie herself, the sister. She was, a, you know, one of the few girls in the crook game that you could rely on to have that car engine running. And um, uh, um, I should talk about her at some other time. But poor old Sammy he used to get his little parcel of, uh, what was it, a uh, bit of hash, some uh, heroin, a uh, load of pills. It'd go in the uh, in the suitcase in there, in the internal one, uh, the body stash. And every week, I'd I'd see him staggering around the afternoon with a black eye or something, and he'd been kind of ambushed. Um, and somebody say, so I, I said to Sammy, "Look, well, you got to visit? Yes, you sit. Yes, okay. This time, as soon as you leave." the visit garden, as it was then, you come straight through. Don't talk to anyone. I know you like to be a good guy, and I know you want to get going on it as soon as you can, uh, but don't talk to anyone. Come straight to my cell. You can sort yourself out in here, you know, rewrap anything you want, and you'll be fine. Nobody, they'll be too embarrassed to come around. Um, and I'm thinking of all sorts of, you know, jail low life that uh, are likely to do anything. Um, so Sammy gets back, fine, comes in. I let him in. I leave the door. And I just had the place painted. I mean, I didn't want anybody <laughs> messing around in there. Uh, Sammy's getting himself worked. There's a knock at the door. What is it? Uh, I said, piss off. Uh, go see Sammy later on. Nobody's coming in here. Uh, it was the the most desperate sounding tone in the voice was some of the high end gangsters, and they were the most sort of embarrassed. They, oh, Dave is Sam in there. I, yeah, John, John, is that you? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, look, uh, then suddenly trying to be casual about it. Look, um, tell him. Oh, look, I'll just pop in a minute. Uh, nobody's popping in a minute, and then Sam's weakening. I mean, you do somebody a favor, you get the punishment you deserve, right? Sam said, no, no, let him in. And then somebody else, no, let him in, he's okay. I said, Sam, what did you talk to on the way up here? I just, nobody, I just asked, you know, Ernie for works. I said, what, you asked the guy to go and bring you a syringe and a needle and all the other, a spoon or whatever, on your way into my cell? Well, this whole conversation, though this little bit of it took nine seconds, there's another three people in the room mm. at this stage, and there's a party atmosphere. It's like that scene in an old, uh, was it the Marx Brothers, where one of them's got the smallest so-called stateroom cabin on the ship. It's a, about the size of a wardrobe, and everybody ends into it. And uh, I think in the, in the film, the door gives way, and then they all fall out. And that's the gag. But it wasn't far off this, because the... The chief of the building, the prison section we were in, had been after me for a while. And uh, he kicked the door in. 
<laughs> because there've been so many people pouring into this room. And it's not a good scene because Sammy's over there in the corner and there's bags of dope everywhere. Uh, and the door's kicked in and this chief has marched into the room and said, got you at last. Well, not quite. In the rush of all these mixture of high and low lights pouring out the door, um, there was the opportunity to, uh, Sammy scooped up the set of works, he wasn't losing those, and said, well, uh, I'll see you later, David. Well, I only had a chance to grab the dope uh, because I knew Sammy would get attacked again as soon as he went out, which he was, but he didn't have it. Um, and then I had to deal with that. I sort of got out of it, but, I mean, it was such a rush out the door. It was like there was bits of tissue blown by the draft of them getting out in a hurry, <laughs> floating to the ground. <laughs> so he did have the decency to come back on some pretext and uh, palmed it. And and the guards who were sent in had no interest in, mm. in finding it either, mm. you know, uh, because the chief was home. You get in there and strip that place to the ground and all of that. And they looked at me like, as if we give a <laughs> shit, you know. And one said, that it's gone. No, I just walked out with that guy. So. Um, it was uh, another, I mean, this was Sammy Cooper's life. That was just a blinking of a moment in, in, a, in a series. I, I, I might keep that up sometime. And for other Sammy stories, click over to David's channel. Link is in the description box. And if you've got any <clears throat> Sammy's in your life, and a few people have told me uh, since then of, um, you know, I, mean, I, I said in one part of it, there should be statues around town to them because they're survivors. Ooh. I think everybody does know somebody who sails close to the wind or worse, and yet somehow uh, seems to, um, for everyone you have to sadly bury, there's somehow, there's always one that just pops back to life. And, and you've got to admire them, you know. Sometimes back in the old days, I'd... <clears throat> um, uh, Sammy had, had come to me with some incredible story about um, <clears throat> why he had to have a, a thousand or the whole thing was going to fall to bits. And I'd say, Sammy, you've got 10 minutes on this one. Go for it. <laughs> and he'd give me such an elaborate story, you know, and my mind's bouncing from... And why was the radiator detached from the wall? You know, and, and, what do you mean she was dressed as a man? The stories were so extraordinary. You'd hand over that money and say, Sam, don't pay me. But you, I've just, I, you've just earned it with well, that, that story. You know, it was really good. Um, and in fact, uh, I suppose out of memorable people, there's that and the very rare... Um, you know, quality villain that um, you come across. Um, and there's only been a few. I mean, I know people like to say somebody was from the old school, um, but um, often there's not. It always turns out to be something bad about them. But I have come across, old Danny Mac used to be, a, a, he used to, a couple, he set up a, a safe house for some uh, people who'd escaped. And people he didn't particularly like, but just out of a sense of duty amongst the fraternity, uh, they'd blown it. Uh, the police descended. Two or three of them got away. And he again uh, went out and got another safe place for them. So he ended up doing two years over that <laughs> for perverting the course of justice or <laughs> harboring a criminal. I don't know what, that's worth quite a bit here too, isn't it? I think you'd get five years for that. I'm not sure with the UK stuff. Uh, well, um, <clears throat> I know they take uh, uh, any help given to uh, um, a felon or, or somebody kind of seriously. I mean, the resultant sentences can be, you know, wide ranging, and and sometimes they're very stupid. You know, those the parents of some half wit kid that had gone over to join ISIS. No doubt he was on the phone and they sent him some money uh, and they ended up being convicted of, uh, what was it? Uh, supporting a terrorist group or something like that. Um, I, did they go to jail? 
don't know. I don't. I think maybe even there was a jail sentence in it. And the, the law was so, you know, without exceptions, um, it had never been contemplated that 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 was the case. There was one and another law that um, can be um, um, poorly applied. There was a policewoman yesterday convicted of um, was it possessing child pornography or distributing it? I can't remember. Now possessing, yeah. And she got, oh, I don't know, community service order or something. But um, <clears throat> not that I'm ever in a hurry to leap to the defense of uh, police officers who've got into trouble. It's tragic when that happens. It's really <laughs> tragic. Poor guys. People just don't realize how. No, I can't go on with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, uh, she, her sister had uh, sent something or other about a child being abused, and the evidence was that it, had arrived on her WhatsApp. She said she wasn't aware of it. And that does tell you something about WhatsApp's uh, encryption and uh, its ability to turn up into evidence. A lot of people think it's uh, somehow uh, a safe form of communication. Uh, nothing is. It's no such thing. Yeah. I love the, the, uh, the Dumbest Criminals show, though, where the guy robbed the house, logged onto his Facebook page, and didn't log off. <laughs> That's careless. Yeah. So, what was so important, I wonder, that he had to get onto Facebook to do it <laughs> while he was in the process of burglary? Probably uh, a message from his girlfriend or something. Yeah. I mean, maybe he saw a funny video and just had to come <laughs> back with a zinger. <laughs> he could have. I think um, um, that uh, there's a, some very peculiar laws about. Um, even um, the illusion of freedom of speech, there's a rapper whose songs are subject to um, an order, like an ESBO or something or other. So um, his songs can't be played or um, owned by anybody. They're all in slang that uh, is local to the region. You barely know what the guy was rapping about unless you happen to know those words. You know, the... Street words are very hard to keep up with. Um, uh, I, I'm usually lost. How do you feel about the Spice Girls taking the Gary Glitter song, I'm a leader, I'm the leader, out of the Spice World movie? I love a bit of rewriting history. Um, it go, it's about as lame as the uh, airbrushing of, uh, uh, who was that? Um, Victorian builder, engineer, Brunel. Isn't bad Kingdom Brunel. Uh, or, I thought you were going to say Jean-Luc Brunel then. No. Um, he built bridges and tunnels and stuff like that. And the famous picture is of him in his stovepipe hat, uh, standing in front of the huge chains of the great western ship that was built. Uh, not very successful sailing to it. But he's got a stogie hanging out of his mouth, a cigar. And all the, because he's an English hero from the past, they think they could have been entitled to the odd smoke, but nope, that cigar is uh, airbrushed out of it. <laughs> so um, I expect there'll be a time. It might have missed the cycle with the smoking thing, but there was consideration that um, Bogart would not be allowed to uh, roll up a fag anymore. Um, but uh, I think we'll see... If it means anything to anybody, we'll see dead actors in films pretty soon anyway. I watched the premiere last night of um, The Irishman, the new Martin Scorsese. Oh, my dad's really talking about this one. It sounds it, really good. I am a bit knackered today. You watched the premiere she, of it. Uh, Jeanette said it was, well, when I say premiere, it's shown at the, the cinemas. So it's out now. And Netflix put it on yesterday. Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah. Is it good? Uh, Al Pacino plays Jimmy Hoffa. And yeah. uh, the Irishman in question is um, uh, Robert De Niro, mm -hmm. who plays Frank uh, uh, Sheeran, yeah, who is a union organizer and also buried a few bodies here and there. It's a Martin Scorsese film, and it's very long. It's about three hours. Wow. But I mention it in the idea of rewriting history in the sense that um, the technology was there to make them young 
without using makeup. Wow. They, it, because it covers, covers a period from what I think about 49, 1949 to the uh, 80s, or late 70s, um, it, uh, yeah, something like that, yeah, to the 80s. When De Niro has to look very old, that's prostheses and makeup. <clears throat> but when he's young, it's entirely digital. Mm. <clears throat> and very convincing, too. I was, I've got a high def set, as everybody has, mm. except for poor people. <laughs> and I don't think actually they make anything that's low def anymore, do they? No. I was right in front of it and couldn't see a fault on it. But as one of the critics said, they look like they're meant to be in their late 30s by their face, but they move like old men. Ah, uh, okay. And now that I had that in my head, oh. I was kind of uh, aware of that. Yeah. Um, so um, it, um, it was a, a tiny bit of a spot, but you've got to be in a relaxed mood. You're not going to expect... Um, uh, because there's a lot of history and a lot of uh, real names in there as well. <clears throat> uh, Al Pacino is quite restrained. I mean, he gets an opportunity to Pacino himself up. I told you guys, you, you know. Mm. But um, <clears throat> in fact, I haven't even really seen the end of it. I, I was starting to, to wilt by about one o'clock in the morning because I had to get up and uh, build some camera for some half-wit. Is Joe Pesky in it? Uh, yes, he is, and he plays uh, Russell something or other, but Italian, mm. and uh, very nice performance from him. Restrained the uh, arch behind the scenes arranger of everything, um, and you know the the two central characters uh, survive apart from Hoffa, who famously uh, disappeared, and there were. Um, bumper stickers in the 70s saying, was it 70s? Saying, where's Jimmy? And um, people used to drive around you know, because he was so missed. Um, there were even assumptions even then that, uh, but I think something that was a little bit um, true to life as much as I know these things on, on the American side, there were quite strong attempts to make him see reason um, before saying, well, you know, if you cross that line, that's it. Um, because they didn't dislike him. And he'd done, what, he got six years for jury tempering or something and, and done it without saying a word to, you know, didn't rat anybody out. Um, <clears throat> so... You know, he hadn't crossed that particular line, but they wanted him to withdraw from being part of the union, and he wouldn't. Um, I think, too, uh, just to finish up on that film, um, Scorsese didn't, is not happy to admit it, but it is actually a film about growing old. So I'm going to go back and watch it um, in a moment of peace, I hope to get between... <clears throat> I don't know, 4.45 on Sunday afternoon and an early evening. Um, little Nico's not well. He woke up all rigid this morning. Oh. That's my dog. I filled him full of painkillers. Mm -hmm. Or I mean, it looked so bad, I almost had to open the secret drawer. Oh. Um, uh, the, um, I mean, people can come to my door in pain and they won't leave without it, but, you know. <laughs> Not commercially, <laughs> and doesn't transport. <laughs> Stepping on minefields here. Yeah. So, um, is there any other uh, bits of things for the year that uh, um, are worth mentioning? Um, somebody um, did ask me um, to say something I've already said about um, the the garlic smuggling in Malaysia. Um, there was a time when I was around that, <clears throat> who was it? Oh yes, the Malaysian government wanted to protect their local garlic industry and put a 400% du uh, duty on imported garlic. Eh. And we all know what prohibition effectively does, it created a huge black market. So it ended up where there were 
uh, zodiac boats and shootouts on on the on the beach uh, over the thing. But um, many years ago, when bored sitting around with a bunch of guys, we were making a joke about what would happen if you were smuggling sand and you got caught. You know, um, and there was a Scotsman there who said, well, East was on, no, I like sand and all of that. But apparently there is sand smuggling going on or sand theft, really, mm -hmm. uh, uh, ice theft. Uh, there's a black market in Russia for cheese at the moment. Um, cheese is one of the imports that was banned. Mm. Uh, and there's places where you have to know who to kind of wink at to score an ounce of Gouda. Uh, <laughs> Emmental goes by weight because it's got holes in it, you know. You can't, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I think that uh, all of those things just go back to... Um, the whole idea of the stupidity of uh, prohibiting things, um, which very slow moving. I think in the upcoming, we've got elections in Britain, if you're watching from somewhere else, and they're only a couple of, two weeks away. Yeah. About that. And the choice is numbing because we've got real fraudsters up there. Old Boris, who... I don't think he's ever told anything but a fib and a kind of ratty old you know, would-be rabble-rousing red that doesn't know what to do with any real power because he's never had any. You know, very unappetizing candidates. Um, but uh, uh, <laughs> that's kind of what we're stuck with. I can't remember where I was starting with this, uh, the point of this story. Huh? <laughs> and nothing whatsoever to do with that. But I wanted to trash everybody who was on TV before going on to it. But uh, it shows you how much we, we don't care about it. I don't think um, anybody I know is, you know, in, in, in the US, people get very excited about uh, political campaigns and they can really support anybody. I mean, they don't need these big protection squads for politicians here generally because uh, no one cares enough about them to shoot them. You know, they're, they're the biggest criminals, aren't they? Politicians, um, the ones at the top. And, and stupid, I think. Um, More stupid than Prince Andrew? No, that takes some beating the royal family. <laughs> you know, I don't know whether you've watched any of The Crown, but uh, that's this the Netflix My mom's series. In it. Is she? Yeah. Wow, what's she? What's she play? Uh, what's her character? She's just in the background in these uh, like elegant outfits. Oh, I should have enjoyed some... that. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah. yeah. they filmed some of it in Liverpool. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, so my mom and dad do extra work, like just in the background, like ballroom dancing in the background and stuff. Well, I've watched a bit of it. Uh, no, it must have been fun. Uh, I've watched a bit of it to just from a, a writer's point of view, thinking, well, if you've got kind of pretty dull material can you make something dramatic out of it? And, and, and they've done quite, quite well because um, all of the royal characters seem a bit more interesting than uh, I think they were. Somebody I met who'd spent some time with them and they're kind of dull suburban people who um, uh, are a bit, I mean, Her Majesty's at least held the thing together. But Andrew, that, that disastrous interview. Did you watch it? I've watched yeah. it three times now. I just bit, keep noticing more and more things. Well, I, the, the bit that struck me straight, straight away was he said that he got himself in trouble because, well, the fact is I'm just too honorable. <laughs> Honor has been my downfall, really. Yes, too honorable. I, I think really I could explain away some of my own activities as too honorable. <laughs> People ask me to supply something, and out of a sense of honor, I go the extra mile. Travel to another country, <laughs> pack it where nobody can see it, and in a sense of honor, I take top dollar. Well, discounted, but there we are. It's he, all honorable. And he was so brave in the Falklands War that his adrenaline spikes so much that he doesn't sweat. So he's honorable and brave. Uh, he's somebody to uh, you know aspire to be, really. But. Really, he was so um, out of touch with, uh, didn't his own media director quit or something? Yeah. Uh, what about the bit where he says, it wasn't a party, 
It was a straight. It was a shooting weekend. A straightforward shooting weekend. Oh yeah, <laughs> I know. I, don't we all have them? Uh, uh. <laughs> How commonplace is a shooting weekend? Generally, the ones I've been involved in, you have to wear you know, masks and things. And try not to leave any DNA around. But uh, I think he meant something else. He must have, or well, somebody. I don't know what. Some of them do get ideas about how something's going to go down. Supposedly, he said to his mother, "Oh, job done there, mission accomplished." He was proud of it. He thought he had squashed the issue mm -hmm. with his own. Utterly unaware that everything we say. I mean, you know, how many people from who watch um, your channel will throw up the 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 minute and the second that you said something. Yeah. Maybe not to make a big thing out of it, but they're on it. Yep. Now, in the same way, the um, uh, social media, internet age, it's only a few clicks to check something he out. He said, I don't do PDAs. And then on Twitter, within seconds of him saying that, <laughs> all the pictures of him doing PDAs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I only dress casually in London. I mean, I only dress smart in London. I don't dress casually. All the pictures casual. I don't sweat. Pictures of him coming out of clubs, sweating. I think he must be so out of touch with the times, his mind goes back to some dignified interview with uh, a Michael Parkinson type in which you can give a lot of tosh and that won't be challenged. And there's nobody out there, what, the 12 million... Uh, reviewers that you get within a thing now. Um, he really, he had some chance of it sailing past him as you know people went on to do other things. But um, his sponsors dropped him, he's withdrawn from public activities. And next he, thing he'll be suffering a, a mental breakdown and be quietly, royalty like to do that, don't they? They nut their families off yes, um, quite readily. Yes, they've got to protect the organism, haven't they? Mm. And um, it was all dying down on my channel until he did that interview. Yeah, yeah and yeah. I just took it all to new heights. You must have thought, you must have woken up in the morning, and thought, "Wow, yeah. my prayers come true." Mm. Yeah. Well, not even that. After it was uh, first went to air, I suppose you would have only had to be online to see the froth start to bubble to the surface oh, yeah. on that one. Yeah, and you thought, "Wow." I was a bit worried about the next week, but it looks like that's taken care of. Because he is the most famous person linked to Epstein. Epstein's nowhere near as famous as Andrew. So by the mm. most famous person linked to Epstein, one of the most famous people in the world, doing that interview, that just brought the spotlight on everything again, 10 times. Mm. I think um, you say, it, it seems to be the um, uh, Epstein thing, it, every time it looks like there's some kind of a resolution. Now, I'm after the guy's dead, so, you know, what could happen next? But something does. The, the, the arrest of Ghislaine Maxwell is going to be the next big one. And is that going to happen for sure? She is communicating to the FBI through her lawyers, and there's been some news stories in recent days saying she may surrender to the FBI or be interviewed by the FBI. I suppose she's the one, though, that um, can, if there's a conspiracy to um, traffic in um, underage girls, she is a, a conspirator. And they then need to find some low ranking co conspirators who will turn against her um, to well, make she, the case. If you, look, if you watched Andrew's interview all the way through it, he keeps saying, I wasn't close friends with Epstein, I was a friend of Galen. Epstein was Glenn's plus one, so to speak. So you can see that Andrew is shaping her up to take the fall. Yes, I suppose um, whether that was witting or not, or he... Uh, Dim witting, more like. Yes, I think he was looking for somebody in the middle to, um, you know, I only came here for the uh, canapé and the, the drinks, or um, no, I, I knew the guy who parked the cars at that party, and I saw he was working that night and called in. Finding something as far removed from uh, anything that could be guilt. Um, so if she's nabbed by the FBI and she's facing life... You think that'll open up another... Maybe she'll give the goods on 
Andrew, just to prevent, just try and save our own skin if it goes that far. Well, if it does come to that sort of point, I suppose what you'll know then is um, the people who didn't want uh, Jeffrey to survive to repent or say anything, um, if uh, if they're involved in her her period of dealings with him, um, then you'll see some black hand doing some, not necessarily killing her off, but intervening in some way or an attempt to. But if nothing is done there, then um, again, I think it it, it might be um, that looking to more organized people from, from a different side of things. So there's a whole spectrum, isn't there? She could be suicided mm. or there could be a cover up. It was, um, um, it's been um, probably because I had to look back at 2019 when I was thinking about today. Um, uh, the it really um, there's a transition in in crime, and probably you'll find with uh, r reporting on true crime things that um, a lot of the obvious stuff will no longer be so much visible. I think anybody who's anything coming up will be, I mean, they always say cybercrime, but it's more, um, a, a little more complicated than that. There's, there's, uh, this, there will always be the huge drug market until it gets legalized. But it is changing uh, very much from an organized way to be a kind of patchwork quilt of, uh, of people that and come together for various reasons. So um, I don't think um, the, the mafia organizations will be in decline. Any big organizations will be. The amount of um, technically illiterate and electronically uh, expert people that will be required will shift the whole element uh, in the years to come. Um, Unfortunately, we'll be left with these big government organizations that will need to fill their daylight hours with something to annoy us, uh, and they're sure to do so. Um, the US justice system is one of the biggest employers in the world right now. Mm, mm, no, I, I suppose so. Scary. Um, well, uh, I think I should do... Uh, where are we with time at the moment? We're at two hours, I think. Are we? Do you well, want to do the questions? Um, we what can. are we at? One hour fifty. Yeah. What have we got left in time? Because we've uh, we got about um, we've got to be out of here by seven thirty, so we've got uh, three quarters of an hour. Oh, okay. Well, I'll just um, um, do a little before we go into the questions. I'll just say a little bit about what um, the reason I've um, pushed the Pakistan uh, story a little bit ahead. It's quite detailed and is the hardest to get a feel for. Everybody I think I've spoken to has an idea of Asian prisons and uh, uh, the Thais. And, you know, most people have been to Thailand and they know what Thailand's like. And they imagine um, a prison where there's a significant physical barrier. Um, but where we're going next with this thing is into a world that I'm pretty, I like to think I was somebody who could absorb uh, quite quickly, you know, what a situation was like, but it was so alien. It's really, I can only describe it as um, if you ended up in an alternate universe, um, being in the, uh, Pakistani jail system would be one if aliens were um, had a look alike Earth, but it wasn't. That's how how different it was, and how um, I'd bought my way into, and I would have ended up there anyway as a as a B class, which is supposedly um, the educated educated class. Uh, I think they describe it in their law books as someone accustomed to a better lifestyle. But you qualify um, if you've had a, a higher educational claim to it. Um, 
or even if you're a taxpayer, they're so rare. I mean, families have had their own cousins locked up because they paid tax. Judges agreeing that they must be mentally defective to have done so. Anyway, um, because of that, uh, um, the, the higher level of, of class, you're not handcuffed. So I'd be at court and I'd look around and think, the street's only there. I send my guard shopping at lunchtime. I don't want him under my feet. Uh, I go around talking to people. Um, I can go onto the street. It doesn't bother him. They know you're not going to go anywhere. They figure that if you're of that class, you'll never go to prison for long anyway. Why would anybody run away? I mean, they, they wouldn't like it if they lost you, but they wouldn't panic over it. So the idea that I could be picked up by just about anybody and driven off seemed perfectly simple. But why wasn't it? Because I'm in another universe mm -hmm. here. All the things that, I mean, my bigger friend, Nor John Magsy, the tribal leader, when he'd go to court, he'd hold court. There were more people putting applications before his private bench than there was in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the guards were all um, vetted by his guards. So they wouldn't have him, somebody wouldn't shoot him and then uh, claim that any story that it was somebody else, it, it, layer upon layer of complexity. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, to simply end up going to court, you have to pay somebody and, and they pay the, uh, the, not just the guards, but the prison gate. And when you're at the court, you have to pay the clerk of court to get you listed before the judge. So you've been paying out before you've even got to uh, speak your bit. And you have to know so much about all the characters. So I had to learn all of this. And I think that's why I kind of wanted a, a longer time in our next session to at least try anyway, to have people step into a completely alien world where all the things you took for assumptions about human behavior are wrong. But they also tell you something about our inner um, human behavior and probably our Western arrogance about making assumptions. You no long, you come out of that not with a kind of um, a better attitude about humanity. You don't any longer, if you did before, think of people in developing world being uh, destroying themselves without reason or, or inimically not, not to be trusted, it, it does kind of change your worldview. Not that uh, you don't remember bad things that were done to you, Sean. I, I believe Ahmed Babush, my torturer in Karachi, yeah, he died in the most extraordinary accident. Uh, I believe it was down to wedding fire. You know, the, when people are celebrating, they're firing guns in the air. <laughs> I kind of imagined following the trajectory of that gun, that little bullet, <laughs> as it reached velocity point and then headed its way down, <laughs> picking up the speed until where it left. Mm. Yeah, one of those little accidents in life, uh, accident-prone people. It happens. Um, so we'll need a bit of time for that. But as to questions. That's fine. Okay, so this is the first time we've ever done a podcast that has just been a chat. Every other podcast has been somebody's story, usually told chronologically or jumping around here and there. But we've covered some subjects. Which we could... certainly have. So mm. I'm, I want to know what you guys think of this chat style. Would you like to see more of this format? Do you prefer just a hard-hitting story read through chronologically? Or do you like just a discussion like what you've heard today? Please put your thoughts down below in the comments section. It's for reviewers. No like. Thumbs down. But don't use that button. It's an ugly button. <clears throat> J I've got a few, but what have you got? J. Ru. How is day to day life for David now? What are his wishes and regrets? And what would his alternative life have looked like? Well, there's many uh, J. Ru. There are many alternative lives, I think, that uh, we all could have had. Uh, but the one he's referring to, I guess, is where I kept a regular job and stayed with it or took another career, um, I could have ended up a pompous idiot like my father. And if you think I'm one now, you should have met him. Um, 
I think some of the the worst things have been um, oh, but, uh, lamely fathers till poor unlucky sons character building, but it wasn't so much that, but um, stripped away uh, a tendency to be uh, harsh on people. I felt that didn't live up to things. But that question, um, or part of it, also goes, goes to the question of uh, Charlie Manson, not the famous one, but the slightly less famous one, ex-vet, uh, um, British, who uh, is in touch from time to time with me, who asked me, would I, um, given a choice, have lived any different kind of life? That was the next question from Mads Jada. Would David do it all over again? Mm. Uh, right. Well, and by the way, I'll just say my day-to-day -day life is, uh, which was part of the first question, is just really busy. Um, I've got a regular job, uh, if you want to call it that, putting in CCTV uh, equipment and uh, dealing with kind of emergency repair things where I can... But only on certain conditions. One, that my invoices are, uh, are never examined too closely, that all materials are supplied by me and never questioned again. And if you ask me for a receipt, you'll get the one you deserve. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, I'm, I'm getting a bit uh, worn out by that, so uh, I want to keep writing. So buy my crap. Uh, yeah, I need to get this next one out. So that's day-to-day -day life, but that was the regrets question, wasn't it? Would you do it all over again? Mm. Um, what, and I said this to uh, Charlie, um, okay, I think a happy life would be a great one, uh, a content, uh, probably, sure, it'd be good, but this is the price you pay, and you'd know this, Sean. If you say, I will excise that experience from my life, remove it completely, what comes with it is all you learnt, all you came to know of yourself, all the testing you had of your um, abilities, survival capabilities, what with the beneficial, I mean, you might end up with some uh, post-traumatic, something, stress disorder, but we all got that, you know. I got that from episodes of Bugs Bunny. Um, I could do a whole show on Daffy Duck, but that's another thing. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't want to forego that information um, because not only does it make you, but you're privileged in a way to come to have an empathy for things and, and people that you never would before. doesn't suit everybody. You might end up just a wreck. Um, and I guess I'm a wreck, but I'm a wreck with some insight. <laughs> Definitely. Anne Beck 58 does David Mack have a channel? David Mack's channel is in the description box below this video. Let's click over there, get him some more subscribers. Um, the more I get, the more you'll see me. <laughs> blah, Dob. Question for Mr. Macmillan What's the biggest package you've ever shoved up your rear end? <laughs> Well, as you know, blah dog, I sound capacious yourself. Um, I'm not a big man. And uh, when pressed, as it were, in an emergency, uh, a pretty small personal stash was uncomfortable enough. I don't, I kind of marvel at what some guys can get up there. Um, but it's Surely painful, and uh, why does he want to know anyway? You look, you can get about 10 ounces up there if you really try. Grease it up. He's he's rooting for you to do the top 10 prison sexual positions, I think. Uh, I, I think so. <laughs> um, there's <laughs> the particular shape of carrot that was popular in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. Not a cucumber. No, too much curvature, apparently. <laughs> And by the way, according to the cucumber people, I never have it pointing up. <laughs> so Idle Hands is asking a question here mm. in a, a, a kind of literary way that he's written it. Oh, yeah. If change is the one constant in life, what change would you prefer to have seen remain constant? 
Hmm. As in a good constant change, something that's changing that's always good. I think if I translate that right, that's what it means. Um, <clears throat> novelty, new experiences, um, and what uh, we English, and I, by English, I broaden that to just about the entire English-speaking world, um, but an older generation, like most, was to be told that your life's work was absolutely wrong and to have your most treasured possessions trashed by some other's opinion. Um, and so, yes, the change in view of uh, a false assumption would be the best one if he wants to be accurate. Maker Man has asked, is Dinga still alive? Oh, Dinga the cat. Well, you'll have to read Escape to find out. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, Ding, old, uh, named after Schrodinger, rather, pretentiously. Um, you know, the cat that was tested on the, 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 the thought experiment. Uh, you put poison in uh, a, a black box and a cat in the black box. And, um, you break the poison jar, and is the cat dead or alive? In quantum physics, the cat is both dead and alive. It's a silly comparison, and I don't think they knew quantum physics too well. Not anyway. Always looking, as asked, it would be interesting to hear what you did in the 24 hours upon your release from incarceration. Yeah. Well, you've had so many incarcerations. Have you got a story from any of those you could give us? Yeah, oh, yes. Well, pretty much all of them. Um, when given the choice after some particularly bad experience and not committed to um, keeping on running, changing identity, doing something, having to deal with family, perhaps, uh, or whatever, um, and I go to a very plush hotel, uh, get a room, and go to sleep. Uh, and have a sleep, and 36 hours later, wake up and... Um, watch the, eat breakfast, um, watch the news, just get comfortable, um, wash away the last years and uh, then put on the um, hotel robe. Um, but um, I did something kind of particular when I got out of Thailand in the first moments. When I knew I was entirely safe, I checked into a hotel Instead of just going to sleep, I couldn't. I was a bit wired. I went up to the rooftop pool of the, the hotel and swam underneath it from end to end. And as I surfaced out of it, as the water drained away, I kind of felt like those years had gone from me too. But if he was referring to some mad celebration, I mean, how many people you know they got out of the big house and they're on a sidewalk the next day. They've written themselves off. They just get spastic. Years getting washed away from him. See what I said about Marcel Proust earlier? Remembrances of things past. And the Madeleine cake. <laughs> <laughs> I a few cakes, but not that one. Make a Man has posted another one with four questions. Um, I'm not quite sure what this means, actually. How many times have you supplied knowing full well so-called elites are going to take them? Does he mean that um, see what he might mean there. Um, consumers, your customers are elites? Oh, I see. I mean, people that I don't like might be taking my drugs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, you see, that's how, um, you know, Catholic in the old sense of the word, wide-ranging um, uh, people are entitled. E even the, the rich and powerful and corrupt can take uh, my produce. Drugs are the great equalizer. David's products go to all levels of society. And uh, you're right, Sean, an equalizer they are because uh, their true nature might come out uh, when stoned off their heads and people can see them for who they really are, shallow and all. Can you get military grade LSD anymore? Military grade must refer to the, um, the quality that was used when it was manufactured by Sandoz Pharmaceuticals and used in the testing in uh, what was it, the 50s and 60s. Um, potential um, mind-washing manipulation of soldiers. 
Uh, no, Sandal stopped making the last lot in um, Switzerland a few years ago. It um, there is a lab that does, um, and I'm trying to think the location. I think it's in the Netherlands. That if you've got, um, oh, I don't know, scientific or research qualifications or credentials, you can you can get particular unusual things. But most drugs are made somewhere still. Did you ever get too scared to do something you planned to do? I don't think scared because if you're doing something dangerous, all of us, if uh, we'll say, I'm not letting fear stop me. If I'm fearful, I want to know why. If I not run this through properly, I should go back to the drawing board and check all my preparations. Having said that though, I once was heading to an airport and every kilometer, every mile I got closer there, I was physically ill or ill. By, by the time I got off the motorway, uh, I had to stop and throw up in the gutter. I thought, it, I didn't feel like nerves. It was like nausea, like being poisoned. I went back home, I, I took the hint. I couldn't have lived with myself if so, I'd gone on the trip and it had gone wrong and I thought, well, <laughs> You know, the most severe warning I ever got was from my dog, Sasha, years ago, who came and told me that the police were coming, and I ignored her, mm. you know, and, and told her off. I, she wouldn't get back in the house, and then when I let her in, she crept around mm. and sniffed at things and looked at me. And I said, Sasha, what is it? Somebody been here? And Sasha looked at me with eyes that said, I can't fucking tell you, you half-wit. I'm a dog. Give you all the clues, act on them, or you know, die like a sucker. Well, we know what happened. Dan Collier asked, "Can you ask him about Melbourne Police?" Well, it's a generational thing. They, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I would say most of them today, from the reports I get, um, would say that they're um, a kind of uh, a bit and more dedicated in a strange way, even though the police, when I was growing up, they were, there, they were could be quite harsh, and they uh, mistreat people quite often. They had a favorite thing with a phone book, put it on your head and then use a truncheon. You'd think that would be um, tolerable, but it's not after a while. Um, it, they actually killed, oh, I had their name on the tip of my tongue there. They killed a guy just with that. Um, and oh, they did lots of other things too, and they threw typewriters all over. His wife told me that the doctors found his testicles had retracted right inside his body. Um, but they kind of stopped doing that after a while. But I, I think police all over the world have got a lot in, lot in common. When they meet each other from different countries, they all, they all like the chase. They all like, uh, I mean, I don't think there are any you know, Sherlock Holmes type who just do it for the problem solving. Uh, and I'd like to think there's a few wasted kind there was, um, that you see in fiction, you know. The, but that's just a, a fictional standard, isn't it? The hard drinking one who's cop, who's got a couple of wives behind him, alienated from the kids, under suspicion, was almost charged with something, went berserk on some, you know, scumbag years ago, who had it coming, uh, <laughs> uh, but is you now dragged back into a case because mm. only he knows that the serial killer used to mm. do this particular thing. I've just about described the plot of, you know, two dozen um, uh, books that are out. But, um, Policemen, uh, I've got nothing against them, don't mind them, but it's a dull job, uh, and the early parts of it are, are really dull, you know, standing around doing nothing. So. This is from Snobs. He's asked, what's the most ingenious thing you've seen made in prison that's not a weapon? Mm. Uh, ingenious thing. Well, I suppose... <clears throat> On the one hand, I've seen some very well-made uh, jewelry boxes, but he with stashes in them. But I'm thinking of um, other stashes that in the supermax people still had a little stash. It was um, used dental floss uh, and a paperclip. 
the thing you wanted hidden, you had to make kind of flat and long and poke it through a gap in a, a steel bench, drops down the paper clip, uh, holds it with the dental floss. But of course, um, it, it still had its risk element in it, but it, it was it was kind of uh, ingenious. Um, nothing that is not packed with geniuses uh, in there. Not, not a lot of them. No. So that's pretty much all the questions that have come in off these last two videos. I got a question from um, uh, somebody for whom I signed a book. I come to know these people who, who get these copies. Uh, um, not not simply from asking them, but um, and this guy um, was it? Uh, uh, I think Austin is his name. He asked. Um, what would happen to me if I returned to Australia? And um, it is quite simple. Uh, they uh, um, just won't forget, or well, the computers don't, because I jumped parole back then. Mm. It's um, I wouldn't mind going back and um, seeing the few people left alive, but they can come and see me, I guess. Is there not a statute of limitations on that? Uh, no, no. And anyway, I think... Um, most cases with a statute of limitations is a limit between um, the crime and the laying of charges, uh, where um, the perpetrator is never discovered. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't certainly in Britain that never evaporates. Um, in some states in the U.S., uh, it does after a time. But the even though I don't really owe them much. Okay, I, I broke parole. So they throw me in, and then I'd have to get paroled out again, which would mean um, a parole hearing mm. and somebody raising some objection. But it, worse, it would be restricting my travel for the next two years after that. That's a, a, a price a bit too high. Mm. I, uh, I, I think, uh, Austin, if, if you'll have to come to me to uh, meet me there, we might be doing... Uh, some kind of conferences in a neutral territory sometime in the year, years to come, but uh, or there'll be um, a virtual David recreated by some technology. <laughs> Wouldn't that? What if I could slap the old bracelets on a virtual Sean if he went back to the US? <laughs> no, I mean, we, the, imagine where is the line where this recreation of yourself? Because you wouldn't get a visa, would you? Not under your own name, in a hurry. Mm -hmm. No. So if in a, um, a writer's conference or, or broadcaster's one, you were there in an electronic version of yourself, then if that became better and became a, um, a, a physical machine, um, where's the objection to the real you if the machine can run around town? When uh, Julian Assange was in the embassy, people were interviewing him around the world on stage and what they would do is a robot would come out oh, yeah. and his head was the image of him at his webcam oh i think i saw a robot. picture of that yes yes, yes. Yeah. So there are ways of doing those things um they would but i'm just wondering um what the where the law will go i mean if only we could be around in 500 years when um the laws that restrict movement and things become sort of more meaningless. Um, and the things you can do, what if, um, if you cloned yourself, would, uh, and you'd paid for it, um, would that clone have any rights? Would you, would you be able to do what you like to that clone? Would it would, carry forward your criminal history? Would it be would it be double voting if your clone voted too? Um, would it be capable if they decided it was uh, enough to be called a human? Then it'd be capable of committing a crime if it did something. If it is not, it is a device. In which case, it's a malfunctioning device. If you directed that device, then you are the perpetrator because you it is your hand behind his hand. Where this is going to get muddied is uh, just the kind of future we all deserve. 
And the good part about it, kids, is that uh, some of you young enough might even make it through. I mean, some of our younger viewers, if they're 20 now, and kept alive till the year 2180, for example. Uh, oh, no. Uh, 2080. No, 2080. Um, by effective medicine, uh, they'll be at probably around at the stage where some other um, development can keep them alive um, through cell manipulation um, another 100 years, by which time they'll definitely be able to have their brains moved into uh, machinery. So um, conscious entities today will be part of that and and so much will be uh, wonderfully meaningless that people get upset about now um i think in, do you fear for the future that uh, people's entire movements will be uh monitored and um somehow logged by technology oh dear you know what i was looking at the other day i was typing an email the sun came in the window and the reflection on the screen showed the differences in how many times I'd pressed that keyboard. So the letter E was much more worn and it was shiny. Um, and that group up there. I realized but by looking at that, <clears throat> you could uh, not only r work out which language was being typed on it by the frequency of the letters, you would know whether the person typed with uh, both hands and which fingers of both hands. Also, their handedness, mother relative wear on each of those. What I'm getting at is this, the AI will be efficient enough to draw a huge amount of information from very small amount of things that we wouldn't consider would yield a lot. And, you know, the old law, if it can be done, it will be done. Um, I think people are very poorly adapted to um, imagine the future into uh, which some of them born today will find themselves uh, really poorly. We always, in recent podcasts, have been ending on a metaphysical note. If you go back to the previous podcast, number six, we ended it on alien mitochondria and parallel universes. Yes, we did. And now you have AI and genetic engineering. We'll, we'll have to up our game for the next one. Mm -hmm. If, on the other hand, you are gagging for hard-hitting stories of David's life and you are new to David on this podcast, James is kindly going to add some episodes to the end of this one and make it 10 hours long. So we should just go, all right, we'll just go, let's go with part one, part so, two, part so, three. Uh, <laughs> if you do that, won't somebody look at it and say, yeah, 10 hours. I couldn't stomach anybody for 10 hours when they see the timeline on the bottom. Or they just missed that, do they? No, I got loads of messages saying, oh, right. thank you so much for posting that Mark Macmillan marathon. Oh, really? I just sat in all weekend and watched all those episodes. Yeah, and it did really well. Yeah. And also, the longer the content, the more it tweaks the uh, YouTube algorithm somehow. No, oh, does it? No, yeah, you get oh, rewarded oh. for longer content. Mm. Uh, it's not about you know, a lot of people. Um, uh, what they do is they look up from time to time, um, but they listen to it. They like podcasts to them. Um, I guess they make a cup of tea during the ads or something, but um, they're not always on screen. So all, all the my clever graphics, you're, you're missing that point. I listen to Joe Rogan when I'm driving around or cooking breakfast, all, all kinds of things. Yeah, he's got a huge commitment in his daily life to doing it. Yeah. yeah. What's he up to, two and a half million? More like five or six million subscribers, I think. He's getting ahead of you there, Sean. Terrible. Mm -hmm. He's not doing enough Epstein. I'll catch up with him. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think to, uh, you must have a lot of um, new viewers from the US who, because that's their territory, that thing. I know the strong English thing. But it was, um, my viewers were mostly US, but now since the Epstein. It's got Prince we've, Andrew. We've, we've had yeah. a, and Prince Andrew had a surge in UK, exactly. Right. Well, that's, yeah. that makes a good mix because it means the US viewers would be kind of um, thinking, oh, it's not such a small world after all. We'll, we'll go back into him. Plus, the UK viewers can come and see us on the Isle of Man next November if that goes through. Mm, well, um, 
the viewers' minds, uh, their attention spans match too shallow to <laughs> comprehend anything in a year's time because I've got plans in a year's time to reveal something. Now I mean you have to know about yourself. Um, but nobody will remember that, so we'll have to remind them. We'll constantly remind them. And if your attention span is long enough to subscribe to our channels, my logo is in the bottom right-hand corner of this video. David's link is in the description box with all of his books and all of his socials. Got my new book out for Christmas. It is Which Clinton, that? Bush, and CIA conspiracies from the boys on the tracks to Jeffrey Epstein. When the hell did you get time to write that? I write while I'm in between making this stuff. And Do you have any other life? I can't see where They call it me is. the robot. Wild Man calls me the robot. Ah. Yeah. So that's available worldwide on Amazon if you like the Epstein, Clinton, Bush conspiracy stuff. This podcast, I imagine, will put it out just before Christmas. This will be like our official Christmas. Um, it, it could be. So Merry Christmas. Yeah. Thanks for and, subbing. Um, when you're celebrating Christmas, you either do it in style, in which case you won't remember it, or you do it sadly. So our thoughts are with you if you're by yourself with a little lonely cupcake and a pile of tears putting out the single candle. Our thoughts. And a huge thank you to everyone who's been so generous to send donations through PayPal, Patreon, just giving all those links are down below the video as well. You are helping us produce these videos at high quality in a studio with a professional team. So thank you guys for doing all that as well. So Merry Christmas. And we're looking forward to just getting loads more content out in 2020. Yes, lots of true crime to go around and things you wouldn't believe. Let's do the uh, the handshake. But That's I've, true. I've got, I've I don't want to be damaged. I've got actual your... cockroaches in my cufflinks and, here. And Sean won't tell me what's quite behind <laughs> them. But, you know, it's, uh, Cheers. Might Merry Christmas to you. I'll spill my guts. Yes. <laughs> okay. Christmas to you then. See you, folks. Take care. Thank you. Well, uh, Sean's just handed me a, um, a business card for um, Justice and Gus. Uh, these two do psychic readings, and uh, she's a psychic medium. She's working on becoming a fool, but not so far. And you can get, uh, <laughs> well, you, you can find out, oh, Sean, what are you wearing there? <laughs> let's, let's get the gigs on. And I'm like, look, this is pretty good. I tell you what, you know what this reminds me of? <laughs> Podcast 8 with David Macmillan. Hi there. <laughs> it reminds me of uh, the man with the x-ray eyes. <laughs> and Ray Meland was a doctor, and his vision started to become more and more able to see through people. I think I saw it. Was it a black and white movie? Um, well, I saw color stills, but it might have been the poster. But this is the creepy part. He had to wear lead spectacles just so he could get around. Um, you have not been dosed with acid watching this video right now. We are wearing our rather large sunglasses. People from time to time send us things to wear on the YouTube videos. This is not a plug. It is just a gift from Lady Justice. And Lady Justice is a criminal justice paranormal psychic medium. Well, what does that mean, Sean? Does she only <laughs> do readings for criminals? Does, along including. the lines of, an authority figure will come into your life. <laughs> you will be confined to a small space. This is your future. I think she'd be pretty much spot on with most criminals, yeah. The party next to you at the restaurant in the tomorrow's evening meal are actually police over eavesdropping on your conversation with wiretaps. Mm. Your wife for 20 years has been an undercover spy. <laughs> <laughs> She's working for the Russians. Yeah. Services, personal, private, psychic medium readings and more. If you'd like to contact Lady Justice, she's at um, www.instant go.com. It's readings. not really good having a business card where you can't um, really read it. <laughs> it is instantgo.com justice readings. Okay, I think that'll do for the commercial part of the. the David extract. Macmillan, international kingpin, hunted across five continents, incarcerated in multiple con countries in multiple continents. 
Incontinent, not incontinent. A jail tourist, <laughs> I was called once. Did a story jail from... tourism. Uh -huh. Escaped from death row on Thailand. The only Westerner ever. And if you've not seen all these other episodes, they're in the description box below this video. Our links to not just all of the stuff we've done with David, to his own YouTube channel. Please go over to David's YouTube channel. I'm actually doing some now. Um... And we were sort of talking about that. Um, one of the themes is um, to do with um, picking up uh, the ransom money from kidnappings. And uh, you'll be able to see that on my channel probably before you actually see this. But Sean might put it on his, you never know. Um, but it did raise um, one important issue for um, people who thinking of getting up to mischief, not that we encourage it, but um, if the person you're uh, either robbing or doing harm to, and in the kidnapping it's the, the family, rich dad or whatever, the richer they are, the worse it's going to get for you. Now, I think most people would probably guess that anyway, but not to the extent. The one I'll be talking about is uh, uh, was a kidnapping that was to take place in, um, well, the victim was going to be taken to Lebanon. But I did point out that because the father of this young man was media magnet Rupert uh, Murdoch, yeah, sure, he'd, uh, he probably wouldn't blink at paying the 15 million, but he'd probably offer 50 uh, for the heads of those who'd done it. Now, Here's what I'm getting at. If there's enough money involved, if there's huge sums, every scoundrel in those five continents that you referred to will come out of the woodwork and by one means or another, they will say they've earned their money and brought the kidnappers to justice. They will be not just ruthless, but they will even manufacture uh, uh, kidnappers. They'll produce dead bodies with littered evidence that, uh, yes, this is their hideout and so on. Uh, taking on such a huge target does mean you will never have any peace. Uh, there, there are, I think Howard Hughes used to keep uh, a staff on all the time to deal with people that offended him. And you don't hear their stories, which is even more worrying than having heard them, because I guess they couldn't tell them, but still. So, Sean, you've been keeping busy with Epstein, but where we are here today, you know, it doesn't really matter when I say that you've been keeping busy with Epstein, because if this doesn't go to air for a year, you'll probably still be busy with him. <laughs> a dead man can live on. The story that keeps running, Epstein, Prince Andrew. I know, it does. But today we're um, going to plunge into um, Pakistan, particularly Karachi Central Jail, a famous location uh, for locals because a lot of um, politicians, um, <clears throat> Well, they call themselves activists, but um, really criminal gangs masquerading as uh, uh, political groups. And rich people have all been in there, um, including Benazir Bhutto, the, the daughter of uh, Ali Bhutto. And she was, what, prime minister f off and on a couple of times before she died, wasn't she? Benazir Bhutto. Yeah. So Benazir Bhutto was incarcerated. Yes, she was locked up there, in the, in the women's section. But um, they, uh, when you're in there, you can go and visit the women's section. Ah. Yeah, uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll come to. And just but, to recap for people who are new to this then, mm. why are you in this prison in this particular moment of your story? Okay, let's imagine that we're descending from outer space and like Neil Armstrong trying to find a safe place to land on the moon, you're looking for somewhere you know, friendly. And by chance, you go over Karachi with its 17 million, I think, people sprawling out, and you'll see a big rectangle down there. And it looks safe to land because it's a bit of open space, but it's not. 
in one of the most notorious prisons where routinely when the middle class uh, people get arrested and brought in, they go straight to the torture ward. It's called the Bund Ward, Bund meaning closed. It's closed, all right, uh, but you can hear it from outside. What's the preferred methods of torture? Um, I ended up in there, uh, and I'll tell you why uh, shortly, or eventually. Um, start off easy, uh, just handcuffed around the clock uh, behind your back. You have to make your own toilet arrangements like that. Um, these guys uh, kindly you know, uh, held my pants in place while I squatted. And there's a bit of protocol, you know, you turn away at that moment. Um, but um, leg spreaders, which are long bars of iron uh, with manacles either end, so that now you think this is a bit odd, but is it painful? It is after some time. And you spend days like that not being able to walk, uh, fetters, they call them. Um, and then when that softening up's done, it's straight in with the leather belts. Um, and so the next communication um, that the poor slob has with his family is you know, screaming for money, they're going to kill me. Um, they won't, but they'll you know, get as close as they can. But anyway, your... Um, Point was, what was I doing there in general? I am um, just over 40, I think 41 years old. Um, since the age of 20, uh, being involved in smuggling, I found myself locked up in different places from uh, a supermax prison in Australia, uh, which only held 48, Sean, but there were... Um, 35 deaths a year for its 48 inmates. Now, they did close it in the end. Those figures spoke for themselves. Then to um, a Thai prison um, where I was about to be sentenced to death and had no real alternative than escape, which luckily I did because I didn't realize how big the damn place was. Um, and then having got away through Singapore and then into Pakistan and safe into uh, the, the care of my old friend from my very early days when my wife and I tried to take uh, our own version of the Silk Road across, um, starting out um, right, really actually we were more retracing Alexander the Great's <laughs> footsteps. We had three big mobile homes and musicians, and I think our soap maker came along or something like that. But oh, uh, oh. Uh, it, it was quite a big caravan. So I admit um, Mir, his lordship, uh, Lord John Magsy, all those years ago. Um, and um, he was... Um, and he was in, in jail at the time and had uh, called me over about his cousin who'd been kidnapped. Um, kidnapping's coming up a bit today, but kidnapping there is very routine. It's not, um, it's very rarely somebody jumping out of a van in the street, but um, it's mostly inviting you around and just not letting you go. Um, so as I'd in the in the previous, well, I think, part five or six, uh, I'd spoken about um, having to buy back Little Iftikhar, the kidnapped boy, um, which I bought along with some uh, antiquities which were being looted by, um, you know, well, they were sort of pre-Taliban people, but there, there were lots of those. So <clears throat> over this... Um, a career of darkness. I've ended up in big prisons from time to time. Um, I've lost everything and, and regained things, but of course the things I can't get again. And uh, My wife was killed in a prison fire. There's no turning back death. Uh, and to find myself um, arrested in uh, Karachi 
uh, mysteriously too. I, I wasn't really up to anything. But those are the dangerous times, Sean, when you, um, because you know everybody. Oh yes, David was involved too. Of course, it doesn't take much. Uh, and what made it worse was that the uh, arresting officer, who was quite senior in the anti-narcotics force in Karachi, um, had got into his head um, that I was some huge mafia figure. I had tentacles everywhere. Um, the a courier had been picked up who said that. Uh, uh, I'd owed him money from gambling in the Philippines, and he was under threat he had to do it. And, oh, it doesn't matter what, look, if you if you try anything with David, he'll have you killed. He's got assassins everywhere. Mm -hmm. Well, this guy who had been, um, had American DEA training, took that personally, and he was a kind of upper-class Karachiite. The, the rich people there often like to get their kids government jobs. Because even if they never go into the office, they have a job for life. So that's the kind of starting point. And official jobs, um, including higher-ups in police forces, uh, are good to have. So this was uh, um, a well-spoken but huge uh, guy called uh, Ahmed Bush. Babush, that was his name. Babush. Babush, yes, it stayed with me. <laughs> um, that was his introduction to me. And I was plucked under unusual circumstances. My picture was stuck on a wall at Lahore Airport, whisked my plane down to Karachi. I saw the uh, gloating face of my old nemesis, um, Bill Shankman from the USD. Eh? <laughs> old Bill used to make it his business to try and make things interesting for my life. And um, once again, I, I saw the life that I'd um, rebuilt here in London just crumble away. I had a, a girl in my life who knew nothing, nothing at all of, of what I'd been up to. I had a little uh, muse house in um, down in Chelsea. You know, sure, I just remembered, if somebody's got that house, if they go up the stairs, there's um, one of these plugs on the wall. You know, they used to make little stashes out of them. You put a special key and it opens up. If you feel you're in, uh, well, I won't name the street, but if you have a little one-bedroom muse house with uh, nice skylights in there um, and a PowerPoint halfway up the stairs, there could be that £2,000 still stuck behind that. Would that be in old notes? It would be. So you'd have to take it to um, a money collector. Can you can you still do that? Because um, wasn't the purpose of changing the notes to thwart people who've got money stashed? Oh, I, I suppose it to force them to try and bring it out. But really, I mean, they do that in India a lot. They've done that five times. They've um, virtually overnight said, oh, as of Monday, um, the 5,000 rupee note won't be legal tender anymore. They don't replace it with another one. They just say, no, we're going to have low notes. Because you've got these guys in America and Central and South America as well that, that happens, and they're in prison. Mm. So they send guys out to dig the money up then, and the money gets robbed. Yeah, uh, surprise, surprise. <laughs> 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 yeah, what are you doing, Pedro? Oh, I'm just going out a bit of uh, d digging in Arizona, <laughs> you know, the thing. Oh, really? Yeah, well, I'm off for the weekend too. Something just came up. <laughs> <laughs> just to say one thing, uh, Bill Shankman, is that his name? Yeah. Bill Shankman, DEA agent, is a reoccurring theme in David's books. And I love how David ends his book. Is it Escape or Unforgiving No, it'd be Destiny. Unforgiving Destiny. In, un unforgiving Destiny, how there's a moment I'm not going to spoil it, but at the end, there's a Shankman moment, and it's it's very delightful to read. Well, of course, here... Um, Links to his box in the description box below this. That's under Show More, by the way. You click on that, and things happen. Or if you're on your phone, there's a little down arrow. There's probably lots of arrows on a phone. Mm. But you've got a point. Um, yeah, I, Bill was, of course, my nemesis, but 
In the greatest disappointment, apart from being hounded and destroyed a few times by him, was that he never had any good lines for me. Um, he would be there in, and, and he was there in Karachi that time. He was there in, in Bangkok in the Chinatown police station. And I think by the time I got used to seeing him, I'd say, well, Bill, I see you're here, which explains a few things. Um, he got justification for his interest because, unknown to me, um, one step removed from me was Tommy from Thailand, whose uncle had uh, rather foolishly um, kidnapped the, the wife of a DEA agent. It was meant to drive her around town and, and drop her off and, and give the agent a scare, stop him from roaming around on the farmlands, uh, annoying the opium farmers and so on. But it all went wrong and the car stalled at traffic lights and the kidnappers there with a revolver with a trigger uh, tied with wire and his thumb on it. So, well, you can't shoot me because she'll go. And then, oops, I slipped. So, you know from, uh, what's his name, uh, Kiki? The Kiki Camarina. Mm. Now, he was American agent, wasn't he? DA agent, yeah, from Cali, yeah. Mexico. Now, how did the Americans take his torture and death? Well? Well, there was a mixed reaction. So you've got people, top brass people, and um, government officials in America kind of like saying, you know, that's what happens to people who are on the front line, no big deal. But then you got the DEA saying this is, the, you know, you, you can't kill a US citizen on foreign soil. This is not allowed to happen. So America's got to have this huge reaction now to find out what's actually happened here and bring people to justice. But there was, because the CIA were involved in smuggling cocaine around that time and all oh, that sort of oh, stuff, there was all these so conflicts going on. purified as some American innocent abroad being uh, killed. Kiki Camarina, he realized that if he just kept arresting people and just posing for a picture with a, a, some coke and a dealer, it would make no change to the world. So he went above his pay level and he started to look at where the money was going. And that money was going to top government officials. Some of it was financing the war in Nicaragua, Americans fighting the communists. Um, so once he went after those people, he was supposed to be kidnapped and, and warned off, but the kidnappers went too far. Um, well, yeah, certainly did. But the point is there, isn't it, that the, uh, the US do have a policy of uh, and it's a sensible one, of hunting down and destroying anybody who harms a, a, in general a U.S. citizen, but particularly an official. Yeah. So when you end up, as I did by proxy, as it were, on the list of people who were to be destroyed, um, people didn't argue with Bill if, if he'd say, oh, I'm looking at Macmillan's latest thing or whatever it might be, even though there was no U.S. connection. Uh, I, I've, I've known... Um, a few kind of mobsters and interesting people over there, but always resisted doing business because I, I could never, I could never really get the feel for. E even when I was in New York, I, I got a better idea there, but <laughs> once you keep going further and further west, the people get flakier and and stranger. And and in Los Angeles, they struck me as very much kind of Hollywoodish in in that they were kind of acting everything. So I couldn't judge if somebody was an informer or a double agent and and my friends had also, my English friends had said that uh, look, be careful there because um in most circumstances, as soon as somebody gets arrested, they'll say to the police, All right, what's the deal here? Who do you want? I'll serve them up on a platter with trimmings. I was lucky because in Arizona, I built a scene from the ground up with all the local people. So everyone knew everyone. Uh, so right. if anyone came in from the outside, we knew right away. And even when they um, submitted the 
request for wiretaps of the judge, they said, whenever we send undercover cops to these people. They it, stand out. They always come in. We're from out of state. We want to buy some pills. It was oh, so obvious. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I mentioned Kiki Camarena. If you are interested in his full story, my new book just got published. It's four stories that intertwine. Kiki Camarena's is one of them. It goes way beyond what Narcos Mexico has said about Kiki Camarena's. There's so much more to it than that. Anyway, that's available worldwide on Amazon now. It is Clinton, Bush, and CIA Conspiracies is the title, subtitle, from the boys on the track to, surprise, surprise, Jeffrey Epstein. Oh, don't tell me he gets in there. He's in there. Oh, well, that's a very long title, but um, <laughs> uh, I'm sure people will uh, work it out. They, all you have to really know is Sean Atwood. That's the name to remember. Put that on Amazon. 13 books will come up. Yes, bring to life, they do. So, um, <laughs> before I get totally lost here, uh, this um, Karachi uh, arrest was worse than the Thailand one. The place, it wasn't a matter of, my, my normal approach, Sean, is, okay, arrested, start looking around, what bars can be cut, uh, is there anybody I can manipulate to open a door for me? Can, do I have to convince anybody of anything here? What are the physical barriers? None of that applied. And here's why it's so hard to describe there, because it is really, for me anyway, um, totally alien. I, it took me so long to become... <laughs> not as one with the people there, but at least to have some understanding. <clears throat> when I was, uh, of course, my Thai escape came up, and, and so I had slightly worse treatment when I arrived at the jail anyway. But, um, and this is a jail where people don't even go to court. They've got to pay to get on the court list. They've got to pay the drivers. They've got to pay, when they get to the court, they've got to pay to get out of the van. <laughs> they've got to pay to go and see <laughs> Yeah, they've even got to tip the guard so I can see the clerk so that I can pay the clerk to get before the judge. So there's things to know here. This is not. Are they allowed to carry money around to do those tips? Oh, yes, they ignore all that. But I did make a mistake once coming back from court. Um, I had a wad of money there, and I should have tipped the guard there, but um, he felt it. And, and I wasn't quick enough giving him a 500. Well, it looked like too much for that. So he, he made a nuisance of himself and then extended the list of people that I had to pay off by saying, well, we'll put it on uh, in the safe upstairs. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can imagine. Um, yeah, really safe. Has that word got any relevance to where it's going? So, um, yes, the short answer is that. And also, if you're um, in... It's a class system, A, B, and C. A is political, B is uh, rich people, or what do they call it? People accustomed to a better lifestyle. That's actually written in the law, would you believe it? Accustomed to a better lifestyle. Um, and C, which is just the dregs. They're the people that never get out of the dormitories. There's hundreds of people in there. Um, if they're lucky, they get uh, um, their uh, lentil and... Uh, and pita bread on, on a bit of old newspaper, but that formality is not always adhered to. Um, so there, you would need money because somebody went out and to do the shopping every day. The original, they used to call, it was named Chandil. Now, like this, to give you an idea of how old this institution is and its traditions, um, the original Chandil went back to 1948. But every guard who got the job as doing the shopping used to take the name Chandu. Um, he did a wide range of things. You used to give him a little bit of a tip. to, and Oh, he used to go to the pharmacy as well. Uh, you used to write your own prescriptions out and, <laughs> and whatever you could get, he'd, he'd get them for you. Uh, he also did the shopping for the high end. One of, um, I'll just put this a bit back into sequence because I don't want people getting as lost as I was when I first went in there. So I, I won't go over the torture thing again, but you can catch it before. I'm more or less, after 5,000 pounds, I'm kind of left alone. Uh, but I go out to the prison. I don't know quite who my informer is. 
um, but it's supposedly a courier. And I think, well, I, I don't, I, I haven't been anything to do with the business for at least a few months. Um, there was a guy who wanted uh, a retirement plan, not not the not that kind of retirement plan, um, <sighs> and he was meant to be organising some couriers. But uh, this Billy Green, an ex boxer from Liverpool, he was living in the Philippines. I can't see. Well, I'm speculating about this, and they've um, put me in the jail and sent me over to the MQM Party's headquarters. Within the prison, all the political groups, MQM was a Karachi-based independence movement. And of course, a lot of them are in prison, mostly for things that are nothing more than looting and kidnapping and so on. But uh, they say it's all political. Uh, anyway, I suppose it is in a sense. Uh, politics of greed. And I was made quite comfortable there. Their English speakers uh, gave me a room to myself. Uh, and then there was a little scraping at the, the door uh, as I was finishing off um, some food they had brought me. This is other prisoners, of course. Oh, we found a friend for you. We found an Englishman. Uh, yeah, okay. And who's led into the thing but this great steaming, quivering lump of jelly? Yes, the venerable Billy Green himself. He was the courier. And why? Because Billy didn't want to pay the couriers, he thought he'd do it all himself, like five kilos or something, um, and did it all wrong. <laughs> and then he could he could pocket the money. And what was the solution when he got caught? Um, blame it all on me. And uh, viewers, three months before this. I'm at South Kensington on um, Dino's restaurant saying, Billy, I, look, I've just given you 12 grand. Uh, if that's not enough, uh, that, surely that'll last you in the... F I mean, what had he done for me? He got me a few passports, nothing much, really. Um, but he was the kind of guy that always remembers things. You know, the truly stupid have got a photographic memory for you, anything that looks like useful detail, any... Of, um, he didn't go to the Muse house, but he went to the flat around the corner, soaked it up like a sponge, everything that was written down there, and then it all regurgitated back out. Not to mention, <laughs> and, and you might wonder why he'd done this, because I explicitly told him, when to travel, you do not take your photo album with you. Um, you don't take your address book. Uh, this is how to code telephone numbers. And I could tell I was wasting my time. You know, the coding system for telephone numbers is um, you find a 10-letter word or phrase and just substitute the letters. For example, frozen days, easy to remember, F-R-O-Z. F is one and S is zero. The letters don't repeat, so you just have to tell somebody... Uh, PT, a loaf, you know, whatever. Um, once when we were being um, under surveillance and, and every telephone line was tapped, Michael, my old partner, had to make up something that would make it not sound like code. As in, yeah, David, I was at this party last night. Uh, Freddie was there and so was Olivia. I'm thinking, what the hell? And I started to realize I have to write down the, the names because it's the first letter of the names he's giving me, mm. which is the letters for the new telephone number I have to call him on. But uh, these kind of subtleties are wasted on the Billy Greens of this world. And I can imagine, you know, I pictured him there at customs, suddenly having a, a, a full-on heart attack and... and they're experienced people there. They just would have pulled him over. And I, did they have to ask him, uh, do you have anything to declare? It was more like, I was told, this indication it's not mine. I've got nothing to do with it. I had to do it. You know, what they, he even took um, one of the best concealment things for, that um, a Christian, the Danish guy, had ever asked me to build, which was an architect's drawing board. And resin plastic, white resin plastic, had been poured all over thin layers of dope. And then all the little slidey bits, a bit like the angle, angle poise thing on this, 
were over the um, the drawing board, along with um, sketches and things like that. Customs didn't touch that. They didn't. They they well, they picked it up, of course, tapped it, solid as a rock, put it aside. What does Billy do? There's more in there. <sighs> now, what kind of level of cowardice are we trying to rate here on a scale of? 11 plus, <laughs> because the only reason he would say that, I, I imagine, you know, viewers can comment differently, why would he tell them something he didn't have? He was so uh, scared that if they later on found it, they'd come back to him and flick him with a wet towel because he hadn't said, oh, there's also some there. They didn't want to know. It took them apparently two hours to get into the thing. They were, one of them was sweating, well pissed that he'd even mentioned it. <laughs> you know, a nice phonied up suitcase there. Yeah, yeah, just tear it out, put it on the scales, that's it. You know, share it out later when the, um, the accused is gone. Um, <laughs> some of those things get recycled very many, many times. Oh, I can imagine. It's too valuable to throw away. Oh, yeah. And it can be used to set up somebody who's worked for you a few times. They're, they're quite ruthless there. Yeah. So... This was to be my cellmate as well. Didn't, and, he, didn't he earn a nickname from this? Um, oh, well, he, 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 he wanted his own new passport, and he chose the name William Power. Will uh, Power. Exactly. I didn't even realize uh, <laughs> what, it, what it meant. People do that. <laughs> I had a courier once who was uh, known as the lollipop man because he looked like one of those guys that let the kids cross the road at mm. a zebra crossing. And um, I said, what name do you want your passport in? Um, Roland. I said, what, a family name, nickname, something? No, I just like the name. Last name, Wynn, W-I-N-N. Okay. And it wasn't until later that knowing he was an inveterate gambler that um, I realized it was a dice thing. Mm. Roll and win. Mm. Roll the dice and win. Yeah. Well, he didn't always, but um, um, he, he actually was quite sensible and did retire. <laughs> um, actually, and one of the only people to, uh, or few anyway, to bring me money after I was uh, arrested once. Not many of those. So he retired well. Um, now, the next morning, an American comes in called Mason, and his accent was from um, mm, East Coast. Um, lived on a place called Egg Island or something. Um, but it's up in Great Gatsby Territory. Mm. So he's wandering around the jail. I know nothing about it, but he tells me he's offering real estate, prime real estate. Um, he is, in fact an agent that morning for the deputy governor of the prison. Uh, and I can picture the scene later because when Mason went, the, the deputy governor said the same thing to me. Um, yeah, rich foreigners have come in. Go get them. Mm. They're worth ah, 25,000. For some reason, that must be a lucky number there because they're always saying it. it doesn't mean anything. Oh, U.S. dollar. Yeah. So um, I don't know why I'm using a Mexican accent for that. It doesn't really belong there. Uh, it just seems, venality seems to go with that accent, doesn't it? Um, well, just, I said to Mason, does this accommodation, well, what is it? Well, you have your own room but by myself. Yes, I'll pay it. Just to get away from Billy Green. Do you want him? Pay for him too? Billy's looking up at me. Don't don't abandon me. I know how you ratted you. You know, he said, I, I thought, Dave, it didn't matter because I didn't even know you were in the country. Well, well, that's fair enough, isn't it, Sean? I mean, you know, if, say, you left Arizona for a couple of days to come back to the UK, somebody got in trouble and finked you out completely from, well, well arsehole to breakfast, as they used to say in Australia, um, <clears throat> then um, that's fair, isn't it? No, uh, Billy, I said that wasn't very helpful. Um, and what about your address book? Well, the look on his face said, no, I cleared up any ambiguities there that they couldn't understand. So burnt, you know, the, the Muse house burnt. The two flats in Earl's Court 
burned. Um, luckily, I mean, I'm not that stupid. He didn't know the safety deposit boxes or the codes to things. But um, I'd taken a lot of precautions before I left London. I even took my house keys and um, thinking on the basis, the more precautions you take, the less you're likely to need them. I took my house keys and left them by the drain pipe um, just outside, which came in handy uh, later on. Um, so I was pre prepared for the worst, but um, the place I could have had the worst across the, the border in Afghanistan never happened. Mm. Uh, I suppose because there's not really meddlesome officials there that can't be shot, I suppose. Anyway, um, so I took the, I, I, I stumped up the money for that. It was um, all services, pro well, I have to call somebody, whoom, mobile phone. <laughs> um, <laughs> looking at it, it was slightly worn out, <laughs> you know, double O or the plus sign. You know, so many people before me had had to call foreign countries <laughs> to uh, get themselves out of trouble. Um, and I uh, went to B class, uh, which was a, a row of little, um, uh, well, they were still cells, but they never locked them except late at night. And um, we had a bed because everybody else slept on the floor. A little bathroom, privacy. You, you can't get that in uh, many uh, Eastern prisons. You can't get it in Western ones. Um, that lack of privacy was so, so great, I've noticed, and people yearn for it so much. When I was in Thailand, an old guy who ran um, a kind of shell polishing um, a little factoryette that he could lock, because there were valuable polished shells in there. He used to rent it out for 15 minutes to uh, boys who wanted a bit of privacy so they could do their own shell polishing, I guess. <laughs> 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 um, anyway, but it, it was good to have that. And the guy came in from the shops and I met the chairman, um, Usman Faruqi, chairman of uh, Pakistan Steel, who was in on corruption charges, a couple of government ministers, and um, but the, all, all the politicians had their own zones, uh, but we'll, we'll meet them later. I was just looking at a um, scratched out a, a list as I was fixing a flat this morning. Um, oh, there was uh, Benazir Bhutto's PPP party, the Sindhi nationalist, the Baruchi independence movement, and the, the Bhutto clan, they're such a... You know, one of the big 22 families of uh, Pakistan, the, their nobility, such that um, the children became um, political leaders um, even before Benazir was assassinated. She was blown up, I think, in Clifton, in one of the suburbs of Karachi, by who knows who, but her husband, Mr. 10%, got arrested for it, and he was in at the time. That's right, that, that must have been just about that time but we're to this is 1999 so i i think that came later but i think he was there on um uh, some other corruption charges but he, he he had his own house but it was one that the prison had built for vips and he had to pay for it of course there was rent on that but his cook used to say he was a mean bastard and never never helped now you get servants for this um the servants are prisoners, and the prisoners have to pay the guards to get the job. If you're a prisoner who's got nothing, you are not going anywhere. You can't even get to court. If you are the badashi, the servant of uh, a moneyed person, the protocol is that after six months you have your servant freed. Well, the soon-to-be president of Pakistan never freed. Well, maybe he liked the Bangladeshi's cooking. Could have been that issue, I don't know. But I ended up with Bossai, who'd um, uh, had a kind of um, scrambled egg eye on one side from um, a discussion with the police when he was arrested. Um, and some fat half-wit kid who was uh, the doby waller who did my washing. And, uh, and in fact, I stuck to that protocol. I, I did get him released. Um, about six months later. But I, I'm, 
I'm saying this in a kind of a very straightforward manner, listing the steps taken. But bear in mind that I'm 41. I've been through a 10-year stretch in Australia, which was very nightmarish in the beginning with people being covered with contact glue and, and satellite and burning to death. Um, and, and somehow, strangely, worse than that, uh, in the, peop- the sounds of people being uh, beaten and chained, especially the, the, the young girls they had in, in that prison by psychotic guards, uh, at night and you can do nothing about it. Having that life taken away uh, and then building up another one after getting out of Thailand. Um, and, uh, you know, for a while I was a London gentleman. I had my own driver, um, Domingo, and um, um, I really didn't do anything. I was... Um, like a Victorian gentleman, did just visited galleries and and, and I met uh, at some good cause or other. I was putting money into, not to expiate my former sins. I don't, don't feel that any amount of money would sort that out. But um, was being a London gentleman boring for you? No, I actually really liked it. Um, it I'd get up in the morning. I belonged to the local. Um, Holmes Place was it the gym down there in in Kensington? Uh, pastry shop was very good French. Um, it, I'd meet friends for lunch, uh, uh, catch up on. I saw my first IMAX film, I think, back then. Uh, just things I'd never got around to. But I suppose you've got a point about whether it was boredom, because sometimes things had come up, and I'd be sitting there thinking. Yes, TB, you say that can't be done, but let's not be hasty here. And or or some friend had um, well want something arranged, and I'd make make the introduction. You know, a bit like an an old cook who can't stand to see anybody else in the kitchen. <laughs> I'd I'd introduce these people together and instead of going back home. I'd be saying, well, look, you can't do it that way. Here, give me that thing, you know, and I'd be involved in stuff. I mean, going over back to Pakistan in the first place was uh, a bit of madness, really. Don't you still get the call of the wild these days? Um, not really. Oddly enough, no. Um, mortality is, is knocking at the door. <laughs> okay, if um, somebody came up with a good plan to steal the former Shah of Iran's uh, royal jewels. <laughs> well, who could resist that, eh, Sean? <laughs> oh, you'd be in on it, wouldn't you? Come <laughs> on. Well, not kidnapping his son. Oh, the Shah's son? No. Oh, no, no. Uh, kidnapping is, is a terrible thing. It. You know what's terrible about it? There's no deal. You're not giving anybody anything that they hadn't already got. You're just depriving them of something. And not only that, um, nah, how can you call yourself a reasonable sort of professional criminal and then jail somebody? Become a jailer yourself. All right, the kidnappers are just desperados. That's why I had to um, really convince these Lebanese that this was, I don't think, I think it would have been a disaster because um, they just weren't savvy enough for it and they, they certainly wouldn't have ended up with the money. Lots of people would have, Ended up with lots of money, but not them. Um, no, there's this. Um, um, the Shah's jewelry has disappeared into the vaults of um, the uh, Ayatollah's palaces. I suppose when you've got dictators, you end up with another kind, don't you? When you get rid of the former one. Whereas the the previous Shah was a modernist. He was even going to get uh, Concord. I saw one done up in uh, Iranian um, Airways livery, but it was never delivered because uh, he went um, quite early. Um, they never recover those dictators. They always die in Paris or Khartoum or something afterwards. Um, and they often don't have much to say. But the new lot are um, just as much dictators again. And uh, I think the Iranian one ended up in Arizona. Paradise Valley or somewhere? 
What, the Shah of Persia? The, uh, in, in the, uh, I know he went to Paris in the first place, but he did go to the US for medical treatment. Maybe he stayed there. Yeah. Uh, it could be that. But that would be the, and, and really it is not, I probably wouldn't even go for that. In the, how many functional years have I got left? I'll probably be around for 20. Uh, the bad never die really young. But um, I've got a lot of stuff that I, I still need to do. There's about five books I want to write. I want to write some fiction. Um, and I've got one massive undertaking um, that, that will come out as a kind of a book, but it's more than that. Um, and you've got everybody on YouTube gagging for your audio books. Uh, yes, uh, they're recorded and uh, the files are uploaded. So, Has it been submitted? Uh, yes. And uh, you said you there was quite a delay. A month, usually quality control checks. Do you know what? I think they actually just, whereas if it's in print, um, just on the fly through, somebody can see there's something on the files. The computer knows there's something in print there. Print it. Doesn't matter how bad it is. But with an audio book, they don't want um, a computer reading it. So some human being's got to listen to, uh, even if the computer says, yes, there's sound on these files, uh, they want a human uh, listener to say, yes, that's another human being. They probably just listen to some sections of it to hear that it's done at a right level of quality. Yeah, but Doubt I they would think listen the, to the whole thing. computer could do that. You would have thought. Why do they need that? Uh, anyway, that, yes, um, by the time this is aired, the, um, I'm hopeful that the audio versions of, uh, and I, I think I bring those books to life, really. You've done both of them? Oh, no, well, I'm, Escape Hole um, is not finished, but that will come out as well. So Unforgiven Destiny is the one you've yes. submitted. Yes, right. Brilliant. So the audio book should be up by the time you're watching this. Unforgiven Destiny description box. Click I think down. so. Now, um, where what am I trying to do in in Pakistan? There's there's quite a few important things to know there. Um, uh, I'm trying to escape. That's what I'm thinking. Escape. Get back to London. Clean up the mess. Um, but then again, it's going to be a bigger mess than I thought because of Billy's uh, detailed uh, givings. But I've bought myself B class, and when I go to court, I'm not handcuffed because um, superior people do not escape from prison, Sean. It's just not done. When he's the judge and he's a fellow gentleman, and you say, Oh, old fellow, what was it? You shot your servant? Oh. I don't blame you. Off you go. <laughs> um, that's kind of the attitude that's going to happen. Nobody um, wealthy enough to have either bought or been given um, uh, B-class uh, is likely to escape. And even the political people, these you know, ruthless ones, they don't do it. All their underlings are all chained up, of course. Um, I'd, so my escort in the court, I'd, I'd send him shopping. I'd give him a grocery list and he'd wander off. And I'd walk around the courts sort of uh, seeing what was going on. It was kind of interesting, uh, listening in on various hearings. And, and some people had their sort of best visits there because there weren't any bars in between. Um, and, of course, the big banker who was in Karachi Central Jail, um, he used to go to court every day. He'd arranged it in the banking court. He owned the Mehran Bank, which disappeared with 250 million US. There was so much money. And we were speaking before, weren't we, about the dangers of big money. And you can imagine having a hidden $250 million in Karachi. He, um, he had a Mercedes he used to, and an escort. He used to take him to court for his protection. And that's really the whole protection of the jail, the rangers in the towers with their rifles were not there to stop prisoners escaping. Prisoners didn't. It was to stop the enemies of those prisoners getting in to kill them. Mm -hmm. um, and the walls were quite high. The place was built by the British, of course, um, and actually had some quite fine architecture in the, in the offices, worth looking at. Very really kind of 
uh, mock medieval, uh, as you can imagine, turrets and towers and crenellations and all of that sort of thing. So um, uh, this, uh, this bank owner used to go to the banking court and rented an office there, and he'd see his family and, 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 and people. That, that was enough for him. <laughs> he'd built the whole house in, inside the prison in one of its huge... Uh, if you go onto Google Earth, you can get some scale of the thing by looking at the surrounding houses. It's a huge bit of land, probably highly valuable. What would people have to put into Google Earth to see that? A Karachi Central Jail. That's it. Yeah, it'll come up. And over there in um, the corner, you'll see a sort of fairly peaceful, blurry bit. That's... Um, where the B-class section was. Now, um, um, by the, so I I'm introduced myself to the political people um, because it seemed like they were, not only did they have interesting stories to tell, but um, they were kind of worth knowing. Um, they ranged from the relatively uh, genuine um to it's really hard to one of them looks like um you know what his party was they who, who they were um supporting and near on worshipped and had little photos of it wasn't Benazir Bhutto's son who was died of poisoning in Paris these people like the Kennedys they're, they're getting knocked off everywhere that son had married a Lebanese singer, and the wife was now the head of that party. So these, this ruthless Ali Baba and his 40 thieves have got this very clashing picture of a uh, you know, quite nice-looking woman in, in the corner, and that's the head of their party. Now, Khalid, um, he was, he, he seemed... Well, he, Forget the politics of it, just but just as an organizer, he, he seems a nice guy, uh, a genuine sort of person. I'd um, gone to him for a couple of things, um, uh, and he, he could he could solve problems with in the prison and wouldn't simply be having his hand out. Now a lot of his uh, followers, they were all in for various murders and things. Khaled, oh, maybe he'd ordered a few. I didn't care. And incidentally, his little house was made out of an old chapel. It was a, a Christian chapel that had been built within the prison, and it, it was kind of a weird atmosphere. They'd put old blankets and and silks over the floor, and he had a kind of throne, which was the old altar. Uh, and there's a little niches and a couple of old um, pews that were at the side. So it was kind of semi-religious. I felt like I was in um, perhaps India visiting one of the gurus or fakirs or something like that. Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd known him uh, as one of them, but I needed his help that day because I'd just come back from a hanging. Um, they sell tickets to that, more or less. And the hanging was a miserable sort of affair. Then there's no good ones, but I, I had to see at least one. Um, the poor kid that uh, was being executed, um, he there was a big argument up on the gallows about his weight, and uh, <laughs> the oh yeah, I really felt sorry for him. He wasn't following what the discussion was because there were so many English words in there because it was the prison manual, in which is all in English. And what they're really discussing is what size sandbags to put around his ankles so the drop will actually snap his neck. Oh, and he's up there looking great. like, no, they found the person who did it. I'm going to be freed today. Eh? What's that on my ankles? Is that good? Boom. Uh, what kind of crimes do they hang people for? Oh, only for murder. Mm. Um, I think there might be a couple of th other things on the, on the statute books for, for death. They also have Sharia law courts to appease some group that they needed their numbers in um, their uh, parliament. Uh, they agreed that there would be Sharia law. After all, it is the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. But it would be in separate courts. 
So they make rulings and you make sure you just don't end up there. But having, um, most people would think it's a terrible thing to be uh, in a Sharia court. Yes, if you're a woman it is, but if you're a man it's not too bad at all because you need three witnesses to any event. It's it's not good enough that somebody comes in and says, um, I saw Sean shoot the guy. I need two more of those. And they have to be of good um, um, character in a religious sense. Um, but the, the, it, it, it's not often that... Um, Oh, yes, I forgot to say the, the death penalty did apply to narcotics. That was one of Benazir's little innovations to sound serious in the in the 80s. Um, <clears throat> and just to make things fun, I was charged in this um, knowingly involved in Billy's little smuggling thing, uh, being held wanted for Thailand, and also a second set of charges in the anti-narcotics court, Benazir's invention, which carried the death penalty, a duplication, which um, was against the Pakistan constitution, double jeopardy. But I notice, uh, listeners, that uh, you can be dragged into an English court twice for the same crime. Now, if they, they don't convict you first, they have another opportunity if they find something compelling or new evidence, which has a very broad definition. Doesn't so you're saying you're up for the death penalty again in Pakistan? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You just say it so casually, it's like people must be just mind blown. Um, How many times have you been up for the death penalty? Oh, only twice in any only serious twice. way. Yeah. Only twice in a serious way. Yeah, it's been bandied about here and there. Um, and the number of policemen have threatened me with death, I can't count. Uh, <laughs> You know, I said, all right, well, just, I hope you're a good shot. Just do it already. Um, <clears throat> I was never a very good shot anyway. I, I put up a collection of old photographs on my own channel last week, and you can see, what was I, 20-year-old David with a big 357 Magnum in his hand with hollow points, of course. Well, do, do you remember in the earlier podcast we did the series of the use lessness of guns yes series. yes yeah. yes well that was certainly uh um it was it was kind of like toys because there were so many of them but um really even to have one around it's a gift to uh, uh, the burglar isn't it oh thank you for the gun this will make this uh, robbery more effective now that i've got this it, just it, put it on the living room wall yeah uh, yeah <laughs> that's true so um my diary was full of court appearances for that. Um, but you don't get left alone. Um, there's always somebody coming to, if you paid once, they want you to keep paying and so on. Now, to put pressure on everybody in the uh, little B-class street, some were untouchable, but um, they, they wouldn't hurt you, Sean, but they'd punish your servants. Mm. Now... Um, Pakistan Steel, I'll call him, rather than Usman Faruqi. Pakistan Steel had um, a little guy from Swat, um, that's right up north, very valid area. He was educated. Uh, um, <clears throat> he'd been caught adjusting the, uh, rewiring um, terrestrial satellite receiver. It, it, we used to get programs that were already stolen from uh, the international satellites. But so they called him off the roof and, and they were um, giving him a good beating with the chitta. That's the long leather belt that I, I told you it had inscriptions all over it. I love you a long time and all of that. You know. And not just written on it. I mean, this is chiseled out. So I, I went to Pakistan still. I said, look, um, uh, they've got your boy in there. Oh, he's always up to no good. The cheapskate wouldn't even go and get him out. Mm. Now, I knew if I went in there, you can see where this can go wrong. I go in there to stop the beating. What's going to happen? It's your problem. I own him now. I can stop it, but I'm paying this guy. I've started to pay him. I thought I already refused to pay any more rent on my uh, rooms. Um, I will kick Billy out. I'll pay you to do that. <laughs> 
Oh, Billy had an ace up his sleeve. Um, uh, I'll come back to that, but let me just finish with the, um, the poor servant who was getting beaten. So I went to Khaled down in uh, the MQM splinter group um, that had the, uh, the Lebanese wife as their head. Anyway, Khaled um, heard my story, didn't like that practice of the servants being beaten to, to get at the money out of others, marched over there, virtually kicked open the door of the, the chief's office, screamed at him in a kind of guttural Cindy that I couldn't follow at all, tore the, the chitter out of the hands of the, uh, the kids, about it, threw it out the window, um, and then stormed off. And I, I limped out. Well, I wasn't doing the limping, but I carried out the one who'd been getting beaten. I mean, he was tiny, this guy. He, he showed me the welts. Uh, he wasn't good for him. Um, so that seemed to me the best way of dealing with that. I mean, the, the deputy gave me a filthy look. He more or less said, oh, well, so you're with that lot, are you? And I thought, yeah, all right, work on it. And I'll work mm -hmm. from my side. Um, and so you'd have this kind of complication. You can see how it, it, it's already complicated and it's getting more so. Um, now, um, right, uh, there was, uh, I think my servants, they didn't really get into any trouble. But, um, yeah, that's what I was going to um, come back to. Why was I... You're probably thinking, I'm sure there are many people thinking this, in a place like that where people have accidents, very often, frequently fatal, why wasn't that happening to Billy Green? Well, because when I was last at court, Jeremy, the vice consul for the British High Commission in Karachi, um, they don't have embassies in... Um, countries that we used to own. They're called high commissions. Just a little reminder that we're still up there. It's a joke, but you know, there we are. Uh, Jeremy from there, um, he'd been sent some money on my behalf and um, you know, he, he made a big cloak and dagger thing of having an envelope. I said, Jeremy, the more you look at around everywhere during a handover, the more people pay attention to this. So just give me the thing. Uh, I'll uh, he said, by the way, be careful of uh, old uh, Will Power over there. I said, what, he's all bluster. No, no, it's not that. He said that he'll testify against you if things aren't going to go his way. Mm. He already came to us and asked to see the um, local police liaison, mm. if that would help his case at all. I said, well, Jeremy, will it help his case from your point of view? No, we don't care less. We know everything here and we don't care. There's nothing we can do anyway. Um, Rightio. So um, if, by chance, poor old Billy slipped in the shower, um, somebody would think I had something to do with that because, um, and that would make it, that would add another layer of complication to uh, my case, wouldn't it? because I would be paying not only to be freed from something I didn't do, but also for a supposed murder that I may or may not have instigated. See, people think that crime is very straightforward you, um, from film and television where you can, you have something, you're doing something, your competition you kill, your informers you kill. But uh, you've seen enough of it, Sean, it doesn't work that. If you can't outwit people, or at least match uh, their their cunning with the guile of another kind, things just get worse. It's like a chessboard. It is. So getting rid of, I I was forced to keep Billy under control. I had to. I couldn't live with him. That would have been just too much. Um, uh, but um, I, I found him uh, not bad place to live. I noticed some of the English crooks that were there had fallen to pieces completely in this system. It just didn't um, go in with anything they knew. Um, now, this Mason, the American, he'd gone completely absorbed into it. He used to run around in a shalwa kameez. He learned very good Cindy. 
uh, as well as Urdu. He used to write poetry in Sindhi. I had to admire the little rat um, because uh, he'd done what a guy called Dean Reed had done back in Thailand. If you remember the, what, the things that happened in Thailand, there was an American there who was helping me, uh, fleeced me f directly for 50,000 and more from friends. But, and I've always said, perhaps he did help me because he gave me hope when there was none. Now, Mason wasn't anything at that level, but he was of that style, that kind of young guy you meet sometimes who, okay, this is strange, but I'll embrace it. I'll learn it. I'll, I mean, you must have done some of that yourself. You have to adapt Arizona. to the environment, don't you? Otherwise you perish because mm. there's a language, there's a body language, there's guards rules, there's gang rules, and you come in day one and all that is in your face and it's completely alien to you. Mm. So unless you, you know, you're doing the prison walk and speaking the lingo and trying to fit in, then you, anything that stands out gets brutalized. Well, I suppose too, tell me if I'm wrong, once you found yourself in the Arizona prison, you had to observe and then create the Sean Atwood that was the survivor in the Arizona prison. May not have been you exactly, elements of you, most certainly, but it was, I'm guessing, a character that you had to form, the one who helped with the guy's writing, the one who um, gave them tips on business advice, perhaps because of your stock market experience, the one who was useful, the one who was liked, the one that people used to know, yeah, oh, yeah, Sean comes around and does whatever. I'm sure if somebody played a mean guitar, it would probably find you know a way in there. Whatever skill set you've got becomes your currency. Yes, yes, I guess it does. So um, um, this uh, um, um, uh, American guy kind of, I, I think he was always uh, a bit, um, um, somebody who could kind of smooth in there. Um, he was caught with a couple of girls with uh, a few kilos each. Very strange place to go, especially with women. The women who got arrested uh, um, really stood out. We came to know in there of um, Tatiana, a Russian girl. She'd uh, she came from Krasnodar, which is a little bit south uh, in in what was well, no, it was uh, is it then Russia by then? Yes, it was. USSR had gone, but uh, when it opened up a bit. Um, She'd met a Nigerian student. Shall we call him a student? We shall. Um, I'm sure he did study things. <laughs> and um, being a good wife, she found herself doing a heroin run for the Nigerian husband uh, who had connections in um, their big hangout up there is uh, Ralpindi. But they don't like using Islamabad airport. Uh, but still... She was caught um, at Karachi Airport and she had a, a young child. She thought somehow that, um, <laughs> and you know what's worse? The the customs and the officials there, they think all Russian girls are called Tatyana. And secondly, they're all prostitutes that's, because that's what they're doing here. They thought she was a prostitute, so they messed around with her and poked around on her bags. And a couple of kilos later, she's in the women's section. Now, uh, I went to visit her there, uh, not her particularly, but um, I'd met a guy called Robbie the Scot. Robbie the Scot was uh, accused, uh, and I'd read about his case um, a bit in the paper um, when I was there. He was accused of some fraudulently arranging bribes for the Guada oil and gas pipeline. Guada's down on the coast there next to Iran. So it was expected that he would turn up. He in fact said that he was just unlucky being at the Hyatt Hotel when some City of London police had visited and um, seen him there. Not exactly knew him of old, and he really wasn't a conventional fraudster in the sense. Okay, any banking documents that Robbie would give you would be treated more of artworks than actual you know, genuine documents. 
Uh, but the whole thing got a bit messy when one of the loans was guaranteed uh, by a European bank that sent uh, a fax to confirm something. But people don't remember. Think of fax headers. I know faxes are just about gone with wind, but they're sometimes used when there's a signature involved, aren't they? And the receiving machine will... Uh, no, the sending machine will have a very fine print at the top of what it was. And in this case, the instead of showing a bank in Zurich, it sh showed the Pearl Continental Hotel in downtown Karachi. Yeah. Uh, something picked up by the City of London Police and, and referred to their colleagues there. So he came in. And how did I know all about it? Well, I got around a bit anyway, but... Um, the young American kid uh, got released, and one of the deputy chiefs called me up one day, said, um, David, didn't you owe me money? No, no, not really. No, no. Look, have a look out there. And I saw a kind of ginger-headed, portly um, guy there, you know, Anglo, of course. Yes? Rich, rich. Look at the newspapers. I want 25,000. Or a bund ward. Uh huh. And what do you want me to do? Well, I'll talk to him. Put something in for yourself. Yeah. And uh, and and if uh, if he doesn't have money or can't get it, well, uh, he'll be sweeping. And they, the kids, they, they, they had nothing to sweep really, so they they had a, a bunch of sticks and they'd be sweeping the dirt, uh, just the ground. <laughs> uh, so I went over to Robbie and I said, look. Uh, we're going to pretend that we're having a heated discussion and you're going to look like you're upset and tearing your hair out. Uh, I've been asked for some ridiculous amount of money. And he said, oh, then I, I've been here a year in Pakistan. I know how it goes. You know, I'm ready for all of that. Okay. Um, you know, I'll, I'll pay uh, uh, $5,000 or something like that. <laughs> Look, oh, look, 5,000 rupees is about like uh, 50 pounds or something. That's what we're talking about here, you know. Um, well, let's forget you've been here a year, but in this jail, local currency. And I think I mentioned it once before in talking about Afghanistan. Even there, all your dealings should be local currency. The moment you start bringing in euros or dollars, they put you in a different league. All the figures change. Yeah, you're just a fool running around with foreign money. And foreign money is printed from heaven and rains down upon us poor people. That's how it's supposed to work. And that's what you're going to do. Mm. <clears throat> so um, anyway, uh, we we played this charade. And I, I, I looked over at the chief and shrugged. <laughs> and he went with sweeping gestures. That's what it we're doing. Anyway, I went back to him. We settled up for the equivalent of about uh, 120 pounds today and a lot of talk tomorrow, um, which was good enough to, to get in, into uh, B class. But I didn't fancy that job, so uh, I did it badly. Mm -hmm. Not so badly that he'd hate me forever, but um, badly enough that he'd, he'd try and find somebody better. And while I was at it, I set him up against the other deputy chief that I was in trouble for, for getting involved in the beating of the servant. Mm. I said, you know, he wants your job. <laughs> 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 and he's going to get it. <laughs> so, well, I kept those two busy for a while. <laughs> but things um, didn't go... Um, I, I, I was kind of finding my way around there and going to court every six weeks for, what is it, an hour or something. Um, the, the first lawyer just ran off with some money. The, another lawyer um, I met uh, was introduced to in my little B-class street. His name was Zohor Bluch. And I kind of liked the Bluchy people. So, um, And he knew Norjon, who was there at the time. Yeah, in fact, Norjon didn't know I'd been arrested and came out in, a, in his usual flowing white robes with his gold chains everywhere. David, no. Yes, no. <laughs> anyway, we did that until it became silly and then uh, a bit of hugging and, uh, you know. Uh, 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 and then I, mm -hmm. I found out, 
you know, how he was living in his own kind of ruthless way in there, but he was respected um, too. But I didn't ask him to do anything for me. Uh, I knew better than that. You know, when you're in that kind of situation, figure it out yourself. Even don't panic. You're not going anywhere in a hurry. And uh, in case I forget to say it later, anybody arrested in India or Pakistan, it's very simple. The law says, and it's unchangeable, that if your case isn't finished in two years, you get bail, even if you're a foreign devil. Mm. It has to be granted. The worst massacre murderers have been given bail after two years. Your court case will never finish in that time remotely, so put your feet up. <laughs> uh, read a few books. Don't splash your money all over town. Certainly don't give it to lawyers. Um, I run a Shamim as a lawyer in Karachi if you ever need one, though I think he's a judge now. He was quite good. Didn't you say that the higher class prisoners go to the court unchained? Yes, yes. Were you tempted to just get in that situation and it, walk it, out? It, 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 I, I was in a way. Um, I'd, I'd go to court and I'd think, it can be done like that. But I remembered where I was and I remembered lessons from Lebanon. I thought, if I say to somebody there, come and pick me up, they will. And they'll say, oh, you missed the turn here to the airport. <laughs> Where am I going? Huh? Where do you think I'm going, Sean, when somebody's picked me up from the courtroom and I'm a white man? a nice man. place. I'm going to somewhere expensive. That's where. Very expensive accommodation. So um, I realized that also I, w the, I knew I was going to win the case. So um, there wasn't the Shankman, Bill Shankmans of this world have got no uh, pull whatsoever in that town. It is everything is local. Um, the the jail was its own kind of local world. But um, I really uh, oh yes. So I met Zahor Baluch, who'd been. Um, if you want to get somebody arrested in in Indian Pakistan, um, you file an FIR. That's a first incident report. That allows the police to come and annoy them and interview them over. And if things don't go well, they'll send them off to jail to, to get themselves bailed out. And if you don't like somebody, that's what you do. If you don't want to pay your lawyer, uh, you file a report saying, you know, he swindled me or something, which was what happened to Zohor Baluch. No, he probably did do the thing that uh, <laughs> annoyed one of his clients. Um, and he was under a bit of a cloud for um, falsifying uh, some court records in his cases. But I liked him, he was uh, he, he was sort of friendly. Um, I didn't trust him, but um, he was enough of an outsider to the Karachi lawyer scene. I'm, I've been trying, while I'm talking, I'm trying to think of the name of the most corrupt lawyer in the whole town back then. But there was one who owned stacks of judges, just he drove around in, you know, it wasn't a Rolls Royce, but very big Mercedes, he, near illiterate. That's the thing that upset the other lawyers. Not that he was paying off every judge, but that he was just wasn't one of them. I uh, could barely read the court documents. Um, if you had him, you'd likely to walk, but it would cost a fortune. So that wasn't a way to go. I thought, I'll just hold back there and see what my judge is like. And he was uh, he was good. I kind of like, we got along well enough, you know. Uh, he eventually uh, gave me a legitimate B-class uh, court order. Not that it actually did any good. I still didn't entirely avoid the money thing. Um, but uh, while Robbie was in, um, he he went over to the women's prison and met Tatiana and formed a bit of a bond. And he decided uh, that all of the... Um, the foreigners, anyway, who had um, found themselves on this double jeopardy thing, which that should be challenged, because the Constitution clearly said you can't be tried for the same thing twice. So um, we took it to the um, Sindh High Court for a ruling on that. Plenty of people had been finished their sentences, but still couldn't go anywhere. And these anti-narcotics courts didn't really exist in the sense that there was only one or two venues for them. 
and they'd been taken over by the new anti-terrorist court, which had its own problems. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, a, a rent raise came up, and um, I was really limiting. I, I wouldn't play along entirely. I, I suppose I was just getting grumpy. Um, I was depressed enough of having all this happen anyway, but um, I started to see a, a kind of a, a weakness in the structure here. And I thought, I don't know, I sometimes do this to myself, Sean. I thought, what is it about this bun board thing anyway? <laughs> and and what, what about these people who had disappeared from here, you never hear? Where do they really go? So, um, um, before I, I, I ended up moving out of my street into a slightly different one and had a couple of nights and I wondered why this, I thought, yeah, sure, they want some more money. I thought I'll pay them a bit and get back to where I was. Um, then ended up spending a couple of nights with the most weird people. Can you imagine? There's a young medical student who's in there on, on some silly thing. I don't know. Didn't get along with the policeman. He got thrown in there. But he's a medical student, so um, he's in a kind of a B-class thing. But there's one other person in the cell, and this is a fat-headed, gabbing half-wit, and he's a policeman. And because he's a policeman, they, they give him, as a courtesy, a bit of B-class. Not the top B-class, but uh, whatever. Um, so um, the poor medical student, um, you know, if you know other languages or you start to pick them up, be careful admitting to it, because this fathead would have been in my head all night. The medical student was saying, David, he's eating my brain. <laughs> What's he talking about? <laughs> oh, he's telling me about nights at the station and how they got somebody in and hung him upside down. And then there were some prostitutes and what he did to them. I want to die. I, I can't take that. Uh, uh, maybe he's... In the employ of, you know, but no, he was just an, a natural idiot. <laughs> and then, uh, so um, I couldn't take him either. And I moved to a kind of um, a, a room with a, a really wreck of a, a Danish guy that was ending uh, a sentence. But we, uh, we, we exchanged things, uh, notes and people we knew. Uh, and I met somebody else. I can't even remember how I... I came across him, who wasn't in B-class, very nervous uh, German guy, and this was Matthias. Um, and he'd been through Afghanistan, Pakistan. He got caught with a lot of hash once, and this was a hash case as well. But um, I tried to draw him out of that, but he was probably, you know, he'd asked around about me, and he probably thought, no, this could be more danger than it might be because I was kind of going against them uh, a bit at this stage. But I was still having my Sunday lunches and the, um, um, you know, the, the the house that this banker had built was kind of like a, a conventional English suburban house in a way, but it had manicured lawns and air conditioning and its own satellite connections and it was just a house, but it was very strange for it to be there. Um, and the Sunday lunches were well catered for. And as I think I mentioned before, all in English. But all that came to an end when I could see I was being um, really uh, targeted there. The case was droning on and I was going to, going to win. And I, I couldn't really do much about anything. My communications were better. So I had Carl who was a Canadian uh, villain, uh, come over. And you'd think I'd know better by now. Mm. Carl, what? Look, a couple of things. When you go to the court, the whole Baluch, the lawyer that was inside, is now outside. I've given him some money, but I want you to go to the court and see if he's really making bail applications for me. Now, when you finish that, I want you to go to London. You get my keys by going down the, uh, the mews. It's under where the rain is, and there's some codes I'll need to remove you to remember. I've written them out for you. Now, I've rolled them up in a little tube of paper because you'll stick that in a cigarette or something. I mean, 
I don't smoke. I can't look. Follow this. You've got to hide that piece of paper. It's the instructions on how to get into safety deposit boxes all around Scandinavia. Right, right, right. Now, if you're thinking, is Carl the right person for this job? Maybe not. But it, it would do what I say, and he wouldn't steal from me, um, and he was quite brave. So these are three good things, aren't they? The fact that he's a bonehead when it comes to the subtleties of... Uh, I mean, you must have found yourself there's quite a gulf between um, some kind of crooked business, let's just say, uh, might involve um, uh, market manipulation or um, some banking fraud, and um, the huge bulk of the people you're likely to meet in jail. Like their crimes are not really planned. They're often domestic. They're, um, they, they mask what's really a history of um, sporadic and half-witted violence by saying, oh, no, uh, my thing is uh, I'm a high-end burglar. Well, but you stole a fucking gold-braided knickers on your way out. Uh, <laughs> did you what? <laughs> high-end burglar, yeah. Um, so um, I sent Carl off on that mission, and the reporting day came and went. No news, no news, mm. no news. I was thinking all sorts of things. Um, I thought, well, what rule could he have broken? No, nah, he wouldn't have done that. I gave him that number for emergencies, and he'd only ring it from... He got to Scandinavia and to Stockholm, and I'd left a few things lying around. So um, he's got into my safety deposit, deposit box, mm. which is fine. He's taken out some cargo. And uh, there's about, um, well, they, I suppose he meant to have left. I don't really know to this day. I was so enraged I didn't, didn't follow up on it. But there's two kilos of coke there that he's got. Now, um, you've got to meet somebody later on. And I said, he's a, he works for a newspaper. He gets back about six. He's like clockwork. He's no, you know. He's a raging junkie. He will always be at home for his seven o'clock fix. So if he's not, he's dead. But don't ring the number. The reason I've got it there is if you've got to warn him against something. Did I say, Carl, not to ring that number? Don't ring that number. Why? Well, you don't anyway. But the fact is, Billy Green here has been blabbing about everything. So I've got to assume he said something about Scandinavia. Um, <clears throat> and it doesn't take much to set them off over there. There's only a certain number of people involved in different levels of business. Anyway, just don't ring that damn number. Knock, knock. Hmm. Got two kilos here. Nobody home. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, he has uh, left the two kilos with... Um, Oh, no, no, he, he didn't. He was sensible enough not to take it with him night one. He's put, where does he put it? That left it in the bank vault where it was supposed to be? Hidden it in a hotel room? No. You know, hotel corridors have got big, heavy bits of furniture. If you leave them up, nobody's going under there for a while. It'll do for overnight. No, no, no. A railway locker. I mean, people, you know this, don't you, about railway lockers? They get cleared every day. I mean, the second most dangerous lockers in the world, the most more dangerous ones are airport lockers. Uh, not that you'll even find them anymore, but they used to exist. So um, arrangements are made. Um, uh, he's supposed to, he was given some money that was owed to me, about uh, 75000 um, it was 750,000 Swedish krona, so 75,000 pounds. Um, heads off with that, is supposed to bring the coat back the next day. Uh, goes to his hotel room, swamp, police in there. Uh, mm -hmm. oh, by the way, what's he done with the key to the locker? <clears throat> 
It was just sitting in his suitcase. What's the point of hiding something in a locker if you're going to keep the key with you? This is a man who quite successfully robbed a few banks, you know, quite peaceably. It wouldn't shoot anybody, but they didn't know that. Um, you know, shut the security screen. So, and, well, anyway, I guess he just was an idiot. Uh, I remember him smiling at me one time later on saying, oh, I, I, uh, I, I did save that uh, other eight ounces and I, I sent it off to uh, our friends in Australia. What do you mean, Carl? You don't know anything about sending a letter, let alone. Uh, oh, no, it was a very good idea. And he looked around conspiratorially. Sure, and I've hidden it in a little statue. I'll never look in there. Carl, since statues were invented, They've been hiding things in there. When pottery was in Mesopotamia, somebody hid <laughs> his shekels in there. You, of course, he had never made it. But worse than that, um, Carl had never made it. He was held under um, uh, a Swedish law. You can hold somebody incommunicado for three months. Mm. That's still, I think that's still the case today. It certainly was then. What the hell? Um, yeah, you're not allowed to talk to anybody. You can have a lawyer, but the lawyer can't give you any documents. He can only read them to you. If you want to visit family, you can only do it in police headquarters. They'll take you from the jail to police headquarters and they'll sit there while you talk to the family. So they can hold you for three months on suspicion? Yeah, and have it extended. Um, an old pal there from Christiania, which we haven't come to, some other series, um, he was held for 22 months in solitary. And when you exercise... Um, you go out one at a time so you can't talk to each other wow. and into a big circular yard with kind of orange segments uh, like that. So you have one little yard to yourself and they have a tapping code. Okay. Yeah. So um, it, it might be all huggy and friendly and, you know, Ikea, mm -hmm. but they uh, certainly know how to treat their prisoners. They used to have them wear masks. Mm. The entire sentence, you're running around, well, not yourself, but as you moved about the prison, you had to wear this mask with eye holes in it. And the, the old church there used to have um, the pews had very long wooden things so you couldn't see the guy praying next to you. No, they didn't want criminals mixing together because it would make them more criminal. Mm. Huh, who would have thought that? Uh, anyway, so that was Carl. That's gone. That's dead. He's destroyed. What wasn't destroyed by Billy Green has been ground into dust by, by Carl. And that, uh, ladies and germs, is uh, because I didn't follow my own rule book, which says if you've got anything hidden and something's going to expire and you send somebody to stop you know, rental not being paid or, or deposit boxes not being set up for another year, you run a huge risk of making things worse. Um, having said that, it's a hard decision to make. Um, I've got a bank account down at the BBVA in Knightsbridge. I just can't get to uh, mm. because uh, the documents for that are all gone. Mm. Um, I even dug up the, the real person on whose documents it was based. Mm. And I lined it out. I said, there's money there. You want to go get it? Uh, yeah. 20 years ago? No, thanks. <laughs> okay. So um, we're back in Pakistan and things are not going really well. Um and I'm now in an argument with that. My kind of resources are dried up. Um, I'm not broke, but I'm starting to have to be a bit thoughtful how long this is going to take and, and who I have to pay. So I'm not bringing in the last of it until I know exactly who to pay off. So it means I'm not paying any of these people. So, um, I think I was living with the old Danish guy. I was too, uh, down in a sort of sub B class. Door opens at night. Uh, guards come in. I don't like the look of them. I mean, I don't like the look of them at the best of times, but uh, I didn't like the, their manner. It was like they had a very specific job to do. Uh, and uh, they lifted up something in the corner, and uh, my phone was there. But I'd already paid for that phone about seven times. No, we found a phone. It was like, um, what was the policeman's name in Casablanca? Saying, I'm shocked 
shocked to find there's gambling going on in here. He says in Rick's casino, you know, uh, this uh, guy's saying, I'm shocked. That, you know, but, uh, a terrible thing. They don't exist in here, don't you know? That? Yeah. All right, where's this coming? So I end up in the Bund ward that night, led away. I thought, wow, they really do want their money. Uh, now, I'm handcuffed by uh, a guy that I've already paid off. And, um, oh, and actually, I didn't see him the first night there. Um, I was just thrown into the cell. He pulled that stunt the next day. But I, I got talking with the guys. And you can imagine there's no cigarettes down there. So they were all desperate for a smoke. Mm. And they were working out little ways. To, and one of them had a match poked into the uh, the mud brick wall that he was saving for the smoke that never turned out. And there was a, a, a trustee working down there as well. You can imagine what he was like. Um, and there's sort of groans coming down from uh, the other cells. So in the morning, I get called out. I'm thinking, good, uh, I've got somebody to negotiate here with. And it was this uh, fathead that was in charge of the bun board. And, you know, and he looked at me and thought, mm, not really, I can't go too far there. I said, listen, whatever you're thinking of doing, I, uh, and I was sort of a bit lost there because I was going to threaten them with the embassy, but they knew too well that the British embassy or the High Commission doesn't give a toss what happens. They're, they're not terribly frightened of that, but a little bit of that. You know, I, I said, I've got passports for seven countries. Well, that confused him. Is that right? No. Anyway, all he managed to do was he, he put the handcuffs on behind me um, and the kind you can't pick. Not that easily. They have a kind of conical tube down them, very old-fashioned ones, museum pieces they were. And I thought I was going somewhere, but I wasn't going. I was just led back to myself. And then the guy said, no, that's day one, you know, you 24 hours in handcuffs. How do I use the toilet? I said, with help. <laughs> okay. Um, lunch was brought around. Uh, very gritty um, um, bread, flatbread, and um, equally gritty beans. Um, presumably, if you were... No, if you, have, you don't stay down there. This is not a place for people who've got means or any resources but these poor people from just been arrested getting their introduction you know that on arrival at the prison they'd be the old hand that uh, pinched my money that day he he kind of sort them out and tell the boss ah, good one here he's being polite to me uh, this one's got an education oh look family out there <laughs> uh really not prepared for any of it and they uh, just um belt them to pieces mm. and they I could see the uh, trustees who were doing the belting because they're too lazy to do it the guards mm. I was worn out from hitting this guy you know I just couldn't and he was hysterical I mean he was hurt of course I could understand that but it was just a nightmare I think he, he was gone by that afternoon he um, he got his family to stump up the money whatever it was but what to do with me um, I get brought before uh, a slightly higher um, deputy governor and he was looking uh, saying uh, uh, we can't take your money anymore I said well that's convenient because I'm not going to give you any um, well, we can't do anything with you uh, yeah. it's a very ambiguous word Sean we can't do it. It means something is going to be done with you, but it won't be good. Okay. Um, a couple of guys are running around and they, they've seen me there and come up and I'm rapid firing off messages for Robbie the Scott and other people, uh, uh, get colored and get somebody else. And um, But, you know, when somebody's um, under such a cloud, you know, they, nobody wants to know you. you know? Um, I um, I was thrown into a van, bumped along a country road somewhere. Uh, oddly enough, I, I I did have a few seconds to uh, get some of my bedding and stuff from uh, my room over there. So that was bundled up like a huge thing, um, and 
and went into the back of the van with me. Um, didn't know where I was headed. I knew I was going north. Um, that's all you could tell from the sun. Uh, guards didn't want to know. And I was taken to Hyderabad prison. There was two Hyderabads, one in India and one in Pakistan. The one in Pakistan is about 100 kilometers north of Karachi. Um, very old prison, another uh, built by the Raj. Um, and where was I taken there? The Bund ward, uh, the, the, the closed ward. But it wasn't run in the same way. I mean, Karachi was, uh, I'm going to say, just a, a, a grinder, a meat grinder. People would come in and they'd get whatever they, they could with them. I had officers from, staff from Karachi who were really, um, you could tell they were educated. Uh, one quite senior one was very apologetic. He said, David, I, you know what I've been sent here to ask you? I said, I know what you've been sent. But I speak English very well, so that's why they asked me. And yes, well, I, I don't want to even say it. It's too embarrassing, you know. I, I said, well, look, there's, there's a portrait of the founder of the country on the banknote. That 100 is, he's not talking about hundreds. I was not talking about hundreds, but, you know. Some excuse, money's coming, lost, too far away from home, all of that. Now, um, but so the it's a little bit different in Hyderabad. The bun was definitely closed. You don't see anyone. It's very dark. Uh, the cell I was giving didn't have any natural light. Uh, all I could see by the time I turned a couple of corridors was uh, a glow from sort of third level reflection and then that was it nothing more um the next day uh so quiet too and then it was a bit like that silence of papillon's island where he's in solitary not not as quiet as all that you'd hear the um uh the badashi coming around to refill the this um Madka, it's called. It's a, a big jar where all the water is. You'd be topping that up so that the dead insects could float to the top. <laughs> and you, you didn't have the, the, the little bowl or whatever. It didn't quite go through the bars to, to get to it properly. So you'd scoop up some and <laughs> have to kind of tip it through to get any there. Uh, no, not really enough to uh, to wash. But oddly enough, this very polite um uh, uh, well brought up guard had been transferred because he was useless to them down in Karachi. He wouldn't play along with that game. And he'd ended up there and he said, um, um, he had a couple of chairs brought and we were sitting in the sun in this quiet courtyard of this place. Um, and, you know, the, the governor here, he wants 25,000 U.S., and we had this, I mean, how many times have I said that figure sitting in this chair? This this is your corrupt official starting point. <laughs> U.S. dollars and 25,000 of them. It might, might be like triple eight. It's the um, uh, Indo-European version of uh, the Chinese lucky number or something like that. Well, um, I said, no, you're going to have to give him a lot of stories. And it's actually true. I can't communicate with anybody here anyway. Um Tell him it's coming when I get to my friends. Not that much. He's, he can have a thousand or something. Oh, and by the way, I, I need my bedding and everything like that. Oh, I don't know. They, he won't like I said, don't tell him. But they all right. Yeah. So I got that. And I, I was still back in the sort of dungeony, um, lightless room. But I could, it was enough of a glow during the day to lay out my uh, little eided down duvet mattressy things and I could put my shoes by my side and I had um, a few bits of um, paper that I could make a path because the, the floor was just earth in this, in this thing. It wasn't even concrete. I suppose if you were patient, you could actually chip your way through the whole thing. Anyway, um, and... And that was it. I just got used to the idea of nothingness. And it was somehow, for a while anyway, a bit of a holiday. I wasn't being chased by Bill and the boys. I, I was not 
having to you know, pay strict attention to some smuggling protocol. I, I wasn't having to do any of this. Um, this place was, you know, they, in fact, the guy who ran it wanted to be everybody's pal. Um, they weren't going anywhere until they settled a score with the, uh, the bosses. But, and I wasn't going anywhere till I paid up. Um, the, the well-spoken one came back and was almost in tears saying, oh, he's punished me so much for me giving your, your bedding to you. But that was it for me. I was happy. I, I thought about all the things I didn't have time to think about and, and organize my... I wouldn't say happy. This is probably the wrong word. I mean, when you've been arrested in um, a place where the law could be anything anyway, and then been disappeared to a jail. Nobody knew I was there. Nobody knew where it was. I was listed for court twice, and there's just no show. And the judge said, well, where is he? Oh, we don't know. Well, I sent the order down to Karachi Central Jail, and he's not here. Well, we don't know. Nobody knows anything. Was it weird to not have anything to do and just to spend time with your own thoughts? Um, I'd thought of... Uh, what did people do? Uh, you know, there's a few old prison diaries I'd read when I was young of what... Uh, see, you always get your questions answered sooner or later, Sean, don't you? Um, <clears throat> um, people who were smarter than me, uh, there was a mathematician arrested by the Nazis who used to do theorems or something in his head, but you know, I ran out of things to do quite quickly on that. Um, but I did uh, imagine... Um, uh, I designed a house inside my head. And to this day, what, uh, over 20 years later, I can tell you every floorboard in that house I designed in my head, every paint combination, what the bench tops looked like, what uh, cutlery and crockery were in there, what the bedding was like, what fabric it was made of, um, what the tiles on the roof. It was a, It's a living picture in my mind. It was so detailed wow. um, that I can dream at night and imagine I'm wandering around this house. Didn't Hannibal Lecter do something similar? Um, I, 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 don't, I can't remember. Um, what did he say that he, he, he did in his mind? Did I he, don't know. his classical music on, he was drawing. Oh, yes, that's right. He, but he, he also did, didn't, wasn't the part where he like, went into rooms of a house and stuff? Oh, no, I must have missed that. Um, but yes, it would would make sense. I started work on a, a boat design, um, and also um, you run through the bits of history, you know, and do some what ifs. You know, what if the atomic bomb had been invented later or earlier? Would it be more dangerous? What if um, uh, Franz Ferdinand had uh, not been shot? Would there be World War One? All that kind of stuff. If Alexander the Great had gone on to uh, conquer India, would it mean that uh, Western civilization would have spread more? Than, you know, just, and, but uh, as, a, as I was kind of starting to uh, run out of, uh, starting to worry a bit, well, this could be it. Um, I know it won't be, so don't worry about it, but um, just didn't seem to be anything else. It was as lost, I think, as anybody from our part of the world can be. Um, not just arrested, but in a strange place. Not just in the, the regular strange jail, but in the one you don't know anything about. Not just the jail there, but within a closed section of it. Did you have an exercise routine? Yeah, yeah, I did that. That was my clock. What was it? I had to... Um, um, the usual things, push-ups, sit-ups, nothing, because I wasn't eating uh, very much, and the food would be brought around in a bucket, and because they couldn't open the door, they were very hard to open because they didn't, they rusted out, they didn't get um, used much. They had to put some rain pipe guttering through the bars and pour the sloppy dal down the, and you'd be given a bit of bread and you'd catch it in that. you catch it in your hands? Yeah, you catch wow. it in your hands, yeah. Um, <laughs> and that was it. But, was, it, was there a um, lot of insects down there? Oh yeah, plenty. I yeah did a bit of um, uh, ethnobiology there and uh, um, checking out 
what's the study of insects particularly? I forget. But um, I did befriend somebody there. They sent some guy down to see me uh, to encourage me to pay up. And the most unusual person, his name was Byron, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. Um, he was the third generation uh, English leftovers from the Raj. His parents had been there in the 20s and even up until, um, and stayed on in the 40s. Uh, and he was a kind of ginger nut, a redhead, really. Had a, a fine old colonial style <laughs> mustache, would have been about uh, 38. 40 at the time I, I met him. You know, um, he had freckly skin, but he grew up and was born in, in Pakistan. Um, he would have been entitled to a British passport once, but they pulled that particular rug out from uh, what are about 200,000 um, English looking Pakistanis that um, have no local DNA in them, um, but they've just been left out careless in packing when leaving the empire. They didn't take them with them. Or they had children and they had children and met wow. another European girl or an English girl and, and married there in the 50s or, or 60s or something. Um, and, yeah, there, there's, there's so many of those. Anyway, it was perhaps the wrong choice of person. It was good for me because he brought me very humble, but little bits of food every day. Um, but he he said, look, the, the governor's asked me to get money, but look at me, I never do anything. Everything I've got has been through hunger strikes. And he had the telltale scars on his mm. um, lip there where um, he'd sewn his lips together so they mm. couldn't force feed him. Wow. And um, he said to me, oh, why don't you go on hunger strike? They'll let you out of here. But the, the slightly friendly uh, other, other um, Bundward guard said, um, look, do you realize what that involves? We're supposed to take you out and beat you every day, three times mm -hmm. a day. I said, yeah, well, I'm not rushing into any hunger strikes. I know, I, I, um, I kind of put up with that. I heard his story and it was a long one, an interesting one about his parents and upbringing and background. But I was content to stay there. We should probably um, leave it as a mystery as to what happens next because we're at two hours. Uh, well, I at least got to say um, what changes. Yeah, go for it. Um, in the Bund ward, everything's looking hopeless. I've got no contact with anybody. When there's a rush at my door, that rusty gate is prized open. The governor wants to see you, or the superintendent's the word they use. Super, well, I, I think I know what's coming there. Um, and and I, I think it's just because it's a stronger pitch for money. I get taken to there. All the guards are being very respectful towards me. I don't know whether this is another gambit. Um, and I'm lit up these old colonial Eritan curled stairways and into an office which opens up. And there, the, the prison superintendent's smiling at me in a way which is, everything's nice. And who steps forward, surrounded by armed guards, their own uh, rifles at the ready? It's his lordship, Lord John Magsy, mm. freed mm. recently on bail, mm. Mm. heard through his own network that I'd been disappeared to Hyderabad, came down there with his men to either find out what's happening with David or somebody will have to answer for it. <laughs> and he'd brought a cake. <laughs> so we had tea and cake with Noor John and the prison governor who is fawning and being polite. Because after all, Noor John uh, could just as easily say, kill every one of them. He had 30 men outside. Uh, he didn't know what he was going to face. Um, so uh, he'd come prepared. Wow. And so, you know, virtually said, what do you want? I'll do it. <laughs> so, um, travelers, uh, don't be afraid to go to exotic places, but make sure you are friendly <laughs> with some honorable people from the tribal lands. You never know when you might need them. <laughs> and you can. If you want to know what happens next, tune in for part nine. And please support David. 
His YouTube channel link is down there in the description box below the video. And I'm actually putting out some um, uh, videos uh, at the moment. And um, you will have answered the one of how do you collect the ransom money next time. We've got links to his books, Escape, massive detail about the escape from Death Row in Thailand, and even more in an unforgiving destiny. Even more in an unforgiving review. destiny, which should be available as an audio book by the time you get this, if Amazon don't reject David's voice. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I don't think they care about the content so much. As, I think as long as they recognize me as human and not a machine. <laughs> if you've enjoyed this, please put a comment or a question for David in the comment section below. Huge thank you to all the people who've donated on Patreon, PayPal, just giving to enable us to produce podcasts at the studio level quality, like we are today with our camera crew and James. Uh, very and professional, Joe. very professional, yes. lavish almost. Yes. And now we're all going to go on our lunch break. So, okay, then. Well, I'll uh, uh, see you on the other side, as they said in uh, what was that movie? The Town. Mm. A, a good villain uh, hold up movie, that one. Okay then. Toodaloo. Cheers. <laughs> See you soon. <laughs> Take care.